remnant shall return. Written by Michael B. Rush. For in that day, for my sake, shall the Father work a work, which shall be a great and a marvelous work among them. And there shall be among them those who will not believe it, although a man shall declare it unto them. Third Nephi, chapter 21, verse 9. Copyright 2015. Michael B. Rush. All rights reserved. Second edition. Hello. I'm Michael Rush, the author of A Remnant Shall Return. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for your interest in the subject matter. It's always been one that's fascinated me, and I hope that you will enjoy it as you study the subject. Now a little disclaimer. When I wrote this book, I did it as a study guide. There's over 700 scripture references in here. As such, the book isn't a fantastic candidate for a narration. That being said, I have been encouraged to do a narration so that people can listen to it while they're going about their daily activities because it is a long book and one time through it never seems to be enough. This being said, in order to facilitate the flow, I'm not going to be citing really any of the scripture references. These references are, however, very important, and I would really encourage you to look these references up yourself and study them in their original context. This can be done by going to the website, thelost10tribes.com, and clicking on the table of contents, and all of the chapters of the book are listed online with the corresponding references. Alternatively, you could purchase a hard copy of the book and do the same thing there. Now, before we begin, let me just say that I have really enjoyed hearing from the readers of the book. If you have any questions regarding any of the material that you find here, or would like to share any of your thoughts and opinions, feel free to contact me. I would love to hear from you. My email address is michael at thelost10tribes.com. The 10 in The Lost 10 Tribes is one zero. If you enjoy this book, I invite you to check out my other books which I have written, Daniel 11 and Revelation, The Vision of John the Divine. Both these books are available at Amazon.com, in Kindle, hardback, and also audio versions at my website, thelost10tribes.com. With that out of the way, I really hope you enjoy the book. I've had a wonderful time writing it. A Remnant Shall Return by Michael Rush Chapter 1 Mortal Men and Mysteries Isaiah prophesied that the Book of Mormon would whisper from the dust in the latter days. I have learned that this is true, but that the volume of the whispered message corresponds with the depth of study. A casual reading of the book will certainly glean some fruit, but far less than the copious harvest the sacred book holds for those that diligently seek with real intent. In the not-too-distant past, I spent many hours pondering the Book of Mormon's origins and translations. While doing so, I felt a strong prompting that I needed to carefully study certain sections. As I began this study, words began to jump from the pages at me. Phrases burned into my mind. Sentence structures, word placements, definitions, alternative references and concepts were all seen in ways I'd never considered them before. It profoundly changed the way that I understood things, like the way 3D glasses dramatically change certain images. Things I had considered flat suddenly became rich and multidimensional. This new perspective made all of the difference. I felt like an explorer of old, with the hand of inspiration guiding me through familiar terrain, yet with the scales removed from my eyes enabling to see a new world beneath the surface. When I would sit down to write my thoughts regarding certain passages, I would end up writing for hours on end, 
afterwards being amazed by the additional insights that only came to me after I had put pen to paper. It is this perspective that I wish to communicate to the readers of this book. In order for me to be able to accomplish this, I first need to highlight some of our mortal propensities and limitations. As spiritual offspring of celestial parents, we have infinite potential. However, due to the fall, we have inherited shortcomings. Our natures are fallen, and our understanding has become darkened. For the most part, the collective wisdom of humanity is not based upon truth, but rather our own muddled interpretations of experience and empirical data. This is as true for the physical world in which we find ourselves, as it is for the spiritual. From both realms, men assimilate information and then process that information through the filter of past experience and interpretation. Regardless of their accuracy, perceptions thus derived become our reality until experience proves them wrong. As the great apostasy so aptly demonstrated, spiritual knowledge is uniquely subject to false interpretation. Such limitations exist to one extent or another even among the holy men of God. Enoch, one of the most righteous men to ever have lived, had an incorrect understanding of the Lord. His lifelong perception of God was changed the instant he saw in vision the Lord of heaven and earth weep at the suffering of his children and their subjection to Satan. Nothing Enoch knew, or thought he knew, prepared him for a loving God who wept at the suffering of his children. However, it was not God who changed, but rather Enoch's understanding of him. The same is true of Moses. Moses was raised in the courts of Pharaoh, the most powerful man on earth. Upon meeting the Lord, Moses was overcome by the utter insignificance and comparative nothingness of man, which thing he never had supposed. There is not a mortal person alive today that sees all things as they truly are. This was true of the prophets of old, and it is true today. Everything we know or think we know has come to us through the filter of our mortal minds. Thus, the twelve apostles could sit at the foot of Jehovah and hear the Master yet not understand him. He told them plainly that the Jews would kill him and that he would rise again on the third day, and yet they were still completely dumbfounded when both of these events occurred. They had heard the Savior speak the words, but incorrectly attributed their own understanding for their meanings. Nothing like it had ever happened before. So to what could they have compared it to historically? As such, they were obscure sayings unto them, which were only to be understood in retrospect. Matthew went to great lengths to demonstrate in his gospel writings how prophetic scripture was fulfilled in Christ's life. However, the meanings of those prophecies became clear to him only in hindsight, as he too was baffled alongside his peers when the actual events were happening. It did not have to be this way. Christ often chastised his apostles because of their lack of understanding. Thus, sadly, it appears that for most of us, even when truth is given in whole, it is received only in part. Thus, if we rely too heavily upon the filters of past experience, as it was for them, so it will be for us. Consider the following verses from the New Testament. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. Another verse. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Such are the disadvantages of mortality and the carnal minds of men. We bitterly argue and struggle and debate over the historical accuracy of our own history. Therefore, it should come as no surprise that events of a prophetic nature could be so greatly obscured and usually only fully understood by the masses after the fact. I like to illustrate this concept with a scatter plot. A scatter plot uses data points to try to approximate what the line will look like. This is what 
interpreting prophecy often ends up looking like. We have different data points, and what the actual event turns out to be, but rather it'd be more appropriate to say the scatter points represent a haze of possibilities where the actual line will be. Given our limitations, interpretations of prophetic nature are not likely to line up perfectly with how events will unfold. We have predetermined biases that skew our thinking and assumptions. This was part of the apostles' problem of old. Rather than asking questions, they presumed answers. How much of modern revelation was only received after a question was put to the Lord? There is a reason the Lord chose an unlearned farm boy rather than a gospel scholar to restore the gospel. It would be difficult to instruct a man in the depth and richness of the gospel if he already presumed to know all of the answers. If we likewise presume rigid interpretations of future events based solely on prior experience and the teachings of men, what hope have we of understanding things that have never happened before, such as the future? Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? If we are to learn the depth and breadth of spiritual things, we must learn them by the Spirit. Even so, pro prophetic events are complicated, and even the humblest of men do not always know the right questions to ask. Therefore, short of receiving the right questions to ask from the Spirit itself, or of actually seeing the event in vision, most men are not likely to obtain a perfect understanding of the events beforehand. Therefore, the reader should be very leery of know-it-all men, myself included, that seem to have everything figured out. I wrote this book, so it should come as no surprise that it contains my insights and opinions upon the subject matter. I readily acknowledge up front that I believe my opinions represent scatter plots around the line of prophetic reality. Moreover, for most, this prophetic line of which I speak has never even seriously been considered. Therefore, I invite readers to study this subject for themselves. Keep my opinions in perspective. Consider them as resources for obtaining the truth, rather than the truth itself. Pure truth comes from God, not from men and is always accompanied by the Spirit's ratifying witness. If, as you read this book, you feel the confirmation of the Holy Ghost, consider what that means. And likewise, for the Spirit's absence, I feel the need to borrow these words from Moroni, Condemn me not because of mine imperfection, but rather give thanks unto God that he hath manifest unto you my imperfections, that ye may learn to be more wise than I have been. The purpose of this book is to introduce a perspective that I have found to be mind-broadening. It is a sub-theme embedded within the Book of Mormon, the Lord's covenants to the house of Israel and their latter-day ramifications. I believe that the magnitude, scope, and resulting consequences of the Lord's covenants with Israel will rival anything the world has ever seen. Outside of the atonement, it is without reservation the most awe-inspiring topic I have ever come across. It is often spoken of, but only superficially. They have a preeminent role in the events leading up to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Undoubtedly, some will flatly dismiss the conclusions drawn within this book, while others, with wonder, will see things with eyes made new. For those with eyes to see, the evidence, both scriptural and temporal, is overwhelming that now is the time that these events are to unfold. This subject matter is incredible and without precedent. You will find that this book is not an easy read. It will require your full and disciplined attention, much like a textbook rather than a novel. However, I can promise you that if you will diligently read it through once, you will want to study it in depth again and again and again. 
Therefore, I would encourage you on your first reading to try to read without sinking too deeply into the 600 plus references cited within the book. On your first time through, seek to obtain a solid macro understanding of the subject matter. I would then encourage you to read the book more deeply, studying the many scriptures in their original context. Compare my interpretations to the promptings of the Spirit. Doing so can't help but produce beneficial results. On their own, my reasoning and insights make a very poor substitute for the guidance and inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Thoughtfully consider the message of this book with this in mind. I am absolutely certain that there is something to the pattern this book identifies, something of great and terrible importance to our day. This work will analyze separate first-hand accounts from several prophets who knew much regarding these events, namely Ezra, Nephi, Isaiah, Jesus Christ, Moroni, and John the Revelator. The witnesses of many other prophets will likewise be used to corroborate and clarify these teachings. Each subsequent account will further establish the patterns and prophecies noted by the previous accounts. To be able to get a whole picture, all sections must be read. From the very beginning, I will express opinions based on the perspective of my overall understanding, rather than the insights gleaned from one particular passage or section. The insights gleaned from all accounts are critical in understanding and interpreting the whole. All of the sections in this book are related in interesting ways. The Apostle John is mentioned by name three times in the Book of Mormon by three different people, Nephi, Jesus Christ, and Moroni. The same three individuals also quote Isaiah extensively. I will demonstrate that this is no coincidental occurrence. In the first section, I will provide an overview of the events of the latter days as provided in the book of Second Esdras from the Apocrypha. This is meant to provide context for the events that will be described in all subsequent sections. Next, I will review Nephi's sweeping vision of the future of Americas. The following section discusses the dominant themes of the Isaiah chapters included in the Book of Mormon, why Nephi transcribed them, and what they mean. The next section will focus on the powerful teaching of the great God of Israel to the Nephites regarding the latter days, wherein he greatly expounds upon the words of Isaiah. The fifth section focuses on Moroni's testimony of these things both anciently and in his first visitation to Joseph Smith. Of all Moroni's visits to Joseph, this is the only one that was repeated verbatim four times in a row. There is tremendous significance to this fact. The last section will include an analysis of the words and teachings of John the Revelator. It is my hope that the reader will do their best to approach this work with an open, unbiased mind, free of preconceived notions. I am confident that if such is the case, the scriptures will speak to, to the reader, and you will feel the same wonder and awe that I have felt. Remember, in order to learn the Lord's way, you must have ears to hear and eyes to see. It is by the still small voice of the Holy Ghost that we may know the truth of all things. Therefore, listen for it. Chapter 2. Ezra's Eagle It seems that there has been a significant stir recently caused by members of the church publishing accounts of personal experiences, visions, and or dreams that expound upon events of the last days beyond the scriptural record. Therefore, let me begin this chapter by unequivocally stating that I claim no authority or special education to teach or expound these principles unto you. I do not claim to have been privy to secret knowledge or information that's not already accessible to anyone with the scriptures. As such, I have gone to great lengths to keep my research based upon the scriptures, with close to 700 footnotes for cross-referencing. That being said, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to discuss the scriptures without adding personal opinions and interpretations as to what they mean. Therefore, if there is ever any authorized church representative that provides an opinion or statement contrary to those that I have made, without question, 
They are right, and I am wrong. Furthermore, the writings that I will be analyzing in this chapter are taken from the Apocrypha, which is a book that is known to have errors in it. Therefore, the reader must understand that there are reasons that these books are not included in the LDS canon of Scripture. When Joseph Smith was translating the Bible, he queried the Lord regarding the Apocrypha, and the Lord told him the following, Verily thus saith the Lord unto you concerning the Apocrypha. There are many things contained therein that are true, and it is mostly translated correctly. Therefore, whoso readeth it, let him understand, for the Spirit manifesteth truth, and whoso is enlightened by the Spirit shall obtain benefit therefrom. Clearly, there is information included within the Apocrypha that will benefit us if we will read it while listening to the promptings of the Holy Ghost. Within the Doctrine and Covenants, we are admonished four times to seek wisdom from good books. I believe that the Apocrypha contains some of these good books, particularly the book of Second Esdras. Bible scholars believe that Second Esdras was put to paper within the first century A.D. based upon oral or written traditions. The timing of the writings is based upon the fact that one of Ezra's visions speaks of a country that is symbolized by an eagle. Many Bible scholars assume that this country had to be Rome, given the national symbol of Rome was the eagle. When discussing the opinions of many well-known Bible scholars, it should be noted that because of their schooling, they have been trained to rely upon their own wisdom or that produced from physical evidences. As such, many of these same scholars would claim a book of gold plates presented by an angel to an uneducated farm boy to be translated in modern times to be preposterous and completely unbelievable, while at the same time the Holy Ghost has borne witness to the hearts and minds of millions of Latter-day Saints that it's true. Therefore, secular opinions regarding things of a spiritual nature, while perhaps insightful at times, should be taken with a grain of salt. Only the Spirit teaches of spiritual things. Thus the Lord's statement to Joseph regarding the Apocrypha, whosoever is enlightened by the Spirit shall obtain benefit therefrom. It should be noted that I did have a BYU professor for whom I, for whom I have great respect read this chapter to give me his opinion on it and said that he knew of no official church commentary regarding it. He also highlighted some of the concerns regarding the accuracy of the Apocrypha that I have previously mentioned. Therefore, reader beware, let the Holy Ghost be your guide. For purposes of this analysis, I will take these writings at their face value, namely that they are the visions that Ezra received while the Jews were held captive in Babylon. Whether they were recorded then or at a later time from oral traditions makes no difference to me. Such being the case, Ezra would have been a contemporary of Daniel. In fact, an angel told Ezra that the revelation we are about to analyze was seen in the visions of thy brother Daniel, but it was not expounded unto him. Therefore, now I declare it unto thee. It is important, therefore, that we note that with few exceptions, the visions of Daniel concerned the events of the latter days. Therefore, Ezra is receiving more information regarding Daniel's vision of events involving the latter days. Included within the book of 2 Esdras in the Apocrypha is an amazing vision showing the latter day rise of a mighty nation, the mightiest the world has ever known. An eagle is used to symbolize this kingdom. Given the ramification for what this vision implies, I believe it sets the stage for any analysis regarding the events of the latter days, particularly those that pertain to the latter day gathering and restoration of the house of Israel. With this introduction, I will begin the analysis of Ezra's vision. Then I saw a dream, and behold, there came up from the sea an eagle, which had twelve feathered wings and three heads, and I saw... And behold, she spread her wings over all the earth, and all the winds of the air blew on her, and were gathered together. 
and I beheld, and out of her feathers there grew other contrary feathers, and they became little feathers and small, but her heads were at rest. The head in the midst was greater than the other, yet it rested with the residue. Ezra saw an eagle, whose reach and influence spanned the globe. In this vision, Ezra described this eagle. In doing so, it is important to note that he uses the term wing and feather interchangeably. Therefore, to avoid confusion, I will always use the term feather in my commentary. The eagle that he saw is described as having three sleeping heads, with the middle head being larger than the other two. The eagle is described as having twelve normal feathers, and others that are described as being small and contrary. As noted above, because of the symbolism of the eagle, most Bible scholars have assumed that Ezra was talking about ancient Rome. However, the eagle is also the symbol of America. Both Rome and America exercise power and influence across the globe, and up to this point, neither could be excluded from this analysis. As we continue, I will continue to, co to compare these two countries to the requirements of Ezra's vision. Moreover, I beheld and lo, the eagle flew with her feathers and reigned upon the earth and over them that dwelt therein. And I saw that all things under the heaven were subject unto her, and no man spake against her, no, not one creature upon the earth. And I beheld, and lo, the eagle rose upon her talons, and spake unto her feathers, saying, Watch not all at once, sleep every one in his own place, and watch by course, but let the heads be preserved for the last." Here we learn that the feathers of the eagle are to take watch by course. At the conclusion of this vision, Ezra was provided with the following explanation for what this symbolism means. Behold, the days will come that there shall rise up a kingdom upon the earth, and it shall be feared above all the kingdoms that were before it. In the same shall twelve kings reign, one after another. And this do the twelve wings signify which thou sawest. And whereas thou sawest the eight small underfeathers, this is the interpretation, that in the country there shall arise eight kings, whose time shall be but small, and their years swift. By the angel's explanation, we understand that this was not a kingdom that was in existence in the days of Ezra. As the angel said, the days will come that there shall rise up a kingdom. Therefore, if Bible scholars believe this book was written sometime during the first two centuries, Rome would be disqualified, as it already existed at the time. However, if you take the book at face value, both countries are still eligible, as neither existed at the time the Jews were held captive in Babylon. Furthermore, the angels stated that these wings and feathers, both big and small, represented national leaders either emperors or presidents. We are told that the administration of these leaders will be consecutive, one after another. Furthermore, we are now given the total count of the feathers, 20, 12 normal and 8 small. Normal feathers represent leaders that will serve normal terms in office. Small feathers represent leaders whose terms would be cut short for unnatural reasons, contrary events, if you will. The description that no man spoke against the eagle doesn't mean that everyone agreed conceptually with this nation, such is never the case with human institutions. Rather, this means that no man could deny that this nation, this nation was preeminent in the world. Doing so would be like saying that water isn't wet. It is an indisputable fact that nobody could reasonably speak against. They might rage and slander it for any number of reasons, but as the saying goes, it is what it is. Ezra also noted that this country was feared by all others. In the scriptures, the term fear can often be interchanged with the term respect, such as fearing the Lord. Therefore, this reference need not mean that all nations literally cowered in fear, although many surely did. Lastly, we learn that the heads of this great eagle do not come into play until the consecutive administrations of the feathers have ended. 
So far, both Rome and the U.S. remain viable candidates. The vision continues. And I beheld, and lo, the voice went not out of her heads, but from the midst of her body. In other words, Ezra noticed that when the eagle spoke, the voice came from the midst of the body rather than the head, the eagle's mouth. Here again, Ezra's angelic guide provides the interpretation. This is a very important insight. As for the voice which thou heardest speak, and that thou sawest to not go out of the heads, but from the midst of the body thereof, this is the interpretation, that after the time of that kingdom there shall arise great strivings, and it shall stand in peril of failing. Nevertheless, it shall not then fall, but shall be restored again to its beginning. The angel is saying that the voice represents a great struggle that will be, take place in the country, one that will almost cause it to collapse, to dangle by a thread, so to speak. The kingdom does not, however, completely collapse at that time. After a tremendous struggle, it is restored to its original state. Rome began about 509 BC as a republic. However, Julius Caesar introduced the emperors, and from that time forward, the emperor could act as a dictator, and they often did. It never reverted back to its pure form. This seems to disagree with Ezra's prophecy. However, according to Joseph Smith, this requirement does align with what will happen in America. The time will come when the destiny of the nation will hang upon a single thread. At that critical juncture, this people will step forth and save it from the threatened destruction. By the term this people, Joseph was referring to the house of Israel, of which the church is a part. The nation that Joseph was talking about, of course, was the United States of America. The angel above is saying exactly the same thing. Already this vision seems to lean more towards an American interpretation rather than a Roman one. This vision will discuss the great turmoil that lies ahead for this great country. This statement definitely applies to America. We will keep this in mind as the explanation continues. And I looked, and behold, on the right side there arose one feather, and reigned over all the earth. And so it was that when it rained, the end of it came, and the place thereof appeared no more. So the next stood up and reigned, and had a great time, meaning a long administration. And it happened that when it rained, the end of it came also, like as the first, so that it appeared no more. Then came there a voice unto it, the second leader, and said, Hear thou that hast borne rule over the earth so long. This I say unto thee, before thou beginnest to appear no more, before the end of your official term in office, there shall none after thee obtain unto thy time, neither unto the half thereof. This is an amazing requirement. Ezra foresaw that not only would one of the leaders of this country serve twice as long as all others, but that after him no others would be permitted to do so, as if by official decree. This is where Rome goes completely off the rails. There is no Roman emperor for whom the same could be said. The longest serving Roman emperor was Theodosius II, who served for 48 years in that capacity. But Valentinian III, who served five years later, occupied that post for 31 years, well over half of Theodosius II's term. Caesar Augustus also served for 40 years, and many others served for more than 24 years. Therefore, unless this requirement is discarded, Rome's history excludes it from being the country that Ezra saw in vision. What about America? The longest-serving president was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was elected to four terms, and before the conclusion of his fourth term, Congress passed the 22nd Constitutional Amendment, limiting presidential terms to two terms. This doesn't just sound close to what Ezra saw, it sounds identical. Besides FDR, 
No other American president served longer than two terms, and now by law, no president can. America continues to qualify under the requirements of this vision, but Rome clearly doesn't. The vision continues. Then arose the third, and reigned as the other before, and appeared no more also. So went it with all the residue one after another, as that every one reigned, and then appeared no more. Then I beheld, and lo, in the process of time, the feathers that followed stood up upon the right side, that they might rule also, and some of them ruled, but within a while they appeared no more, for some of them were set up, but ruled not. After this I looked, and behold, the twelve feathers appeared no more, no, nor the two little feathers. And there was no more upon the eagle's body but three heads that rested, and six little wings, or feathers. The description of these leaders as described in the vision is that they ruled over all the earth. Some might argue that the United States technically does not rule the world, but this is an empty argument. It was through America that China would be open to the world, the USSR and the Iron Curtain would fall, that Europe would be twice liberated from fascists, Africa fed, that South America would, would model its governance, and that worldwide freedom, human rights, and democracy would be promoted, enforced, and protected. From this perspective, there is no question that the United States of America is the world's de facto leader. This is why the presidents of the United States of America have been given the title of the leader of the free world. Furthermore, 14 of the, these feathers are described as having been upon the right side of the eagle, 12 regular feathers, and two small ones. Therefore, we might assume that the six remaining little feathers are associated with the left side of the eagle. We therefore have two groups of feathers, a mix of 14 feathers on the right and six small feathers on the left. The angel also states that during the process of time, some of the feathers on the right stood up to rule, but did not. In other words, while all 14 of these leaders served consecutively, some of their administrations were cut short. The angel gives further clarification regarding where the administration of these two little feathers fall within the total group. And two of the little feathers shall perish, the middle time approaching, midpoint of the timeline. Ezra states that by the time you see the second of the two little feathers, or the second presidency cut short, you will know that the timeline's midpoint is near. Ezra has imposed very specific and stringent requirements upon the consecutive rule of these 14 leaders. The second leader needs to have served twice as long as any other, with none after him being able to serve more than half as long as he did by law. Then, approaching the midpoint of the timeline, the administrations of two of these leaders will have to be cut short by unnatural means. Given the strict requirements of these leaders, no Roman sequence of leadership qualifies. What about American presidents? With the identification of FDR as the second president in the series, it is a simple matter to determine how this group of 14 presidents compare to Ezra's prophecy. The results are truly stunning. Their administrations agree perfectly to the strict requirements of Ezra's vision. I believe that this perfect correlation with Ezra's vision cannot be coincidental. Of the first 14 presidents identified so far, the first is Herbert Hoover, who was elected to one term. The second is FDR, who was elected to four terms. The third is Harry S. Truman, who was elected to one term. The fourth is Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was elected to two terms. The fifth is J.F. Kennedy, who was elected to one term. The sixth is Lyndon B. Johnson, 
elected to one term. The seventh is Richard M. Nixon, elected to two terms. The eighth is Gerald R. Ford, elected to one term. Ninth is Jimmy Carter, one term. Tenth, Ronald Reagan, elected to two terms. Eleventh, George H. W. Bush, elected to one term. Twelfth, Bill Clinton, two terms. Thirteenth, George W. Bush, two terms. Fourteenth, Barack Obama, two terms. You will remember that the angels said that after the second Little Feathers administration would be cut short, we would be nearing the midpoint of the timetable. The two Little Feathers are readily identifiable as JFK and Richard Nixon. They were the only two presidents to be removed from office due to unnatural causes, assassination and scandal, Watergate. From the beginning of President Hoover's administration to the end of Nixon's was 45 years. As the angel said Nixon was approaching the midpoint, we should have approximately 45 re years remaining after him to the conclusion. You can see the amazing similarities between Ezra's vision and America's presidents. Despite having 22 presidential elections during this same time period, only 14 men were elected, the second of which was elected to twice as many terms as any other, and term limits were implemented prior to the end of his last term. Only two presidents in the series had their administrations cut short by unnatural causes, the last of which occurred halfway through the list. No other nation that I have come across aligns as perfectly or even remotely close to this. I want to communicate how significant this is. Consider this illustration. Since the founding of our country, Americans have voted for presidents 57 different times. As a result of those 57 elections, there have been 43 presidents. For illustration purposes, assume that I had two identical bags of 57 jelly beans. Assume that I selected 22 jelly beans from my bag and laid them out in a row and covered them so that you could not see them. Nor did I explain to you what the jelly, bean, jelly beans represented. Then I told you that I wanted you to replicate the order that I had laid out my 22 beans. What would the likelihood be that you would be able to select the exact same 22 jelly beans that I had selected and lay them out in the exact same order? The answer is 1 in 3.9 undecillion. This number is so large that you have probably never even heard of it. It's 39 with 35 zeros after it. Your odds of winning the California lottery are over a quadrillion times bigger than this. Amazingly, Ezra's vision placed the presidential jelly beans in their proper order 2,000 years before the founding of our country. Furthermore, he did so using an eagle, the basis for both the national emblem and the presidential seal of the United States of America. The odds for such an event happening and not being correlated are incredible. For this reason and others, I am convinced that Ezra's vision pertains to America and is being fulfilled right before our eyes. Not only this, but this vision appears to be counting down to a major event that will take place in our day. President Obama is the last president in the series. Therefore, the events Ezra sees next will be the result of the 2016 presidential election. There does not appear to be much time left. The vision continues. Then saw I also that two little feathers divided themselves from the six and remained under the eagle head that was upon the right side, for the four little feathers continued in their place. This interpretation seems to confirm that the six little feathers are placed on the left side of the eagle, but now two break away from that group and are placed under the eagle's right head. 
This symbolism is obviously significant. However, without further information, we wouldn't be able to interpret it. Thankfully, the angel provided additional insight as to what the symbolism means. Four little feathers shall be kept until their end begin to approach, but two shall be kept until the end. From this explanation, we learn that just as two of the little feathers would administer towards the middle of the timeline, the next four would administer towards the end of it. The last two presidents are then withheld until the very end. This explanation infers that something significant will happen between these last four feathers and the very last two. A major event. This fact will become clear as we continue. Now back to the 2016 presidential election. And I beheld, and lo, the feathers that were under the wing thought to set themselves up and to have the rule. And I beheld, and lo, there was one set up, but shortly it appeared no more, and the second was sooner away than the first. And I beheld, and lo, the two that remained thought also in themselves to reign. And when they so thought, behold, there awaked one of the heads that were at rest, namely the middle head, for that was greater than the other heads. And then I saw that the other heads were joined with it, and behold, the head was turned with them that were with it, and did eat up the two feathers under the wing that would have reigned. According to this, the winners of the 2016 election will in fact turn out to be the losers in a very real way. When a president leaves office for whatever reason, the vice president assumes the presidency. This was the pattern for both JFK and Nixon, the previous two little feathers. Such will be the case here. However, it appears that once the vice president assumes the presidency, he will likewise be eliminated from office, only faster than the president was. This has never happened before. But if both the president and the vice president were to be assassinated, the Speaker of the House would be next in line, followed by the president pro tempore of the Senate. Given the quick succession in which these events transpire, one plausible interpretation is that all four of these leaders are eliminated in a single event. Obviously, great security measures have been taken to prohibit such an event from happening. Rarely are these leaders all in the same place at the same time. However, there is one occasion each year where not only these four individuals gather together, but all three branches of government gather in the same room. This is the State of the Union Address. In recognition of this vulnerability, each year, prior to the State of the Union Address, an individual is selected as the designated survivor. This individual is not in attendance of the address, but rather taken to a secure third-party location, where if a catastrophic event or terrorist attack were to occur, they would assume the governance of the United States of America. Among other things, one of the results of such a devastatingly evil attack would be to consolidate the power of all three branches of government into the hands of one individual, the designated survivor. As Ezra's Eagle alludes to the fact that these horrible events will have been orchestrated to bring to pass a particular end by the three Eagle Heads, the designated survivor contingency could provide the perfect cover for such a deviant transition of power. Whatever the means used for assuming power, these three conspiring leaders will be right in the thick of it, just like the Gadiantans of old. While such a cataclysmic event may seem far-fetched, it should be acknowledged that a similar conspiring event brought about the collapse of the Nephite government just prior to the first coming of Christ to the Americas. Ezra Taft Benson taught that the Book of Mormon is a template for our day. As such, I do not believe the similarities between Ezra's Eagle and the Book of Mormon are coincidental. Do you? The vision continues. But this head put the whole earth in fear and bare rule over it, 
over all those that dwelt upon the earth with much oppression. And it had the governance of the world more than all the wings that had been. Again, to me it sounds as if this leader commands the power of the entire U.S. government, powers that the Founding Fathers went to great lengths to segregate into three distinct branches of government. As such, this leader can govern the world more than all the wings that had been. The world will therefore be in a state of shock and fear. Up until this point, the American people, if not its government, have always made a concerted effort to wield power benevolently. However, we have seen that in times of terrorism, the nation's benevolence goes out the window, the gloves come off, and the world is subjected to the terms America dictates. What couldn't this person do under such false guise of his personal righteous indignation? In order to fully comprehend the scope of what has just happened, we need to jump ahead to the end of Ezra's revelation, to the vision's hero, a fearsome lion. According to the vision, a roaring lion comes running out of the wilderness to counter this ruthless entity. We need to pay particular attention to the name this roaring lion uses to address this entity. And I beheld, and lo, as it were a roaring lion chased out of the wood, and I saw that he sent out a man's voice unto the eagle and said, Hear thou, I will talk with thee, and the highest shall say unto thee, Art thou it that remainest of the four beasts, whom I made to reign in my world, that the end of time might come through them? And the fourth came, and overcame all the beasts that were past, and had power over the world with great fearfulness, and over the whole compass of the earth with much wicked oppression. Let's first discuss what we know about this lion. When Christ came to the Americas, he prophesied to the ancient inhabitants that if the Gentiles, the people of America, did not repent and serve the God of Israel, they would be confronted by a fearsome lion. Therefore, it shall come to pass that whosoever will not believe in my words, who am Jesus Christ, which the Father shall cause him to bring forth unto the Gentiles, and shall give unto him power that he shall bring forth unto the Gentiles. It shall be done even as Moses said, They shall be cut off from among my people who are of the covenant. And my people who are a remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles, yea, in the midst of them, as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who, if he goeth through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces that none can deliver. In this passage, the lion is referred to by the Savior as a remnant of Jacob. However, this remnant is described as being terribly powerful, so much so that the strongest nation on earth is trodden underfoot by it. This is not the only reference to this lion. Mormon also referred to this lion in a warning to the Latter-day Gentiles that just like the Nephites who were totally destroyed, if they did not repent, a terrific lion would come amongst them and devour them. Consider his words. O ye Gentiles, how can ye stand before the power of God, except ye shall repent and turn from your evil ways? Know ye not that ye are in the hands of God? Know ye not that he hath all power, and at his great command the earth shall be rolled together as a scroll? Therefore repent and humble yourselves before him, lest he shall come out in justice against you, lest a remnant of the seed of Jacob shall go forth among you as a lion and tear you in pieces, and there is none to deliver. Obviously, this remnant of Jacob is a member of the house of Israel, but it is described as being so powerful that it can render 
America, the most powerful country on the earth, completely desolate if we do not repent. Therefore, in my opinion, this remnant of Jacob has to be the most powerful group on earth. But who are they? It's my opinion that this group is represented by the lost ten tribes of Israel. The Bible Dictionary states this regarding the lost ten tribes. Extensive promises and prophecies speak of the time when they of the north countries, the lost ten tribes, shall return when they are ready to obey the gospel. The gathering of the lost tribes is to be more spectacular of an event than the children of Israel coming out of Egypt in Moses' day. Now, when I think of the exodus of Egypt, there are no other scriptures that compare to the might and majesty of those miracles. Therefore, to say that the restoration of the ten tribes of Israel will rival that is saying something indeed. As the majority of this book deals with this remnant, we will leave this analysis for here right now. The lion refers to Ezra's eagle as the fourth beast. There are two other references to such a creature, one made by Daniel, Ezra's contemporary, and another by John the Revelator. That Ezra's vision is related to Daniel's vision was made clear in the beginning of this chapter. These accounts are all inter interrelated. Ezra's vision really just sets the stage for the events depicted by both Daniel and John regarding the beast they saw rise up in the latter days. Analyzing these accounts will be the topic of the next chapter of this book. Chapter 3. The Stout Horn In the previous chapter, I analyzed the vision of Ezra's eagle, up to the point where a roaring lion, representing a returning remnant of Jacob, confronts Ezra's eagle and referred to him as the fourth beast. In that analysis, I explored a theory wherein the eagle represented America and a series of 14 presidents ending with President Obama. After the conclusion of Obama's term in office, sometime during the term of the next president, it appears that there will be a series of horrific events that culminate in a coup d'etat of the most powerful country the world has ever seen. In order to put these events in context with our canonized scriptures, we must now turn to the account of Ezra's contemporary, Daniel. Daniel had some unique spiritual gifts and had the gift of dreams as well as the interpretation of dreams. He was like Joseph who was sold into Egypt. Daniel saw and interpreted multiple dreams as noted within his record. We do not know how many dreams Daniel saw or interpreted, but the ones that are recorded in the Bible, there appears to be common threads. These threads are meant to link the dreams together and help in the establishment of the larger picture when analyzed together. As such, I will begin this analysis with a dream wherein he saw four beasts, each representing a kingdom that would be dominant upon the earth in its day. Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and I was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon its feet as a man. And a man's heart was given unto it. <clears throat> and behold, another beast, a second, likened to a bear. And it raised itself up on its side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. And the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. As previously noted, each of these four beasts represented a dominant kingdom upon the earth. To understand the meaning of these first three kingdoms, we must review another dream associated with Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Nebuchadnezzar saw a great and terrible image, 
The image was comprised of four parts, with each part representing a different dominant kingdom in consecutive order of their appearance from top to bottom. The top portion of this image was made of gold and represented the kingdoms of Babylon. The second portion was made of silver and represented a kingdom that would rise after Babylon. From a supplemental dream that Daniel had, we learn that this kingdom was that of Syria and Persia. The third portion was made of brass and represented the kingdoms of Greece and Rome. The fourth kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar saw was diverse from all the others. It was made of iron, a metal stronger than that of any conceivable alloy of the other three metals combined. However, despite iron's comparative strength, Nebuchadnezzar noticed that while the image's legs were made of solid iron, the feet of the image were made of a mixture of iron and miry clay. Such a mis- mixture could not hope to compare in strength to solid iron. Indeed, such was Daniel's interpretation. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all of these things, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, and there shall be in it of the strength of iron, forasmuch as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou saw iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another. Even as iron is not mixed with clay, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. As Daniel describes it, it appears that the fourth kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar's dream starts out mighty but that something happens to fracture it. Afterwards, it remains partly broken and partly strong, with the broken pieces being bound together with miry clay. Furthermore, after this point, rather than referencing one king, he says, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Therefore, we might infer that the ten toes comprise a mixture of miry clay and iron, represent an alliance of lesser kings and kingdoms. The combined might of the alliance is strong as iron is strong, but the political nature of such an alliance is the weak link, the bond of miry clay. Ultimately, all of the kingdoms comprising this alliance are broken apart by the everlasting gospel of the kingdom of God, which is represented by a stone cut without hand that destroys and supplants the kingdoms of the earth. This is the backdrop provided by King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Let's continue now with Daniel's vision and the rise of the fourth beast. And this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that went before it. In Daniel's account, the fourth beast, the might, dominion, and oppression of the kingdom described are identical to those attributed to the latter-day kingdom ruled by the conspiring heads of Ezra's eagle. But this head, the biggest of Ezra's eagle's three heads, put the whole earth in fear and bear rule in it over all those that dwelled upon the earth with much oppression and it had the governance of the world more than all the wings, residents, that had been. Accordingly, these three seditious leaders exercised more control and unrighteous dominion over the earth than all the past presidents combined. Daniel saw that this fourth beast was diverse from all that came before it. All the other kingdoms that achieved worldwide dominion utilized the same kinds of weapon systems and technologies. Some may have had weapons made with different types of metallic alloys, but 
compared to intercontinental ballistic missiles capable of leveling entire cities with the push of a button, they were all comparatively the same. This fourth beast is in a category of its own. The description of the beast continues. And it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Daniel's vision goes on to explain what the horns represent. The ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall rise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. In other words, these ten horns in this vision that are seen to rise up on the fourth beast are the same as the ten toes of miry clay seen in the fourth beast in the King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. These are not like the consecutive leaders we saw in Ezra's dream, but represent a concurrent group that together have conspired to accomplish the same end. I suggest that America, prior to the introduction of the three eagle heads, was the equivalent to the legs of solid iron seen in King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. However, once these three heads take over, the old power structure is fractured. These three eagle heads then represent a powerful subgroup of global leaders represented by the beast's ten horns and are similarly correlated with the ten toes on the feet of the image, iron fragments bound in miry clay. In other words, these ten are the conspirers responsible for the creation of the aforementioned alliance and the fracturing of America. Thus, each of the ten horns need not represent the top national leader of an existing nation, just power-hungry and enabled individuals that have their own reasons and motivation behind their participation in this ungodly alliance. Daniel, however, observed trouble amongst the ranks of these ten horns. Three of the first horns are taken out by the rise of a new, diverse horn. By first horns, we are to understand that these three were the founding members of this dark coalition, and therefore likely the most influential of the ten. I find it surprising that these three horns are each removed by the rise of one very unique leader that is represented by a little horn. I find the description of this little horn to be very interesting. Daniel said that this new horn was diverse from all others, and was described as being little, powerful, and of all the horns mentioned, it is the only horn that has facial features attributed to it. I believe that these descriptions are very significant. We should not be persuaded to believe that the description of this horn's size has anything to do with its strength, inferring that the little horn is the weakest of the horns. It appears that the opposite is true. Consider this additional passage regarding the little horn. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the others which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them. In this description, rather than describing this horn as small, it is described as being more stout than his fellows. The term stout infers strength, ambition, and power. Daniel saw the other three horns would fall prey to this one. Therefore, this little horn appears to become the most powerful of the remaining horns, and I suspect the most feared and revered by its colleagues. Another interesting aspect of the horn's description is its apparent facial features. As all ten horns represent kings, it is obvious that all would have eyes and mouths. Why then make particular mention of these two features for this stout horn? I believe it is because these two features, along with its power, will set it apart from all others. We know that the reasoning behind identifying the mouth is that this horn spoke great and marvelous, albeit blasphemous words. 
The power of this horn's speech set it apart from all others. What then of its eyes? Daniel describes this horn as having the eyes like the eyes of a man. The word like infers that two things are similar, but not identical. Taste like chicken is a common phrase to describe the taste of meat. Rattlesnake may taste like chicken, but it's definitely not chicken. I suspect that once this individual comes to power, his eyes will play a distinctive role in identifying him. It is also important to explore the topic of this leader's apparent elimination of the three founding members of the Dark Coalition. It seems that this horn arrives late to the party. The ten already have their plans, and they are already accomplishing what they set out to do. However, shortly after the arrival of this horn, he seizes the foremost role of leadership. One would suspect that the foremost roles of leadership would have previously belonged to the three heads of Ezra's eagle, America being the world's most powerful nation. Therefore, I believe that the little horn takes out these three leaders, which would explain its immediate rise to preeminence. In order to further explain this theory, I need to return to the account of Ezra's eagle and pick up where I left off, particularly with regards to the rise and power of these three eagle heads. But this head put the whole earth in fear and bare rule in it over all those that dwelt upon the earth with much oppression, and it had the governance of the world more than all the wings that had been. According to Ezra's account, it is the largest head that is the foremost among the rulers of the earth. He rules with great oppression and power, but... As we will see, his reign is cut short. And after this I beheld, and lo, the head that was in the midst suddenly appeared no more, like as the feathers. Ezra sees that suddenly this powerful leader is gone, just like a president who concludes his term fades into the background, not to return to prominence. So it is with this powerful leader. We continue. But there remained the two heads, which also in like sort ruled upon the earth and over those that dwelt therein. And I beheld, and lo, the head upon the right devoured it that was upon the left side. It seems that after these three heads rise to power, they start dropping like flies, given the incredible amount of time, resources, and patience that it took for them to rise to power. It seems surprising that they fall so easily end so quickly. Ezra's angelic guide provides additional information. And whereas thou sawest that the great head appeared no more, it signifieth that one of them shall die upon his bed, and yet with pain. For the two that remain shall be slain with the sword, for the sword of the one shall devour the other. But at the last he shall fall through the sword himself." All three of these leaders, who through their craft obtained the rule of the most powerful kingdom on earth, are killed. I believe that these three leaders are killed directly or indirectly by the craft of the stout horn. It now appears that the power and control of these former three is consolidated into one. In the history of the world, great power centralized in one evil man has never worked out very well. Such will be the case with the rise of this singular leader. Daniel explains more about this horn. And he, the little horn, shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and thinks to change times and laws, and they, the saints, shall be given into his hand until time and times and the dividing of time. The little horn's agenda seems altogether different from that of the three horns he plucked up. He speaks blasphemy and wages war against the saints of the Most High God. There can be no doubt that this little horn is the long-anticipated Antichrist. John further describes the peculiar powers that are associated with this individual. Consider the following. And he, the stout horn, doth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth, 
by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. The little horn apparently has a firm grasp of principles of science that are not presently understood. He uses this knowledge to deceive the nations. We have also seen that this man will seek to rewrite history, times, and laws. I take this to mean that he will put forth lies and precepts of such a nature as to call into question the divinity of Jesus Christ. Because of his power, knowledge, and false miracles, the people will accept his words as truth. Faith in Christ will largely be abandoned. The following prophetic statement from Joseph F. Smith supports such a startling interpretation. I can testify that when the Lord will come, he will find faith upon the earth. That faith, however, which he will find, shall be limited to a very small portion of the inhabitants of the earth. It will not find faith in the nations abroad to any noticeable extent. He will not find faith among the peoples of the earth who have not received the gospel as it has been restored. But there will be faith among those of the house of Israel who have been gathered out from the nations and who have repented of their sins and received the message that came through the prophet Joseph Smith. Given the large numbers of active Christian faiths in the world today, this is an incredibly bold prophecy. It is my opinion that this stout horn will be the reason for the wholesale abandonment of faith in Jesus Christ. For non-LDS Christians, faith in Christ is entirely based upon the historical account alone. Whereas, Latter-day Saints have testimonies grounded in modern revelation. The guidance of Latter-day Prophets will insulate those that believe from any attempts to discredit the Christ, no matter how credible the secular evidence is put forth by the Antichrist. However, we are only insulated if our testimonies are given through the Holy Ghost, and if we believe that the Church is led by living prophets and apostles, men that not only teach us about Christ, but are witnesses to his existence. There is a significant difference between a teacher and a witness. Without such a testimony, even the very elect could and likely will be deceived. John's account continues. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. It appears that this powerful man will be able to exercise such global economic control and influence that anyone that does not submit to his will and precepts will not be permitted to participate in the global economy. No doubt this is instigated as another method for persecuting the true disciples of Jesus Christ. However, as this stout horn rages in his blind attempt to stamp out Christianity, he will also stamp out the great and abominable church. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and give their kingdoms unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. The destruction of the great and abominable church by this evil and conspiring conglomerate is the sign given to the Latter-day Saints via the Book of Mormon that the restoration of the house of Israel is at hand. The following extract is from Nephi's vision. And when the day cometh that the wrath of God is poured out upon the mother of harlots, which is the great and abominable church, of all the earth, whose founder is the devil. Then, at that day, the work of the Father shall commence in preparing the way for the fulfilling of his covenants, which he hath made to his people who are of the house of Israel. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God that it descended upon the saints of the church of the Lamb and upon the covenant people of the Lord, 
who were scattered upon the face of the earth, and they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. Nephi clearly saw that the great and abominable church would be destroyed at the hands of the wicked, the stout horn that usurped the power and control of America, and set himself to rule over it as a king through his secret works of darkness, will not be allowed to overcome the saints of God indefinitely. There will come a powerful rebuff to his wickedness. Consider the following interesting account of an ancient American prophet who looked forward to and saw this day. And this land, America, shall be a land of liberty unto the Gentiles, and there shall be no kings, dictators, upon the land, who shall rise up unto the Gentiles. And I will fortify this land against all other nations, and he that fighteth against Zion shall perish. The little horn fights against Zion and the saints of God. For he that raiseth up a king against me shall perish. For I, the Lord, the King of heaven, will be their king, and I will be a light unto them forever that hear my words. Wherefore, for this cause, that my covenants may be fulfilled, which I have made unto the children of men, that I will do unto them while they are in the flesh, I must needs destroy the secret works of darkness and of murderers and of abominations. Wherefore, he that fighteth against Zion, both Jew and Gentile, both bond and free, both male and female, shall perish. For they are they who are the whore of all the earth. For they who are not for me are against me, saith our God. For I will fulfill my promises, which I have made unto the children of men, that I will do unto them while they are in the flesh. These words are very powerful words. It seems that Jacob saw that a man would attempt to place himself up as a king or dictator over the people of America. But the Lord would show that he alone is king of the Americas. In that day, we will see the Lord's power in terrible majesty through the fulfillment of the covenants that he has made to the children of men. In the subsequent chapters of this book, I will go into great detail showing that these covenants relate to the latter-day gathering and restoration of the tribes of Israel. Therefore, it should be expected that this stout horn will prosper in America until the house of Israel is restored, at which time he must of necessity flee from these hallowed shores or be destroyed. The scriptures speak of just such a time when the lost ten tribes of Israel shall return from their long exile to save the saints, the children of Ephraim who dwell within the shadow of the everlasting hills. It will be through the fulfillment of these covenants that the American reign of this stout horn will be brought to an end and the Constitution reinstated. Then shall the enemies of Israel fall with the sword, but he, the little horn, shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall be discomforted, and he shall pass over to his stronghold, Europe, in the safety of the remaining seven horns. For fear, and his princes shall be afraid of the ensign, saith the Lord, whose fire is in Zion, and his furnace in Jerusalem. Daniel saw the same thing, but described it in a peculiar way. He said that the saints would be given into the hands of the stout horn until time and times and the dividing of time. This is a very peculiar time frame. In fact, it is so peculiar that I believe its uniqueness becomes the key to understanding it. This odd description is only used three times in Scripture, twice by Daniel and once by John the Revelator. I believe that these references were meant to link the subject matter of the two accounts. This will make more sense once we review the circumstances surrounding John's usage of the term. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars, and she being with child, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. This passage does not appear to have anything to do with the time frame mentioned above. However, due to the layered symbolism within the book of Revelations, 
We first need to understand the symbolism of the above passage before we can go deeper. The above passage is in reference to the Savior being born through the lineage of the house of Israel. We know this from the symbolism used. The heavens, a woman, the sun, the moon, and the stars are all symbols of the house of Israel. Let me illustrate as this concept is critical to understanding the whole. Before Joseph was sold into Egypt, he angered his family by sharing with them the following dream. And Joseph dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? Clearly the symbolism regarding the house of Israel was evident to Jacob. Regarding the woman, the Lord has often referred to Israel as his bride. Now let's determine how this ties into the timing of the little horn and the persecution of the saints. The account continues. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for time and times and the dividing of time from the face of the serpent. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. In this remarkable account, this unique time frame is associated with the time frame that the lost tribes of Israel are hidden in the wilderness. As you continue progressing through this book, it will become clear that the woman receiving the wings to fly into the wilderness is symbolic of the Lord leading the lost ten tribes of Israel away. This body of Israel stays in the wilderness until a time and times and half a time. In their absence, Satan wages war against the saints that were left behind. That's us. In Daniel... We saw that the horn prospered against the saints until time and times and the dividing of time. Here we see that this main body of ten tribes of Israel would remain in the wilderness until their return in a time and times and half a time. In other words, the little horn prevails against the saints of the Most High until the restoration of the house of Israel from their extended absence. Returning to Daniel's account, we find other evidences that support this interpretation. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. In the scriptures, titles are not limited to a single person. For example, King Nebuchadnezzar was called King of Kings, and Melchizedek was called Prince of Peace. Both titles belong to the Lord. I believe the title Ancient of Days is also a dual title. As the name portrays, this title is reserved for the oldest man. That's Adam. Adam is the oldest man in that he was the first of all men on this earth. However, there is another man to whom this title is uniquely qualified, John the Beloved. John is literally the oldest man to ever have lived on the earth, having been transformed by the Savior during his earthly ministry. The average person lives to be around 27,000 days old. John the Beloved is at least 730,000 days old. As you progress in this book, you will learn that one of John's key missions is to restore the lost ten tribes of Israel. Therefore, the duality of this title works beautifully. I believe that both John and Adam, a.k.a. Michael, will have clear and prominent roles to play in the latter-day redemption of Zion. As you progress in this book, it will become clear that one of the first things that the returning body of Israel will do 
is to come to the children of Ephraim located within the boundary of the everlasting hills. We now see that the saints will be in dire need of their assistance. Once this mighty host arrives, they will purge America and commence in the building of the new Jerusalem. The stout horn, however, does not find his end at the hands of the remnant of Jacob. It appears that he regroups and makes his stand in Europe. I say this because of John's view of these same events. It is obvious that John saw the same things as Daniel did, but he provided additional insight. And I saw another sign in the likeness of the kingdoms of the earth, a beast rising up out of the sea, and he stood upon the sands of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him power, and his seat in great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded with death, and his deathly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. John's description, while different from Daniel's, is also very similar. In John's vision, the first three beasts that Daniel saw are combined in a single beast, the lion, the bear, and the leopard. This conglomerate is then combined with the seven-headed blasphemous beast of the great and abominable institutions of the world. The symbolism here is that the kingdoms of the earth will conspire together, and through the wisdom and power of the dragon, Satan, they will prosper in the same way that the great and abominable church hitherto hath done. Notice that John saw the ten horns as being associated with this beast rather than the fourth beast that Daniel saw. Is this a discrepancy between the two accounts? No, I believe that this is meant to show that what happens to the fourth beast was the result of the collusion of the ten horns. As noted, this beast had seven heads, However, only one of them is described. This likely reveals its prominence amongst the group. As noted in the opening verse, these beasts are after the kingdoms of the earth. Therefore, this wounded head represents a wounded kingdom. The wound is described as a death blow given by a sword. The symbolism here is that in the recent past, this kingdom received a terrible wound, and by all rights, that wound should have killed it, or in other words, caused it to collapse into a Bolivian. However, miraculously, rather than fading from history, this country comes back from the dead, strong and powerful. Today, there are arguably only a handful of superpowers. Of these, the obvious one to fit the description of having received a deadly head wound in battle and miraculously recovering, is Russia. The world watched in amazement in 1991 as the USSR collapsed in bankruptcy, and the mighty Soviet Union fell to the ground, shattering into 15 separate countries. No doubt there are many among its leadership that have bitterly hated the shame they bore as a result of such a humiliating loss. Would it be a stretch to believe there are some remnants from the old regime that have never ceased plotting for the day their country would return from the ashes? John's account continues, And they, the world, worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, we now see that this unholy Russian-led alliance is given a mouth. There can be little doubt that this mouth is the stout horn with eyes likened to that of a man and a mouth. We previously learned that after this mouth is ejected from America, it regroups in Europe. John continues, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he exerciseth all the powers of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. 
It is my opinion that this additional beast represents the might of the United States of America, which for a time participated in this unholy alliance, but that participation was cut short due to the restoration of the House of Israel. The timing of these events is anything but certain, but I think it's worth considering what we have learned up to this point. From Ezra, we learned that the next four presidents, or rather those that would have the right to assume the presidency, namely the president-elect, the vice-president from the 2016 election cycle, the Speaker of the House, and the President pro tempore of the Senate, will all be forcefully removed from office. Given that Ezra said these presidents would not serve long, these horrible deeds will happen no later than the end of 2020. We are not told how long the three eagle heads remain in power, but it is long enough to oppress the whole world. We know that before too long, however, all three fall before the rise of the stout horn. Daniel provides some insight into how long this little horn's reign lasts. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceedingly great towards the south and towards the east and towards the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down, and an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice? and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden under foot. And he said unto me, Unto two thousand three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. According to these verses, once this stout horn rises to power, he rules for approximately six years and four months. Note the conflict that is noted between this little horn and the host of heaven in the which the little horn is powerful enough to cast down some of the hosts of heaven and stomp upon them. I take this to mean that when the remnant of Jacob comes to America, some of these will lose their lives expelling this mighty foe. Given how strong we know the remnant to be, what a truly unique and powerful leader this stout horn must be. Despite the remnant's losses, it appears that the stout horn is exiled to Europe and joins forces with the Russian-led coalition. From this point, we get another timeline. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as a mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, and it were wounded, as if to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. It would appear that once this terrible horn is ejected from America, he continues with the wicked conglomerate of nations for another three and a half years. Not surprisingly, this timetable corresponds to another horrific timetable. And there was given unto me, John, a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months." three and a half years. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, forty-two months, or three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, 
he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut the heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them into blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast, together with the little horn, that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, Jerusalem, where our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three and a half days, and they shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put into graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt upon the earth. And after three days and a half, the Spirit of life from God entereth into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up into heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. At the end of the three and a half year period, the stout horn prevails against the two prophets with the sealing power in Jerusalem and slays them. These lie in the streets for three and a half days, after which they are resurrected before the eyes of the world. I believe that this will be the beginning of the morning of the first resurrection, where all the righteous who have died up to this point will be resurrected. But before the arm of the Lord shall fall, an angel shall sound his trump, and the saints that have slept shall come forth to meet me in the cloud. Wherefore, if ye have slept in peace, blessed are you. For as you now behold me and know that I am, even so ye shall come up to me, and your souls shall live, and your redemption shall be perfected. And the saints shall come forth from the four quarters of the earth. The resurrection of the righteous is a precursor to the second coming, which I believe will happen very shortly after this event. When the Lord comes, he will be seen in the eyes of all the nations. Some people think that at the time of the Savior's arrival, immediately every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Christ. However, this will not be the case. Mosiah provides the proper timing for the fulfillment of that prophecy. <clears throat> yea, every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess before him. Yea, even at the last day, when all men shall stand to be judged of him. Then shall they confess that he is God. Then shall they confess, who lived without God in the world, that the judgment of an everlasting punishment is just upon them, and they shall quake and tremble and shrink beneath the glance of his all-searching eye. Mosiah explains that this event will take place at the judgment bar of God. However, while these wicked men yet live upon the earth, they will continue to deny the Christ. Not only will they deny him, they will gather to fight against him. And, if it were possible, they would kill him anew, for they will not have him to be their king. Such is the power and influence of the dragon the beast, and the little horn over the people of the earth. Because of the terrible trials the stout horn will have put the saints of God through, I want to thoroughly cover his demise. There are many passages that describe this culminating event. I will discuss four of them. The first is found within the Apocrypha. Behold, the days come when the Most High will begin to deliver them that are upon the earth, and he shall come to the astonishment of them that dwell on the earth. And one shall undertake to fight against another, one city against another, one place against another, one people against another, and one realm against another. And the time shall be when these things shall come to pass, and the sign shall be which I shewed thee, and the Son of Man be declared, whom thou sawest as a man ascending. And when all the people hear his voice, every man in their own land shall leave the battle they have one against another. And an innumerable multitude shall be gathered together, as thou sawest them, willing to come and to overcome him, the Christ, by fighting. But he shall stand upon the top of Mount Zion, and Zion shall come, 
the righteous and the resurrected saints, and shall be shewed to all men, being prepared and builded, like as thou sawest the stone graven without hands. And this, my son, shall rebuke the wicked inventions of those nations, which for their wicked life are fallen into the tempest, and they shall lay before them their evil thoughts, and the torments wherewith they shall be tormented, which are likened to a flame, and he shall destroy them without labor. I love the imagery of this passage, the wicked rising up against the Lord, fearing his might, but despising what he represents. The Lord standing with his people Zion, the kingdom of God, foreseen of old as a stone cut without hand, the same stone that King Nebuchadnezzar saw would overcome all kingdoms of the earth in the last days. Lastly, in this last battle, the greatest of all, the Lord alone fights on behalf of his weary people, and he is glorious. With his word, the Lord rebukes the wicked, and in his rebuke they see the horrors of hell, the wages of their labors. The Lord, without any effort, destroys the entire host. Such is the power of the Mighty One of Israel. Daniel saw something similar. And in the latter times of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also shall cause craft to prosper in the land, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. And he shall stand up against the prince of peace, but he shall be broken without hand. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. In this account, again we see that these wicked men have the audacity to stand against the king of heaven and earth, attempting to subject him to their rule. Again we see the king of kings break them without hand. The kingdom is then given to the saints of God as an everlasting kingdom, one that shall never again be taken from the earth. The next account comes from John the Revelator. He saw and vision the terrible end of this horrific host, that will gather together and attempt to destroy the Savior of worlds without number. His vision is breathtaking. And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with the white vesture, dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon a white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, that he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. And he hath on his vestiture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit upon them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Similar to previous accounts, 
the beast and the stout horn, together with their vast host of kings and men, stand together against the Lord. Again we see the beast and the little horn cast into hell, with the remnant of their forces being destroyed with just a word from the Lord's mouth. The last account I will review comes from the record of Zechariah. It is Zechariah who gives a more particular account of how the Lord will destroy the wicked. He also gives a sign to the world to know when the day has arrived. And then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall be removed toward the north, and half of it towards the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach into Azal. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee, and it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall be not clear nor dark, but it shall be as one day, which shall be known unto the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening it shall be light. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them, and they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall be consumed away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall be consumed away in their mouth. This account is of course consistent with the other accounts put forth, in that the saints join the Lord to witness the destruction of their oppressors. This account also attests to the same type of chaos in civil war among the nations preceding his coming. All the nations, that is, all but Zion, shall be at war. After this great and terrible day, the earth will enter into a period of glorious rest. Israel will be united, the new Jerusalem will be built, and the seed of Enoch will descend and reside once again upon the earth. The lost tribes of Israel our lost long brethren, together with the Lord, will introduce the earth to a way of life and progression that earthly eye hath not seen, nor hath entered into the heart of man. And the earth at long last will enjoy glorious rest for a long season. This concludes the introduction of these events described by Ezra regarding these latter days. This overview of the last days is meant to provide some context for the in-depth analysis of these events that the rest of the book will attempt to undertake, the primary focus of which will be upon the Latter-day Gathering and Restoration of Israel, and how these events will play such an important role in the events of the latter days. It is my opinion that these events will not play out in some far distant time and space, but as Ezra foresaw, they will play out in our day and in our lands. Therefore, as you read this book, you must ask yourself, am I prepared? Such preparation should be comprised of both physical and spiritual preparations. Regarding such, the prophets and the apostles of the Lord have wearied themselves in proclaiming, How much oil is in your lamp? For the bridegroom cometh. Chapter 4 The Great and abominable. Nephi was a stalwart boy and an amazing man. His belief in God influenced every day of his life. He had a profound influence upon the lives and salvation of both his family and the people that followed him. Even today, his stalwart example whispers out of the dust to resonate in our hearts and minds. He was a can do visionary. A common theme of his writings was that man not only had the right to commune with and receive revelation from God, but the sacred obligation to do so. He valiantly demonstrated time and again that the heavens were not sealed, but wide open. His God was an active participant in his life, and he mourned after those who did not diligently seek him. He did not doubt that if he sought answers from the Lord, they would come. 
As such, it comes as no surprise that he chose to preface his sweeping prophetic vision of the Promised Land with his own powerful testimony of personal revelation. And it came to pass, after I, Nephi, having heard all the words of my father concerning the things which he saw in a vision, and also the things which he spake by the power of the Holy Ghost, which power he received by faith on the Son of God, and the Son of God was the Messiah who should come. I, Nephi, was desirous also that I might see and hear and know of these things by the power of the Holy Ghost, which is the gift of God unto all those who diligently seek him, as well in times of old as in time that he should manifest himself unto the children of men. For he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the way is prepared for all men from the foundation of the world, if it so be that they repent and come unto him. For he that diligently seeketh shall find, and the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto them by the power of the Holy Ghost, as well in these times as in times of old, and as well in times of old as in times to come. Wherefore, the course of the Lord is one eternal round, and the Holy Ghost giveth authority that I should speak these things and deny them not. These are not idle words. One does not casually engrave metal plates. These passages are profound and were validated time and again throughout Nephi's life. Nephi then describes a glorious vision, not only of the tree of life, but also of his posterity's future. Included in that vision was the coming of the Savior to the Americas, the subsequent apostasy and destruction of the Nephite nation, as well as the day of the Gentiles and beyond. Explaining certain elements of Nephi's vision are important to fully achieve the purposes of this book. The first part of Nephi's vision is well known by even the primary children of the church. As such, I will not spend time elaborating upon the portion of Nephi's vision commonly known as Lehi's dream. Instead, I will begin my analysis as Nephi's angelic host begins to reveal the events of a far distant future. The angel showed Nephi a vision of Christ's ministry 600 years in advance. He was shown how the Savior would heal the sick, cast out devils, and spend his days serving among the least of men, the lame, the leprous, and the dregs of Israel's society. Nephi witnessed firsthand the charity of Christ even to the laying down of his life. Nephi then watched in horror as he saw Judah not only crucify their king, but also saw the house of Israel gathered together to fight against the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Nephi saw the destruction on the promised land preceding the ministry of the resurrected Lord to his people. He witnessed Jehovah's personal ministration to his seed upon the American shores. In contrast to the Jews, he rejoiced as he saw the American people embrace the Master's gospel. With several generations of his people passing away in righteousness, then he sorrowed as he observed the Americas fade away into apostasy and the subsequent destruction of the Nephite nation. The apostasy, as witnessed by Nephi, was unique in its plainness. He saw among many nations of the Gentiles the formation of a great and abominable organization. He saw this organization would play a prominent role among the Gentiles until the latter days. It would be the antithesis of the Church of God. The initial actions of this organization were to slay the saints of God, torture them and bind them down with a yoke of iron, bringing them into captivity However, it seems that the scope quickly changed from one of seek and destroy to that of power and dominion, like the secret combinations of old. Consider the following verses. And after they, the scriptures, go forth by the hand of the twelve apostles of the Lamb, from the Jews unto the Gentiles, thou seest the formation of that great and abominable church which is most abominable above all other churches. For behold, they have taken away from the gospel of the Lamb many parts which are plain and most precious, and also many covenants of the Lord have they taken away. 
And all this have they done that they might pervert the right ways of the Lord, that they might blind the eyes and harden the hearts of the children of men. John the Revelator, who was mentioned by Nephi, to Nephi by name, by his angelic guide, also spoke of the rise of this institution. Like Nephi, John was guided through his revelation by an angelic messenger. The following is John's angelic description of the events he witnessed. Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgments of the great whore that sitteth upon the many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee of the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. It would appear that this woman who herself is identified as the great and abominable church, is being identified by her location. Tradition tells that Rome got its start when seven hilltop communities began joining together for religious games. These seven communities would eventually combine under the goddess Roma to become the beginnings of the Roman Empire. This does not mean that these evil and conspiring tendencies first originated with Rome. We have learned by sad experience that it is the nature and disposition of almost all men, as soon as they get a little authority as they suppose, they will immediately begin to exercise unrighteous dominion. While these tendencies are the hallmark of the great and abominable organizations of the world, the Jewish leaders of their day exhibited these same characteristics regarding Christianity before the Romans ever did, hunting down and persecuting the apostles and saints of God. The Jews had twisted their laws into a way of maintaining their power and wealth and would destroy anything that threatened their way of life, even if it meant killing the very God they claimed to worship. This deference to power and wealth over truth is what makes the great and abominable institutions of the world tick. Similar to the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem, there can be no doubt that the Roman Empire opposed Christianity for many years, imprisoning, torturing, and killing the saints of God, but with a much larger reach and scope than the Jews did. The apostles' letters were sought out and confiscated to the degree possible by Rome, thus controlling and shaping the narrative of the New Testament. The Romans would wage war against the saints of God to one degree or another until the Edict of Milan in 313 AD, when a change occurred in the Roman mindset, suddenly allowing Christians to wor worship openly. Emperor Constantine the Great commissioned 50 Bibles in 331 AD, which would serve as the template for future books. Nephi tells us that many plain and precious teachings and covenants were removed in this process. By 391, Emperor Theodosius was using the same tactics that were used against early Christians against non-Christians, forcing all subjects of the Roman Empire to subscribe to Rome's manufactured version of Christianity. Consider the following extract from his mandate. It is our will that all the people who are ruled by the administration of our clemency shall practice that religion which the divine Peter the Apostle transmitted to the Romans. The rest, whom we adjudge demented and insane, shall sustain the infamy of heretical 
dogmas. Their meeting places shall not receive the name of churches, and they shall be smitten first by divine vengeance, and secondly by the retribution of our own initiative. Thus we see that once the oppressors determined to control faith rather than to suppress it, Christianity was morphed from the worship of the true and living God to an institutionalized method of asserting control and of obtaining and retaining power and dominion over the populace. Nephi saw that to maintain control, this organization would do horrific things. The power that the religious leaders wielded rivaled that of both kings and emperors. Nephi saw that the precepts perfected by the Roman Empire to exercise unrighteous dominion over men would remain a dominant force until the Lord's second coming. The Roman Empire collapsed around 476 A.D., but the precepts of this great and abominable church had only just begun. Today we tend to think of churches as brick-and-mortar houses of worship. I do not think that this is what Nephi's angelic guide had in mind. I believe this angel's use of the term church was to refer to a given group adhering to certain creeds, methods, and precepts as a church. Thus the angel could make the following blanket statement. And he said unto me, Behold, there are save two churches only. The one is the church of the Lamb of God, the other is the church of the devil. Wherefore, whoso belongeth not to the church of the Lamb of God, belongeth to that great church, which is the mother of abominations, and she is the whore of all the earth. Here the angel is stating that there are only two infrastructures. There is an infrastructure of evil and an infrastructure of good. The angel was not stating, as some unfortunately suppose, that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints would be the only component of the Lord's righteous infrastructure in the last days, to the exclusion of all others. Such a perspective is destructive and unfounded. We know this because the angel also said the following, Behold the formation of a church which is most abominable, above all other churches. The use of the plural indicates multiple churches existed outside of the great and abominable church. Thus it appears that the angel's reference is one of good and evil rather than congregational. The Doctrine and Covenants further clarifies this. In a revelation regarding the Latter-day missionary work, the following counsel was provided from the Lord to the missionaries. Contend against no church, save it be the church of the devil. This further implies that there are non-LDS churches that are not part of Satan's church, a.k.a. the great and abominable church. Furthermore, the Lord provides the following clarification to his early apostles regarding this matter. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him because he followeth not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. Christ gave us the key in the above verse for deciphering those that belong to the abominable church of Satan and those that don't. Those that support the Lord are with him. He is the master of those that bring forth good fruit. Satan is the master of they that bring forth evil fruit. Therefore, we need not suppose, like the Jews of old, that righteousness is determined by pedigree or membership affiliation, but rather by the condition of the heart. It is by the fruits that are born that we may discern the master of men, organizations, institutions, and churches." As Nephi's vision progresses, we see that the great and abominable organizations amass a worldwide fight against the Lamb of God. Note that Nephi tells us that this war is waged against the Lamb of God rather than the saints. To me, this indicates that Christianity as a whole will be in the crosshairs of these institutions. For years now, this attack has been 
unfolding, and to say their campaign has been successful would be an understatement. John the Revelator saw the same thing and described it as follows. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Note that the description that we have received of John's beast matches the previous description John provided of the great and abominable church. However, in John's account, he states that the great and abominable church wages war against the saints and overcomes them. Furthermore, Daniel also saw in vision the events of the latter days and described them as follows. And he, the beast or stout horn, shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. In Daniel's vision, it appears that many of the saints become fatigued by the persecution and judgment and give in simply because they're exhausted. They cannot endure to the end. The resistance goes for too long and they are overwhelmed. These accounts can be easily reconciled with Nephi's vision. All describe the great and abominable church pushing Satan's agenda of continuing the war in heaven. Satan and his brick-and-mortar institutions are fighting against the Lamb of God by seeking to destroy that which Christ seeks to save, men's souls. From John's account, we learn that Satan's war will be successful. He will overcome many of the saints. Behold, verily, thus saith the Lord unto you, in consequence of the evil and designs which do and will exist in the hearts of conspiring men in the last days, I have warned you and forewarned you. Efforts to rewrite our national histories have played out time and again, demonizing, slandering, and discrediting the founding fathers and their inspired work which they performed. Those that believe in Christ are marginalized as right-wing religious fanatics, relics of an unenlightened age. The entertainment industry's agenda of immorality and violence has eroded the moral base of society, ensuring that rising generations will seek ever lower than their forefathers, as happened amongst the Nephites. We have seen that the stout horn will take such deceptions to the next level. The world has already embraced Satan's counterfeit morality, But under the leadership of the Antichrist, sinful practices are extolled as pinnacle virtues. Presently, prominent men who vocalize traditional values over Satan's false morality are venomously slandered as intolerant bigots, demonized, persecuted, and discredited. If possible, they are forced from their employment, their business is boycotted, and their not-for-profit status challenged. Those that adhere to and advocate for the Lord's standard of morality are likewise persecuted. The saints of God will become overcome. Like Alma's people of old, they will be subjected to the dictates of the Antichrist. Many will become so worn out that they will be able to stand no more. Battle-weary, they will just collapse, if for nothing more than to receive the peace the Antichrist offers but it comes at a heavy price. It is in this extremely intense environment that Nephi saw that the Lord would not allow the great and abominable organizations of the world to indefinitely overcome and wear out the saints. For the time soon cometh that the fullness of the wrath of God shall be poured out upon all the children of men. For he will not suffer that the wicked shall destroy the righteous. Wherefore, He will preserve the righteous by his power, even if it so be that the fullness of his wrath must come, and the righteous be preserved, even unto the destruction of their enemies by fire. Wherefore, the righteous need not fear. For thus saith the prophet, They shall be saved, even if it so be as by fire. 
Apparently, the righteous will be saved from their persecutions when the wicked are destroyed by fire. Such destruction is commonly associated with the events of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. However, Nephi further expounds upon this concept in a very interesting way. Wherefore, the Lord God will proceed to make bare his arm in the eyes of all the nations, in bringing about his covenants and his gospel unto those who are of the house of Israel. Wherefore, he will bring them again out of captivity, and they shall be gathered together into the lands of their inheritance, and they shall be brought out of obscurity and out of darkness, and they shall know that their Lord is the Savior and their Redeemer, the Mighty One of Israel. From the above verses, and as we have seen in prior accounts, it appears that the Lord will answer the harassment and wickedness of the great and abominable church with a marvelous work and a wonder. A central component of this work appears to be the gathering of the scattered Israel out of obscurity in the eyes of all the nations. The prophecy continues, And the blood of that great and abominable church, which is the whore of all the earth, shall turn upon their own heads, for they shall war among themselves, and the sword of their own hands shall fall upon their own heads, and they shall be drunken with their own blood. And every nation which shall wage a war against thee, O house of Israel, shall be turned one against another, and they shall fall into the pit which they dig to ensnare the people of the Lord. And all that fight against Zion shall be destroyed. And that great whore, who hath perverted the right ways of the Lord, yea, that great and abominable church, shall tumble to the dust, and great shall be the fall of it. The above verses are very insightful. Nephi confirms what John foresaw, that the fall of the great and abominable church happens through the infighting of the wicked. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. It should be noted that Nephi's references here to the house of Israel likely denote all twelve tribes, not just Ephraim and Manasseh and Judah. The ramification of this reference will further be explored in the next chapter. Chapter 5 The Covenants of the Lord into the House of Israel As Nephi's vision continued, he saw the restoration of the gospel, as well as the missionary efforts amongst the Gentiles, which will spread the gospel of Jesus Christ across the globe. However, Compared with those numbered amongst the great and abominable church, the numbers of converts to the restored gospel would be small. Indeed, today, despite the fact that the church numbers some 15 million, compared to the billions alive today, our numbers round to 0% of the world's population. It's interesting to note, however, that if you were to take, say, a bread recipe and calculate out what percentage of the total ingredients salt was, it would also round to about 0%. And yet salt has a tremendous outcome on the taste of bread. Likewise, the members of the church, though our numbers be small, have a great influence on the world. Regarding the latter days, the angel makes a very interesting comment to Nephi, something that many might overlook, but that contains a key of knowledge for these last days. And it came to pass that the angel spake unto me, Nephi, saying, Thou hast beheld that if the Gentiles repent, it shall be well with them. And thou also knowest concerning the covenants of the Lord unto the house of Israel. And thou also hast heard that whoso repenteth not must perish. Therefore, woe be unto the Gentiles, if it so be that they harden their hearts against the Lamb of God. In the context of the latter days, this verse is exceedingly relevant. It is comprised of only two sentences. By nature, ideas conveyed within a sentence are related, 
Therefore, it is not coincidental that the angel referenced the Lord's covenants with Israel in the same sentence that he states that the Gentiles will perish if they don't repent. The destiny of the Gentiles is therefore inextricably linked to the Lord fulfilling his covenants with Israel. As we continue, this fact will become very clear. If the Gentiles repent, the Lord's fulfillment of his covenants will bless their lives. If the Gentiles do not repent, the fulfillment of the Lord's covenants unto the house of Israel will result in their destruction. Given this latter-day relationship between the Gentiles and the Lord's covenants with the house of Israel, it is imperative that we understand what those covenants are. Indeed, one of the predominant latter-day missions of the prophet Elijah was to not only turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, but to plant the, in the hearts of the children the promises made to their fathers. Which promises? Most Latter-day Saints understand the Abrahamic covenant to one degree or another. However, in addition to that covenant, the Lord made other promises, promises with tremendous Latter-day ramifications. In the day that the Lord delivered the children of Israel through the Red Sea, He promised them that He would make a covenant with them. We will refer to this covenant as the covenant of Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. Then, after Israel had wandered in the desert for forty years, but before they entered into the promised land, the Lord made another covenant with them in Moab. The covenant of Moab and the covenant of Mount Horeb together summarize the Lord's covenants with the children of Israel. Given their profound impact upon the latter days, we will review them now, starting with the covenant of Mount Horeb. This covenant can be found in Exodus chapters 19 and 20. A detailed study should be made of these chapters as only a summary of this covenant will be provided here. This covenant can be sum summarized directly from the scriptures as follows. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day they came into the wilderness of Sinai, and Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, <clears throat> Thus shalt thou say unto the house of Jacob, And tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I have done unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you upon eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenants, then ye shall become a peculiar treasure unto me, above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning <clears throat> that there were thunders and lightnings, and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceedingly loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and in the smoke thereof ascended a smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by a voice. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day 
to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood far off. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. This awesome display of the Lord's power is truly as awe-inspiring as it is terrifying. What would it have been like to witness Jehovah's limitless might, under whose foot Mount Horeb itself appeared to be on the verge of bursting into flame? At the sound of his voice, both the heavens and the earth shook. In the presence of such a being, Israel retreated in fear, terrified that just the sound of Jehovah's voice would destroy them. The covenant the people made with the Lord on this occasion was that, they would keep his commandments. In exchange, the Lord would make them a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. They would be blessed above all the people of the earth. The covenant of the Lord with the children made in Moab. The details to this covenant are found in the book of Deuteronomy. I will summarize this Moab covenant by pulling select scriptures from Deuteronomy's chapter 8, 28, 29, and 30. For a more comprehensive understanding of this covenant, the reader must make a personal study of these chapters. The covenant is summarized as follows. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of the Israel in the land of Moab, beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. Keep therefore the words of this covenant, and do them, and ye may prosper in all that ye do. The reference to prospering in the land is made dozens of times in the Book of Mormon and is a direct reference to these covenants. Ye stand this day, all of you, before the Lord your God, your captains of your tribes, your elders and your officers, with all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and the stranger that is in thy camp, from the who hewer of thy wood unto the drawer of thy water, that thou shouldest enter into a covenant with the Lord thy God, and into his oath, which the Lord thy God maketh with thee this day, that he may establish thee today for a people unto himself, and that he may be unto thee a God, as he hath said unto thee, and as he hath also sworn unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee, that he may establish his covenant which he sware unto thy fathers, as it is this day. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and statutes, and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou will not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land whither thou goest over Jordan to possess it. But it shall come to pass that if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee, the Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. And thou shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. And it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. 
How many times did the Israelites, whether in America or Middle East, perish because they forgot the Lord their God? How many times were they scattered and smitten before their enemies? It happens so often that the Latter-day Saints attribute the phrase pride cycle to this particular phenomenon. The pride cycle and the Moab covenant are one and the same. As Israel remembered the Lord their God, they were blessed and prospered in the land. As they forgot the Lord, they were scattered and smitten before their enemies. Israel's omniscient God knew that Israel would forsake their covenants and forget him, and would be, as a consequence, scattered. The Lord therefore made a very important provision as part of his covenant with Israel. Consider this provision. And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessings and the curses, which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shall obey his voice according to all that I commanded thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thine soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out to the utmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. The Lord states that once his covenant people began to remember him, he will once again gather them from the nations from which they have been scattered, or as applicable, from the outmost parts of heaven, as stated. Israel was to take the name of their God upon them, to always remember him, to remember his pending sacrifice via the statutes and ordinances of the law of Moses, and to keep his commandments. To the degree Israel kept their covenants, the Lord prospered them, made them an holy nation and a kingdom of priests. They were blessed beyond all the nations of the earth. To the degree that they did not, they were to be scattered and smitten until the time that they did. As we have previously noted, one of the purposes of the Lord sending Elijah before his coming was to plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to their fathers. Wherefore, the promises that the Lord made to Israel are relevant to us in these latter days. They are a precious gift, and we must remember them, for our remembrance of them is a condition of their fulfillment. Furthermore, these covenants will shape the events preceding the second coming in ways that most have never considered. In the next chapter, we will review how these covenants have impacted the tribes of Israel historically through today. Chapter 6, The History of the House of Israel With a basic understanding of Israel's covenants, it will be much easier to understand how these covenants have shaped the history of the House of Israel, especially in the context of Nephi's vision. This will be done first by reviewing the House of Israel as a whole, and then each of its members separately. At the conclusion of this review, we will be better prepared to understand the remaining content of Nephi's vision, as well as all subsequent sections of this book. Each subsequent section will build upon the groundwork laid out in this review. The House of Israel The House of Israel is comprised of the descendants of Jacob's twelve sons, namely Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, comprising Ephraim and Manasseh, and Benjamin. When Moses brought Israel to the Promised Land, he sent out a scouting party to survey the Promised Land. The search party was gone for 40 days. Upon their return, all but two of the party's members were terrified of the land's inhabitants and did not believe that the Lord could deliver them, despite all that they had hitherto witnessed. As a consequence of their unbelief, they were made to wander in the desert for forty years, one year for every day the party was gone. While wandering in the desert for forty years, 
these twelve tribes were commanded of the Lord to form four encampments, which would become the four camps of Israel. Each camp was to place its tents so that they were facing the tabernacle. These four camps were each comprised of three tribes. The camp of Judah was comprised of Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, and was located to the east of the tabernacle. The camp of Ephraim consisted of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin, and was located to the west of the tabernacle. The camp of Reuben was to the south of the tabernacle, and consisted of Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. The camp of Dan was located to the north of the tabernacle, and consisted of Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. Each camp had a unique ensign or banner. The ensign of each camp was as follows, Judah, a lion, Dan, an eagle, Ephraim, an ox, and Reuben, the head of a man. The placement of the camps of Israel and their standards are rich in symbolism, and often the representations of their corresponding standards are symbolically referenced rather than the four camps of Israel themselves. Consider the following example. As as for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, and the face of a lion, and the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. This verse was taken from Ezekiel, wherein he saw four beasts with faces matching the standards of Israel before the throne of God. This is similar imagery to the tabernacle of God being placed among the camps of Israel. Israel was God's people, and he was both symbolically and literally among their camps. Thus we see both iconic symbolism with the tribes of Israel as well as numeric symbolism. Both the number 12 and the number 4 are associated with the house of Israel. 12 for the tribes and 4 for the camps of Israel. Once Israel finally inherited the land that the Lord had covenanted with them that they would receive, and they lived as a united people in varying degrees of righteousness, until the death of King Solomon. After the death of King Solomon, the twelve tribes of Israel fractured into two kingdoms, the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel. A prophetic account of this fracture was given by Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam, the future king of the northern kingdom of Israel, those that would become the lost ten tribes. An abbreviated scriptural account of that prophecy is as follows. And it came to pass, at the time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, that the prophet Ahijah the Shilonite found him in the way, and he had clad himself with a new garment, and they two were alone in the field. And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him, and rent it in twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take these ten pieces, for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and I will give ten tribes to thee, because they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, which have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in my eyes, and to keep my statutes and my judgments, as did David his father. And unto his son, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, will I give one tribe, that David my servant may have a light always before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen to put my name there. And it shall be, if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command thee, and wilt walk in my ways, and do that which is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, that I will be with thee, and build thee a sure house, as I built for David, and will give Israel unto thee, and I will, for this, afflict the seed of David, but not forever. Accordingly, ten tribes followed Jeroboam and the, the created northern kingdom of Israel, with Samaria being their capital city. The tribe of Judah stayed in Jerusalem under the reign of Rehoboam. The ten tribes that went to the north and Judah that stayed behind 
account for only 11 of the 12 tribes of Israel. This may be due to the fact that the tribe of Levi was not allotted a geographical inheritance. Only unto the tribe of Levi, he, Moses, gave none inheritance. The sacrifices of the Lord God of Israel made by fire are their inheritances, as he said unto them. According to the verse above, Levi's inheritance was the Aaronic priesthood. Aaron and Moses were Levites. It is apparent from the scriptural record that the tribe of Levi was present in both the kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel, but their presence did not impact the geographical boundaries of either kingdom, as did the inheritances associated with the other tribes. Therefore, today the house of Israel can be identified in three subgroups, Judah, the house of Joseph, and the lost tribes of Israel. Let's first talk about Judah. Judah struggled to keep their covenants. Around the same time that Lehi was being led by the hand of the Lord out of Jerusalem, Babylon imposed itself upon Judah and would soon destroy it. The Jews were destroyed and taken into captivity around 587 BC. After being in captivity for seven year, 70 years, the prophet Nehemiah cried out unto the Lord in remembrance of Israel's covenants. Consider what he said. I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes opened, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the statutes, nor commandments, nor judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But... If ye turn unto me, and keep my commandments, and do them, though there were of you cast unto the uttermost parts of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence, and will bring them into the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are the, thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by the power and thy strong hand, O Lord. I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant, who desires to fear thy name, and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, the king of Babylon, for I am the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah cried out in agony of his soul to the Lord and asked him to remember the covenants he made with Israel the same ones we reviewed in the previous chapter. As a result of the Jews humbling themselves before the Lord and remembering anew these covenants, the Lord softened the heart of the king of Babylon. Not only did the king allow the Jews to return to Jerusalem, he financed the rebuilding of the city and the temple as well. Unfortunately for the Jews, the later generations did not continue keeping the covenants, but rather mirrored a cycle of wickedness similar to that of the Nephites. The church morphed from a saving institution into a system of power and status. This continued until approximately 70 AD, when the Jews were destroyed and scattered once again, after they had crucified the great Jehovah and persecuted, imprisoned, and killed his followers. This time, the Jews were scattered among all the nations of the earth and remained in that condition for more than 1,800 years. It was not until the atrocities of World War II, after the systematic slaughter of six million Jews, that the movement to reestablish their ancestral homeland would gain worldwide momentum. On May 14, 1948, David Ben-Gurion signed the Israeli Declaration of Independence, and once again established the Kingdom of Israel after 2,000 years of exile. 
On March 3rd, 2015, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, spoke before the joint session of Congress. The following was taken from that speech. America and Israel share a common destiny, the destiny of promised lands that cherish freedom and offer hope. The Jews are no longer scattered amongst the nations, powerless to defend ourselves. We restored our sovereignty in our ancient homeland, and the soldiers who defend our home have boundless courage. For the first time in 100 generations, we, the Jewish people, can defend ourselves. This is why, as Prime Minister of Israel, I can promise you, even if Israel has to stand alone, Israel will stand. Joseph There is no tribe of Joseph, but rather a house of Joseph, consisting of two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. This stems back to Jacob, the father of the tribes. Jacob's blessing to Joseph's sons help us to better understand this relationship. This is found in the book of Genesis. The account is as follows. And now of thy two sons Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt, before I, Jacob, came unto thee into Egypt, behold, they are mine, and the God of my father shall bless them, even as Reuben and Simeon they shall be blessed for they are mine. Jacob is saying that for purposes of inheritance, Joseph's sons shall be treated as if they were Jacob's actual sons rather than grandsons. The scripture continues, Wherefore they shall be called after my name, and thy issue, which thou begettest after them, shall be thine, and shall be called after the name of their brethren in thine inheritance, in the tribes. Therefore they were called the tribes of Manasseh and of Ephraim. And Jacob said unto Joseph, When the God of my fathers appeared unto me in Luz, in the land of Canaan, he swore unto me that he would give unto me and unto my seed the land for an everlasting possession. Therefore, O my son, he hath blessed me in raising thee up to be a servant unto me, in saving my house from death, in delivering my people, thy brethren, from famine which was sore in the land. Wherefore the God of the fathers bless thee, and the fruit of thy loins, that they shall be blessed above thy brethren, and above thy father's house. For thou hast prevailed, and thy father's house hath bowed down unto thee, even as it was shown unto thee, before thou wast sold into Egypt by the hands of thy brethren, Wherefore thy brethren shall bow down unto thee from generation to generation, unto the fruit of thy loins for ever. For thou shalt be a light unto my people, to deliver them in the days of their captivity, from bondage, and to bring salvation unto them, when they are altogether bowed down under sin. Ephraim and Manasseh were blessed above all Jacob's sons, and even above Jacob himself, this being a direct result of the role Joseph had already played in the preservation of Israel and the future role Ephraim and Manasseh would play in the salvation of Israel. The brazen sea, or baptismal font, stood upon twelve oxen, the symbol of the camp of Ephraim, in memory of the salvation that had once come to Israel through the house of Joseph and that would come again in the future. Jacob's references to the captivity and bondage are spiritual references, as indicated by the reference to Ephraim and Manasseh being a light unto Israel, who would be bowed down under their sins. This bondage and captivity are the result of another famine, not a famine of bread or a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. These two sons would bear the light of the restored gospel to the other eleven tribes. The account between Joseph and his father continues. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so that he could not see. And he brought them near unto him and kissed them. He's referring to Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And embraced them. And Israel said unto Joseph, 
I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God hath showed me also thy seed. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand, towards Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before the, whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be upon them, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He, Manasseh, also shall become a people, and he shall also be great. But truly his younger brother Ephraim shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee Israel shall be blessed, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. From these verses, the house of Joseph is given a special mission of salvation to the other tribes of Israel, with Ephraim receiving the birthright. It also seems clear that the elevated status of these two will come from the work of salvation they will bring to pass for their brethren. With Ephraim more than any other tribe, serving as the ensign bearer for the Latter-day Restoration and Proclamation, all other tribes of Israel will ultimately, directly or indirectly, receive the gospel at the hand of Ephraim, confirming Christ's words to his apostles, He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. The American origins of both Manasseh and Ephraim are documented in the Book of Mormon. Lehi was a descendant of Manasseh. From that book and our own history, we can infer that the latter-day Ephraim came to America from the Gentiles that went up out of captivity. Never does the Book of Mormon explicitly state that Ephraim and the Gentiles are one and the same, but rather it is inferred that Ephraim is a subgroup among the Gentiles. The term Gentile is of Jewish origin and denotes non-Jewish people. In the case of the Book of Mormon, given that the remnant of Manasseh writing the book came out of Jerusalem and closely related to the teachings and customs of this group, they perpetuated this non-Jewish tradition. Interestingly enough, Dictionary.com defines a Gentile as being either a non-Jew or a non-Mormon. From the Jewish perspective, Latter-day Ephraimites living amongst the Gentiles were themselves considered Gentiles and are referred to as such. Therefore, as we have discussed previously, it is by the fruits of these groups that they are known. Among all the affiliated Israelite groups, no group has responded to the restored gospel like the house of Joseph. It would appear that while the Lord himself would restore the gospel, he would use the house of Joseph to gather itself to the standard he had raised. Consider the following verse. Behold, the Lord requireth the heart and a willing mind, and the willing and obedient shall eat the good of the land of Zion in these last days, and the rebellious shall be cut off out of the land of Zion, and shall be sent away, and shall not inherit the land. For verily I say that the rebellious are not the blood of Ephraim, Wherefore, they shall be plucked out. The remnant of Jacob, or the lost tribes of Israel. In spite of the promises made to Jeroboam by a prophet of the Lord, 
the northern kingdom of Israel lived in a continual state of rebellion before Jehovah. They neither remembered the Lord their God nor kept his commandments. They disregarded the Lord in favor of the deaf and dumb idol gods of other nations, perhaps because they required nothing of them. Therefore, as stipulated in their covenants, approximately 200 years after becoming a kingdom unto themselves, they were destroyed and carried off into bondage. This destruction came to pass in the days of Isaiah, 721 B.C. They were conquered, with a remnant being carried off captive into Assyria. It is unclear precisely how long this remnant of the ten tribes of Israel remained in captivity. It is, however, clear that around 632 B.C., a Babylonian-led coalition attacked Nineveh, the Assyrian capital, which ultimately led to the complete destruction of the Assyrian Empire. To me, this seems like a trigger point. But, whether corresponding with the fall of the Assyrian Empire, or at some other time, it is evident that a large body representing the ten tribes of Israel left Assyria and headed north. This information comes to us from the Apocrypha. In this account, the prophet Ezra had a vision of the second coming of the Lord, wherein he sees a large group of people. He questions the angel regarding this host and is provided with the following answer. Those are the ten tribes, which were carried away prisoners out of their own land in the time of Hosea the king, who Salamansar the king of Assyria led away captive, and he carried them over the waters, and so they came into another land. But they took this counsel among themselves, that they would leave the multitude of the heathen, and go forth into a further country, where never mankind dwelt, that they might there keep their statutes, which they never kept in their own land. And they entered into the Euphrates by the narrow places of the river, for the Most High then shewed signs for them, and he stilled the flood till they were passed over. For through that country there was a great way to go, namely of a year and a half. And the same region is called Asareth. Then dwelt they there until the latter time. This fascinating account states that this group took counsel amongst themselves that they would keep their covenants, which they had never before kept. According to the promises of that covenant, in the day that they remembered the Lord and kept their covenants, he would again remember and bless his people and make them a holy nation. It appears that must have been the case. Rather than returning this people back to the land of their inheritance, as he would do with the Jews from their Babylonian captivity, the great Jehovah intended to do something new. The God of Israel led them north to a new land, where never before man had set foot. We do not know where the land of Ereseth is, only that the lost ten tribes will dwell there until the latter days, at which time they will return. Archaeological and DNA evidence clearly demonstrates that man had already inhabited Europe, Russia, Siberia, and even the Arctic Circle long before the Lost Ten Tribes left Assyria. As the apocryphal account clearly states that they were traveling northward to a place where never mankind dwelt, none of these locations could therefore qualify as the land of Asareth, under a literal interpretation of this scripture. Where then could these have gone? to be where man had never before dwelt. The belief that the lost ten tribes, like the people of Enoch, were taken from the earth, was common amongst the early members of the church, and seems to have its origins in the teachings of Joseph Smith. Consider the following verse, written by Eliza R. Snow, which was included in the 1905 hymnal of the church. And when the Lord saw fit to hide the lost ten tribes away, Thou earth was severed to provide the orb on which they stay. Also consider the two separate journal entries from the journal of Wilford Woodruff regarding this subject. President Young said he heard Joseph Smith say the ten tribes of Israel were on a portion of the land separated from this earth. 
The evening was spent in conversing upon the subject of the ten tribes in the North Country. A portion of the North Country containing the ten tribes may be separated from the earth. Orson Hyde and others believe that they would soon return. While none of these accounts should be interpreted as authoritative statements, they do demonstrate that members of the early church with no small reputation considered such an option as a real possibility. It is my opinion that an Enoch-like separation of these people, while hard to believe, is also the most scripturally harmonious theory I have found. It also may be the reason that the Lord included the following otherwise odd reference in the covenants discussed in the previous chapter. Though there were of you cast out unto the utmost parts of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence. Although there remains a shroud of mystery regarding the location of this group, it is crystal clear from, from the Exodus migration that when the great Jehovah is leading his covenant people, nothing is impossible. We know they went north. We know the Lord led them. We know they left in a large body. From Nephi, we receive further insight into this group. Consider the following verse. For behold, I, Jehovah, shall speak unto the Jews, and they shall write it. And I shall speak unto the Nephites, and they shall write it. And I shall speak unto the other tribes of the house of Israel, which I have led away confirming what we have read in the Apocrypha. And they shall write it. And I shall also speak unto all nations of the earth, and they shall write it. And it shall come to pass that when the Jews shall have the words of the Nephites, and the Nephites shall have the words of the Jews, and the Nephites and the Jews shall have the words of the lost tribes of Israel, and the lost tribes of Israel shall have the words of the Nephites and the Jews. These verses discuss the three groups we know make up the house of Israel, all of which existed in the past as independent bodies of people. Judah, the Jews, the house of Joseph, the Nephites, and the remnant of Jacob, the lost ten tribes. The fact that these groups have scriptures further implies that each group continued as a body long enough to have accumulated a noteworthy scriptural record. Regarding these verses, the Apostle James E. Talmadge made the following prophecy from the pulpit in General Conference in October 1916. The ten tribes shall come. They are not lost unto the Lord. They shall be brought forth as has been predicted. And I say unto you that there are those now living, I, some here present, who shall live to read the records of the lost tribes of Israel, which shall be made one with the record of the Jews, or the Holy Bible, and the record of the Nephites, or the Book of Mormon, even as the Lord hath predicted. In October 2016, this prophecy will have been given 100 years ago. Presently, approximately 2% of the population live to be 100 years old. According to the Gerontology Research Group, there have only been 226 Americans that have ever lived to be 112 years old. Therefore, in order for Elder Talmadge's prophecy to be accurate, the return of the Lost Ten Tribes will not only happen in our day, but must be eminent. Another Latter-day Prophet, Joseph Fielding Smith, made the following statement regarding the Lost Ten Tribes. The ten tribes were taken by force out of the land the Lord gave them. Many of them mixed with the peoples among whom they were scattered. A large portion, however, departed in one body into the north and disappeared from the rest of the world. Where they went and where they are we do not know. That they are intact we must believe, else how else can the scriptures be fulfilled? There are too many prophecies concerning them and their return in a body for us to ignore the fact. According to President Smith, the lost tribes of Israel are comprised of two separate groups. The first is comprised of those that stayed and mingled amongst the people of the nations wherewith they were scattered. 
The second was a large group that was led out of the land by the hand of the Lord. This latter group left in a body. They were in a body at the time of Christ's post-resurrection ministration, and they will return from Azareth in the latter days in a body. As stated by this prophet, there are many scriptures that refer to the lost ten tribes returning in a body. Of their return, we know that they will return from the direction they left, north. However, from a prophetic perspective, the most distinctive feature of their return seems not to be the direction from whence they come, but rather the miraculous manner in which they do. Consider the following reference to the return of the Lost Ten Tribes given by the prophet Jeremiah, Lehi's contemporary. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth which brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord liveth which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country. Note again the use of the term led associated with this group. If the Lord led this group away in a miraculous fashion as attested to by multiple accounts and returns them in the latter days in a miraculous fashion that will dwarf even the exodus of Egypt, it is fair to say that the whole world will together know of their return. Further insight regarding this group comes to us from modern scripture. Consider the following verses from the Doctrine and Covenants. And they who are in the north countries shall come in remembrance before the Lord, and their prophets shall hear his voice, and shall no longer stay themselves, and shall smite the rocks, and the ice shall flow down at their presence, and an highway shall be cast up out of the midst of the great deep, and their enemies shall become a prey unto them. And in the barren deserts there shall come forth pools of living water, and the parched ground shall no longer be a thirsty land, and they shall bring forth their rich treasures unto the children of Ephraim, my servants, and the boundaries of the everlasting hills shall tremble at their presence. And there shall they fall down and be crowned with glory, even in Zion by the hands of the servants of the Lord, even the children of Ephraim. And they shall be filled with songs of everlasting joy, because this is the blessing of the everlasting God upon the tribes of Israel, and the richer blessing upon the head of Ephraim and his fellows. These verses are packed with information regarding the return of the remnant of Jacob from the north. First, this again confirms that the ten tribes will return as a body, with their prophets at their head. Second, Their return is likewise described as being miraculous, with the appearance of a highway being cast up out of the great deep. The term great deep leaves much to the imagination, especially in light of Moses' reference to a portion of Israel returning from the utmost parts of heaven. Third, the returning remnant will come in power, subduing their enemies, which we can presume are the enemies of Israel. Fourth, it is consistent with the understanding we have obtained from Jacob regarding Ephraim and his adopted brothers and fellow tribesmen, with the lost tribes bowing or falling down before Ephraim. Fifth, while this account only generally alludes from whence this host comes, the north countries, it is quite specific about the location to which they will return, at least initially. These verses provide three separate locational references that, when taken collectively, all point to the same location. These are the three identifiers, the children of Ephraim, the boundaries of the everlasting hills, and Zion. The first of these is easily identifiable. There is no other location on the planet that houses more Ephraimites than the United States of America. The second The everlasting hills are likewise associated with the United States, and Utah specifically. The term everlasting hills is used only twice in scriptures. The first time, Jacob blesses Joseph that his seed will inhabit the everlasting hills, and the second in the verse above. If you are unfamiliar with this phrase, tune into a broadcast of the spoken word, the nation's oldest continual broadcast. Each broadcast closes with the phrase, 
again we leave you within the shadows of the everlasting hills. Lastly, according to the Bible Dictionary, Zion is associated with the United States specifically and the North and South American continents in general. In other words, the lost tribes of Israel, their prophets, and their corresponding records will at least initially come from a highway out of the great deep to the children of Ephraim in the United States. These accounts paint the picture of a miraculous return, an event of an incredible nature. Recall that the Bible Dictionary confirms this fact by stating the following regarding the return of this mighty host. Since their captivity, the lost ten tribes have never yet returned to their homeland, but extensive promises and prophecies speak of the time when they of the north countries shall return when they are ready to obey the gospel. The gathering of the lost tribes is to be more spectacular an event than the children of Israel coming out of Egypt in Moses' day. The purpose of the remnant of Jacob's return is an underlying theme that will be discussed at great length throughout this book. For purposes of this summary, it appears that the remnant of Jacob will come as a precursor to the second coming to purge the wicked. Consider the following verses from Jeremiah regarding this remnant. The portion of Jacob, the remnant of Jacob, is not like them, the vein of the world. For he, Jehovah, is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Thou art my battle axe and my weapon of war, for with thee I will break in pieces the nations, and with thee I will destroy the kingdoms. Likewise, consider the following from Jesus Christ during his discourse to the Nephites. And I say unto you, that if the Gentiles do not repent after the blessing which they shall have received, after they have scattered my people, then shall they who are a remnant of the house of Jacob go forth among them, and they shall be in the midst of them who shall be many, and they shall be among them as a lion amongst the beasts of the forest, and as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who, if he goeth through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Their hand shall be lifted up upon their adversaries, and all their enemies shall be cut off. Between Jeremiah and Jesus Christ, we understand that the remnant of Jacob shall sow destruction upon the wicked, the verses before these likewise describe the enemy of they who are in the northern countries as being destroyed. The points briefly touched on in this account shall be greatly elaborated upon within this book, but for now, this summary will suffice. Now that I have concluded this brief summary, I'd like to talk a little bit about the symbolism behind the placement of the camps of Israel. Earlier, we noted that the camp of Judah was placed in the east side of the temple, and the camp of Ephraim, consisting of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin, were placed on the west side of the temple. I do not believe that this placement is coincidental. The Lord knew long ago that the house of Joseph would receive their ultimate inheritance in the west, and that Judah would be in the east. We know this from the words of Zechariah the prophet, who prophesied regarding the latter days, particularly regarding the salvation of the Jews. This is what he said. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, should it also be marvelous in my eyes? Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country, and from the west country. Ephraim has settled in the location Nephi stated the pilgrims would arrive. Manasseh is located in Central and South America, where Nephi saw that the conquistadors would arrive among the seed of his brethren. Outside of these areas, there are no known concentrations of people affiliated with the tribes of Israel in groups exceeding one million members as of the date of the publication of this book. This is not unexpected, as Nephi noted that such would be the case. Consider the following verse. 
And it came to pass that I beheld the church of the Lamb of God, and its numbers were few, because of the wickedness and abominations of the whore who sat upon the many waters. Nevertheless, I beheld that the church of the Lamb, who were the saints of God, were also upon the face of the earth, and their dominions upon the face of the earth were small, because of the wickedness of the great whore that I saw. President Joseph Fielding Smith took Nephi's prophecy a step further by making one of his own. Consider his prophecy regarding the location of the faithful in the last days. I can testify that when the Lord will come, he will find faith upon the earth. That faith, however, which he will find, shall be limited to a very small portion of the inhabitants of the earth. He will not find faith in the nations abroad to any notable extent. He will not find faith among the peoples of the earth who have not received the gospel as it has been restored. But there will be faith among those of the house of Israel who have been gathered out from the nations and who have repented of their sins and received the message that came through the prophet Joseph Smith. Great are the covenants that the Lord has made with the house of Israel. He's a covenant-making God, and he wants a covenant-making people. The Lord does not enter into covenants lightly, nor does he expect his people to. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. In the past, Israel became obsessed with being a chosen people, rather than keeping the covenants they had made with the Lord. Whenever Israel kept their covenants, they prospered. Whenever they broke their covenants and ripened in iniquity, the Lord of the vineyard would clear the vineyard of the unproductive vines and branches cumbering the ground to make way for productive ones. As this has been the example in the past, so we can expect it to be the example of the future. Verily I say unto you, All among them who know their hearts are honest and are broken and their spirits contrite and are willing to observe their covenants by sacrifice, yea, every sacrifice which I, the Lord, shall command, they are accepted of me. Chapter 7 The Gathering of Israel Nephi was intimately familiar with the covenants and history of the house of Israel. He and his family had been warned of the Lord to leave Jerusalem for reasons directly correlated to Judah's failure to keep its sacred covenants. The Nephites at large also understood these things. They saw themselves as a grafted branch of Israel, strangers wandering in a strange land. Their very society was a testament to the covenants of the Lord, and thus from this perspective there is a unique understanding woven throughout their whole record. With a glimpse of such a background, we are better prepared to understand the deeper meanings behind the things Nephi was permitted to record. We now return to Nephi's account. And it came to pass that the angel spake unto me, Nephi, saying, Thou hast beheld that if the Gentiles will repent, it shall be well with them. And thou also knowest concerning the covenants of the Lord unto the house of Israel. And thou also hast heard that whoso repenteth not must perish. Therefore, woe be unto the Gentiles, if it so be that they harden their hearts against the Lamb of God. For the time cometh, saith the Lamb of God, that I will work a great and a marvelous work amongst the children of men, a work which shall be everlasting, either on the one hand or on the other either to the convincing of them unto peace and life eternal, or unto the deliverance of them to the hardness of their hearts and the blindness of their minds, unto their being brought down into captivity and also into destruction, both temporally and spiritually, according to the captivity of the devil, of which I have spoken. And it came to pass that when the angel had spoken these words, he said unto me, and I should point out that this is the second time he says this. Rememberest thou the covenants of the Father unto the house of Israel? I said unto him, Yea. 
The fact that the angel repeatedly brings up the subject of the covenants of the Lord to the house of Israel in regards to these latter-day events is certainly worthy of our consideration. Any time a messenger from heaven deliberately repeats something, we would do well to make sure that we have ears to hear and eyes to see. In this regard, the angel is referring to the Lord's covenants to gather Israel in the latter days. In addition to repeatedly referencing the covenants of the Lord, the angel references the great latter-day work. Note that in the church we tend to associate the phrase great and marvelous work with the Book of Mormon and Restoration, and surely this is part of it. However, the continual reference to the covenants implies that the restoration is a means to accomplish this work rather than the end of the work, as some Latter-day Saints mistakenly presume. Recall that both temporal and spiritual destruction are cited as part of this great and marvelous work. While the restoration certainly is associated with persecution and violent opposition, it was never associated with wholesale destruction. Therefore, we must assume that this portion of the great and marvelous work lies ahead of us. For all intents and purposes, the tribes of Judah and the house of Joseph have been gathered. Furthermore, Others from among the Lost Ten Tribes, particularly in Russian-affiliated countries, have been gathered, but in exceedingly small numbers by comparison. These precious few must therefore represent a sample of those that remained behind among the nations of the earth. The main body of the missing tribes has yet to be restored. Thus the angel is saying, When the Father gathers scattered Israel and restores the Lost Ten Tribes, then the Gentiles will have a day of reckoning. This is the great and marvelous work that will rival the exodus of Egypt in its scope and grandeur. For the righteous, this work will bring peace and life eternal. But for the wicked, it will result in destruction both temporally and spiritually. Thus the woe that is pronounced upon the unbelieving of the Gentiles. The angel then again shows Nephi that in the last days the great and abominable institutions will make war against the saints, of which we have previously discussed. However, in light of the background, let's reconsider the following passage. And it came to pass that I beheld that the great mother of abominations did gather together multitudes upon the face of the earth among all the nations of the Gentiles to fight against the Lamb of God. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God, that it descended upon the saints of the church of the Lamb, and upon the covenant people of the Lord, who were scattered upon the face of the earth. And they were armed with righteousness, and with power of God in great glory. These verses identify three separate groups of people in America. The first group is at war with the saints. The second is described as the saints of the church of the Lamb. In other words, the sincere and righteous disciples of Jesus Christ, by whatever name they be called. The third group is described as the covenant people of the Lord. The angel makes an obvious distinction between these two groups, but why? I believe the distinction between the two latter groups correlates to the two groups identified in the tenth article of faith. That verse describes those of the house of Israel that are gathered, and then those that are literally restored from the lost ten tribes. The gathering of the first of these groups began with the events surrounding the formation of the United States of America, and the second will apparently happen in a single eye-popping, jaw-dropping event. I believe that this last group will be restored from the utmost parts of heaven. This combined group of disciples is described as being armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. The dictionary defines the term armed as having entered into a state of readiness for war. Therefore, the covenant people together with the saints of God are prepared for a battle. Nephi uses similar language when describing the Revolutionary War. 
Let's continue with Nephi's account. And it came to pass that I beheld that the wrath of God was poured out upon that great and abominable church, insomuch that there were wars and rumors of wars among all the nations and kindreds of the earth. And as there began to be wars and rumors of wars among all the nations which belonged to the mother of abominations, the angel spake unto me, saying, Behold, the wrath of God is upon the mother of harlots. And behold, thou seest all these things. And when the day cometh that the wrath of God is poured out upon the mother of harlots, which is the great and abominable church of all the earth, whose founder is the devil, then at that day the work of the Father shall commence in preparing the way for the fulfilling of his covenants, which he hath made to his people who are of the house of Israel. The above verses confirm previous interpretations of the covenants of the Lord, because by the time the events are occurring as described above, the restoration will have already happened. The fulfillment of the covenants, therefore, must elude to the restoration of the lost tribes of Israel. Furthermore, the fulfillment of this covenant is again linked to the destruction among the wicked of the earth, as the wrath of God is poured out without measure. In the third chapter of this book, we learn that the great and abominable church would be destroyed by the hands of the evil and conspiring leader nations that will arise in the last days and were symbolized by horns, with the stout horn serving as their leader. Apparently, the destruction of that evil institution will precede the restoration of the house of Israel. Although the above passage eludes to a battle, Nephi was not permitted to further elaborate the angel forbade it. Nephi spoke very plainly. Indeed, he stated that his soul delighted in plainness. Thus, I find it very curious that the Lord forbade him to write the remainder of his vision in his own words. Consider the following. And behold, I, Nephi, am forbidden that I should write the remainder of the things which I saw and heard. Wherefore, the things which I have written sufficeth me, and I have written but a small part of the things which I saw. It is interesting to me how quickly the recorded vision ends. We are not told by Nephi how the covenant people show up among the saints of God, only that their arrival corresponds both with the downfall of the wicked Gentiles and the fulfillment of the Father's covenants to Israel. I appreciate that the fact that the conclusions I have drawn up to this point are very likely new to the reader. Therefore, let's further deliberate upon this before we continue. A predominant thought among members of the church is that Israel will be gathered together in the latter days through missionary work. Admittedly, we have seen that missionary work has been the primary force in the gathering of the house of Joseph. But what about the other tribes? Is there any evidence that they will be gathered to any significant degree through missionary work? The answer to this riddle is, is found in the allegory of the olive tree provided by the prophet Zenos and told in the whole in Jacob chapter 5 and in part in Romans chapter 11. In this great parable, there is a distinct difference between grafting Israel's branches and gathering Israel's fruit. The difference is in who performs the tasks. And because that I, the Lord of the vineyard, have preserved the natural branches and the roots thereof, and that I have grafted in the natural branches again into their mother tree, and have preserved the roots of their mother tree, that perhaps the trees of my vineyard may bring forth again good fruit, and that I may have joy again in the fruit of my vineyard, and perhaps that I may rejoice exceedingly that I have preserved the roots and the branches of the first. Wherefore, go to and call servants, that we may labor diligently with our might in the vineyard, that we may prepare the way that I may bring forth again the natural fruit, which natural fruit is good and the most precious above all other fruit. In this account, we learn that it is the Lord of the vineyard himself that grafts in these branches of his tree. The act of grafting is an act of restoration. 
Regarding the things of God, men can reform, but God alone has the authority to restore. And so it is in the parable that only the Lord of the vineyard performs the grafting. On the other hand, the work of fertilizing, pruning, and harvesting are tasks that the Lord of the vineyard performs in conjunction with his servants. Let's observe some latter-day examples of this principle of fruits versus grafts. As noted above, restorations are the work of the Lord. No unhallowed hand can keep such a work from happening. The restoration of the country of Israel is an example of an unstoppable event. Men tried to stop it from happening. They tried to destroy the Jews the instant the Lord reestablished his work, but the Lord sustained them in a miraculous fashion. This restoration was the Lord's work. It had little to do with missionary work. The Lord grafted the Jews back into the original tree all by himself. Likewise, while the Christian Reformation was the work of honorable men, the restoration of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was the work of God. It is true that Joseph Smith was an instrument in this great work, but everything he did was through the gift and power of God. Joseph was incapable by himself to restore the gospel. He could not bring back the priesthood, nor the plain and precious truths of the gospel that had been lost any more than could the good men of the Restoration do so. This could only have come from the Lord. While missionaries did not restore the gospel, they have assisted the Lord in gathering Israel to his standard. This is consistent with the parable. Now if the Lord himself grafted in both Judah and Joseph, will he not likewise graft in the main branches of the lost tribes of Israel? Why would these lost tribes be treated differently, especially if they were grafted into the nethermost parts of the vineyard? Does not the tenth article of faith explicitly state that such will be the case? We believe in the literal gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the ten tribes. The Lord will graft in the main body of the missing tribes of Israel. Jeremiah confirms this interpretation. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought the children of Israel up out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country. Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the heads of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he hath performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days ye shall consider it perfectly. Jeremiah explicitly says that the Lord will lead them out of the north country in a manner that will rival the Egyptian exodus, when he also led his people Israel. It is this group to whom the angel refers to as the covenant people of the Lord, who would appear among the saints in the last days. While missionaries themselves are a great wonder and have had many miraculous experiences, no one could rationally argue that their efforts and experiences rival the experiences of the deliverance of our forefathers from their Egyptian slavery. Jeremiah's statement that these events will be understood by all perfectly in the latter days, also corresponds with the timing of the events in Nephi's vision. Although Nephi was forbidden to write the remainder of his vision in his own words, the record clearly states, And also others who have been, to them hath the Lord shown all things, and they have written them. Who were these others? I believe that one of these was Ezra as we have seen in the first section of this book. Christ also declared that another was Isaiah. In fact, Christ expressly commanded us to diligently study his words. It should therefore come as no surprise that the first time Isaiah is mentioned in the Book of Mormon is the chapter immediately following Nephi's vision. In fact, following this chapter, Nephi either quotes Isaiah or discusses the meaning of Isaiah's words in almost all of the 41 remaining chapters of his record.
a search of the Isaiah chapters included by Nephi reveals that the vast majority of them deal with the latter days and the gathering of Israel. This is a deliberate move on Nephi's part to explain to us through the words of one who was commissioned to such a calling. And even then, Nephi is wary of elaborating too much upon Isaiah's words. After Nephi finished transcribing the words from Isaiah chapters 48 and 49, he began to elaborate upon their meanings, but stopped, saying, And now I, Nephi, make an end, for I durst not speak further as yet concerning these things. The similarity between his forbearance and the command of the angel cannot be ignored. By the end of Second Nephi, Nephi will have transcribed 19 of the 22 Isaiah chapters in the Book of Mormon. At the conclusion of this record, Nephi is once again constrained by the Spirit to not say too much regarding the words he had written. Wherefore, now after I have written these words, if ye cannot understand them, it will be because ye ask not, neither do ye knock. Wherefore ye are not brought into the light, but must perish in the dark. And now I, Nephi, cannot say more. The Spirit stoppeth mine utterance, and I am left to mourn because of the unbelief and the wickedness and the ignorance and the stiff-neckedness of men. For they will not search knowledge, nor understand great knowledge when it is given unto them even in plainness, even as plain as the word can be. If these profound words of Nephi do not impact you deeply, they should. There is an amazing message contained within his writings, but he knew that it would be hidden from most people, not because the Lord did not want them to know about it, but because they never asked. For most, the Isaiah chapters continue to be the least understood and least appreciated chapters in the Book of Mormon, and this is unfortunate. Using the voice of Isaiah rather than Nephi certainly limited the dissemination of Nephi's message, as most members skip or skim these chapters. The true meaning of Nephi's message is therefore kept by the Spirit of the Lord and opened only unto those that will knock. Therefore, if any man shall diligently seek, he shall find it, and the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto him by the power of the Holy Ghost. The next section of this book will focus on Isaiah's Latter-day message, as it was hand-selected by Nephi. I hope that by the end of which you will join me in great appreciation for the painstaking efforts Nephi undertook to make this message known. It is a message that will have a profound impact upon the latter days. Apart from Isaiah, the angel specifically makes mention of John the Revelator writing in regards of these things. As such, the writings of John will also be discussed in a subsequent section of this book. For obvious reasons, John's writings were not available to Nephi. Isaiah's, on the other hand, were. Note 8 to Section 2 Another interesting reference to the great apostasy comes from John the Revelator. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, be, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head, and his tail drew the third part of the hosts of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God, and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. 
My interpretation of these verses is as follows. The woman is the church, the man-child, the son of God, the seven-headed dragon, the devil, and his great abominable organization. The 1,260 days represent years of unabated darkness from apostasy. What is missing from the New Testament record is the reference point from which the apostasy began. It is not realistic to believe that the apostasy would have occurred on a specific date, but rather a slow fade over a period of time. Fortunately, the Book of Mormon is not silent as to the time frame of the American apostasy. After Christ visited the Americas, the people became righteous and unified in their worship of God. Their righteousness lasted longer than any other previous time on record. However, by the 231st year after the birth of Christ, there arose a people who were called the Nephites, and they were the true believers in Christ, among whom there were the three disciples of Jesus. And it came to pass that they who rejected the gospel were called Lamanites. By the year 2060 AD, the people of Nephi began to be proud in their hearts and become vain like unto their brethren the Lamanites. And from this time, the three disciples began to sorrow for the sins of the world. I think that it is reasonable to assume that the universal apostasy happened gradually during this time period. With this time range in mind, we can add the 1,260 years the church hid in the wilderness to both ends of the range. The resulting range is very insightful. 1491 to 1520. The following events happened during this time period and point directly to the beginning of the restoration, or the time of the Gentiles, and the coming of the marvelous work and wonder foreseen in Nephi's vision of the tree and life. 1491. Queen Isabella of Spain sponsors a man named Christopher Columbus. 1492. Columbus crosses the Atlantic Ocean. 1517. Martin Luther begins a movement that would spark the Reformation by nailing 95 false doctrines taught by the Catholic Church to his chapel door. 1519-1521 Hernán Cortés lands and conquers Mexico. These miraculous events line up perfectly with those discussed and recorded by Nephi approximately 2,100 years earlier. Chapter 8 Isaiah the Man There is a joke told of a soldier that always carried a small Book of Mormon with him in his front shirt pocket. One day, the soldier was shot in the chest and recovered by his comrades. They frantically ripped open his jacket to assess his wounds, only to find that he had miraculously avoided injury. The bullet had been stopped by his pocket-sized Book of Mormon. His comrades rejoiced at the soldier's good fortune and handed the book to the soldier for his inspection. Upon thumbing through the book, the soldier replied with a smile and a shrug, Seems nothing gets past Isaiah chapters. The Book of Mormon is filled with the plain and precious teachings of the gospel. It also holds many precious truths that are not readily available to the casual reader. The Lord used parables for similar reasons. Certain truths are only received by those that diligently seek them and are withheld from those that don't or who are not prepared to receive them. Isaiah's words require effort and study, not just passive reading. Therefore, the reader should buckle up for this next section. Nephi gave an interesting tip regarding understanding Isaiah. Yea, and my soul delighteth in the words of Isaiah, for I came out from Jerusalem, and mine eyes hath beheld the things of the Jews, and I know that the Jews do understand the things of the prophets, and there is none other people that understand the things which were spoken unto the Jews like unto them, save it be that they are taught after the manner of the things of the Jews. According to Nephi, the key to understanding the words of Isaiah is to understand the people to whom Isaiah spoke, the house of Israel. Previously, 
we briefly reviewed the House of Israel and each sub-member, namely the Jews, the House of Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh, the main body of the Lost Ten Tribes, and lastly, the scattered members of the House of Israel among all the nations of the earth. If we read Isaiah's words from the perspective and history of the House of Israel, Nephi says that they will make more sense to us. The purpose of this section is to assist the reader to understand the words of Isaiah from this perspective, particularly as Isaiah's words apply to Nephi's Latter-day Vision. In doing so, I hope the reader will come to understand why the Savior gave such singular praise to Isaiah's words and commanded the diligent study of them. In addition to studying these things from the perspective of the house of Israel and the Lord's covenants to them, one must seek the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, as you listen to the words of this section, listen to the thoughts and impressions that come to you. Such an exercise will bring you significant insights. It is always better to drink directly from the source whenever possible. Most of what is known about Isaiah comes from his own writings. Isaiah was a prophet to the entire house of Israel, both the kingdom of Judah as well as the northern kingdom of Israel. But his family and his message carried special importance to the northern kingdom. He was married to a woman to whom he referred to as the prophetess, and we know that they had at least two sons. The name of Isaiah's children were given as signs to the ten tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel, those that would become the lost ten tribes in Isaiah's lifetime. Isaiah's oldest son's name was Shir Jashub, which translates into, A remnant shall return. The younger son's name was Mahar Shalal Hashbaz, which translates to, Spoil quickly, plunder speedily, referring to the pending Assyrian invasion that would carry the ten tribes away into Assyria, where they were to disappear from our written record until the latter days. Tradition holds that Isaiah sealed his testimony as a martyr, being stuffed into a hollow log and sawn asunder by order of Hezekiah's wicked son Manasseh. However, death would not silence his words. Isaiah is the most quoted prophet of all time. His prophecies are quoted in the Old and New Testaments, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. Christ made particular mention of Isaiah throughout his ministry both in Jerusalem and in the Americas. It was through Isaiah's words that Jesus Christ himself would announce his Messiahship. Christ further validated Isaiah, stating that he saw all things concerning Israel, including their latter-day interactions with the Gentiles. And now, behold, I say unto you, that ye ought to search these things, yea, a commandment I give unto you, that ye search these things diligently, for great are the words of Isaiah, for surely he spake as touching all things concerning my people, which are of the house of Israel. Therefore it must needs be that he must speak also to the Gentiles, and all things that he spake have been and shall be, even according to the words which he spake. This is the only time in scriptures where the Lord has noted the works of a specific prophet with such high praise, and commanded to diligently study them. The Lord himself states that Isaiah saw all things concerning the house of Israel, which must needs include the latter-day gathering and restoration of the lost ten tribes. In a subsequent section of this book, we will make a more particular focus on Christ's message surrounding Isaiah's latter-day message. Isaiah's writing style was very advanced and beautiful for his day and for our own. His words are full of layered meaning. Oftentimes, the words he wrote applied to the events of his day on one level and to the events of the latter days on another. Therefore, a single verse may mean multiple things to multiple generations, thousands of years apart. 
It would therefore be unwise to try to limit the meaning of a verse to a particular time and place by disregarding any and all other possible meanings. The best interpreter always has been and always will be the still small voice of the Holy Ghost. Carefully consider and seek such promptings as you continue your study. Alma certainly had access to the writings of Isaiah and was very familiar with his particular style of writing and layered meaning. Consider the words of Alma regarding the same. And now I, Alma, began to expound these things unto him, saying, It is given unto many to know the mysteries of God. Nevertheless, they are laid under a strict command that they shall not impart only according to the portion of his word which he doth grant unto the children of men, according to the heed and diligence which they give unto him. And therefore he that will harden his heart, the same receiveth the lesser portion of the word. And he that will not harden his heart, to him is given the greater portion of the word, until it is given unto him to know the mysteries of God, until he knoweth them, in full. Therefore, if you will diligently apply yourself to understanding the words of Isaiah, you will learn great things, things that you are supposed to know, having been commanded by the Lord to seek them out. In Isaiah's own words, he said, The Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season unto thee, O house of Israel. Unless we make a diligent study of Isaiah's words, particularly those that were selected by Nephi, we are living beneath our privileges as Latter-day Saints. Such are among the Book of Mormon's greatest and most awe-inspiring messages. By not doing so, we take lightly the gift that the Lord has given us. Because Isaiah saw all things pertaining to the house of Israel, he addresses the whole house of Israel together. Both people and geographical locations are taken into consideration. When Isaiah refers to Judah or Jerusalem, he is referring to the Jews. When Isaiah uses the term Israel or Jacob, the reader should take care to determine if Isaiah's message is a blanket statement regarding all twelve tribes, or if he is referring to the northern kingdom of Israel, i.e. the lost ten tribes in particular, as this is often the case with Isaiah. When Isaiah uses the term Assyria, it is often associated with the Lost Ten Tribes, as it was Assyria that conquered and captured them. When Isaiah uses the term Zion, he typically is referring to the house of Joseph and the American continent. However, Mount Zion is also a location in Jerusalem and may have reference to the Jews. A careful reading of the text should make clear which it is. Strive to identify to which group Isaiah refers. To facilitate the reader's study, verses from different chapters of Isaiah discussing similar topics have been grouped in effort to provide a more holistic illustration of concepts. This compilation of verses is not meant to be comprehensive. Furthermore, for the sake of redundancy, not every verse of Isaiah's teaching regarding a given topic is included. The purpose of this book is to highlight events regarding the Latter-day Gathering of Israel. As such, I will not cover every topic included in Isaiah's Book of Mormon works. I therefore encourage the reader to study each verse selected in its original context, as well as the reasons for why Nephi would have chosen the particular passage for transcription. Now, let's begin our study of this great visionary man. Chapter 9. The Origins and Mission of the Lost Ten Tribes In order to understand Israel's future, one must understand Israel's past. In a word, Israel was obstinate. They were quick to do iniquity and slow to remember the Lord and His covenants. This was not a surprise to the Lord, who knows the beginning from the end. Isaiah has clearly stated that he is declaring all things before they happen. Hearken and hear this, O house of Jacob, who are called by the name of Israel, and are come forth out of the waters of Judah, 
or out of the waters of baptism, who swear by the name of the Lord and make mention of the God of Israel. Yet they swear not in truth nor in righteousness. Nevertheless, they call themselves of the holy city, but they do not stay themselves upon the God of Israel, who is the Lord of hosts. Yea, the Lord of hosts is his name. Isaiah is openly declaring Israel's hypocrisy and rebellion before the Lord. Sadly, they have made covenants, but they just don't keep them. Behold, I have declared the former things from the beginning. Isaiah is saying that he is telling Israel what's going to happen to them before it happens, ranging from that day to the latter days. And they went forth out of my mouth, and I showed them, and I did show them suddenly. And I have even from the beginning declared to thee, before it came to pass, I showed them thee. And I showed them for fear, lest thou should say, Mine idol hath done them, and my graven image, and my molten image hath commanded them. Yea, and thou heardest not, yea, thou knewest not. Yea, from that time thine ear was not opened, for I knew that thou wast still very treacherously, and wast called a transgressor from the womb. Isaiah prophesied to both Judah and the kingdom of Israel that they would be taken into captivity long before the events happened. They could have repented, they could have changed their ways, but they didn't. The Lord wanted them to know that the things that would befall them were not happenstance. There were reasons, and the reasons had to do with the covenants that they made and then broke with the Lord. No sooner had the Lord delivered them from Egypt than they began to complain about how well they had it while they were slaves. Aaron, Moses' brother and spokesperson, made Israel a golden calf, and they worshipped it in place of the true and living God. No matter how great the miracles performed by the Lord, from dividing the sea to manna from heaven, they continually left the Lord for the trends and cultures of the day. These same issues presently plague the church. Some church members have left the Lord for the precepts of men and the praise of the world. Can those that do so expect different consequences than those our forefathers experienced? Isaiah continues, Yea, for thus saith the Lord, have I put thee away, or have I cast thee off forever? For thus saith the Lord, Where is the bill of your mother's divorcement? To whom have I put thee away? Or to which of my creditors have I sold you? Yea, to whom have I sold you? Behold, for your iniquities ye have sold yourselves, and for your transgressions is your mother put away. Under the law of Moses, all a man needed to divorce his wife was a bill of divorcement, which could be obtained for the slightest of reasons, such as a poorly cooked meal. Yet in this example, Israel has committed serious sins, yet the Lord states that he is not seeking a bill of divorce. God did not leave Israel. Israel left God. The wickedness of Judah and Jerusalem were great. However, the northern kingdom was even more so. The northern kingdom had wholly abandoned the Lord. The story of Elijah and the priests of ba Baal took place in the northern kingdom of Israel. They would not have the Lord to be their king. Finally, after approximately 200 years of self-governance, the Lord decided that enough was enough. Isaiah prophesied the following, Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the ten tribes, the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria, and all his glory. And he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. This section has specific references to the Assyrian army conquering the kingdom of the northern Israel and carrying away many into captivity. I will send him against a hypocritical nation, and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil, and to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. 
Without me, they shall bow down under the prisoners, and they shall fall under the slain. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Isaiah is saying that without the power of God to sustain them, Israel will fall prey to their enemies. However, the Lord reminds them that his hand of mercy is still extended towards them. What does this mean? It means that after they are captives to Assyria, and they look up to the Lord from underneath the heavy burden of their captivity, and once again remember and keep their covenants with him, he will have mercy upon them. Isaiah continues, Wherefore, when I came, there was no man. When I called, yea, there was none to answer. This references Israel's disregard for the Father, his Son, and his servants, the prophets. It did not matter whom the Lord would send. Their response was always the same. O house of Israel, is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, at my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I make their rivers a wilderness and their fish to stink because the waters are dried up and they die because of thirst. Here Isaiah makes reference to the Lord's tremendous power to save, but he will not force salvation upon anyone. Salvation must be sought out. Draw near unto the Lord and he will draw near unto you. The glory of the reward the Father has in store for Israel is so great that it would be unjust for God to bestow it upon those that don't seek it. Therefore, the Father and his servants continually admonish Israel to seek it. Then said I, Isaiah, Lord, how long, how long would Israel be scattered as a result of their stiff neckedness? And he said, Until the cities be waste without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate, and the Lord have removed men far away, and there shall be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. The Lord reveals to Isaiah that Israel will be lost until everything they had is gone, their wealth their lands, their homes, and cities. Even in punishment, though, the Lord works towards the salvation of his people. It is his work and his glory. What can seem like the worst trials of our lives can prove to be for our eternal good if we will but put our trust in him. Without the pain and agony of Gethsemane, there could have been no victory over death and sin. No glorious resurrection unto eternal life and salvation. Likewise, without the northern kingdom's Assyrian captivity, they never would have turned their hearts unto the Lord and counseled together to keep his covenants and statutes, as they never had done it before when they lived in their own land. Thus, with Israel, we see a foreshadowing of the greatness of the Lord, for he has provided the way for deliverance. The righteous seek him early. However, all but the vilest of sinners, the sons of perdition, will, after they have walked the length and breadth of hell, rise again in a glorious resurrection unto a kingdom of glory beyond all description. In all things, the Lord works for the salvation of mankind. Furthermore, Isaiah states that the lost tribes would not return until after the world had fallen into apostasy. A great forsaking of the gospel would take place. It has now been approximately 2,400 years since the ten tribes have inhabited the lands of northern Israel, and the great apostasy has both come and gone. In the next verses, Isaiah provides insight into the good that the Lord intends to come to pass as a result of the Assyrian conquest of the northern kingdom of Israel. The captive exile hasteneth that he may be loosed, and that he should not die in the pit. I have put my words in thy mouth, and I have covered thee in the shadow of my hand, that I may plant the heavens, 
and lay the foundations of the earth, and say unto Zion, Behold, thou art my people. These verses are full of meaning and prophecy. Isaiah foresaw the following things. 1. The captive exiles are made free. 2. That they would have the word of the Lord. 3. That they would be hidden in the shadow of the Lord's hand. 4. The Lord would plant the heavens with them. 5. The Lord would use them to lay the foundations of earth. 6. They would serve and bring about the identification of Zion. All six of these prophecies are directly associated with the mission that the Lord would give the lost ten tribes of Israel. We will consider all of them in sequence. First, the captives are made free. Many scriptures have witnessed to the fact that a large body of the lost ten tribes was once again made free from their Assyrian captivity, my favorite of which is found in the account from the Apocrypha. Let's review it here again. You will remember that this is the prophet Ezra, who, having been granted a vision of the second coming, saw a large host of people and questioned his angelic guide about them. This was the angel's response. Those are the ten tribes, which were carried away prisoners out of their own land in the time of Hosea the king, who Salamanser, the king of Assyria, led away captive, and he carried them over the waters, and so came they into another land. But they took this counsel among themselves, that they would leave the multitude of the heathen and go forth into a further country, where never mankind dwelt, that they might there keep their statutes." or covenants, which they never kept in their own land. And they entered into the Euphrates by a narrow place of the river. For the Most High then shewed signs for them and held still the flood till they were passed over. For through that country there was a great way to go, namely of a year and a half. And the same region is called Ereseth. Then dwelt they there until the latter time. The above description shows that this group was freed from spiritual and physical bondage. They were delivered from spiritual bondage in the sense that they finally repented and sought the Lord to keep his covenants and commandments. They were delivered from physical bondage in that the Lord brought them out of their captivity and led them to a new land where never before man had dwelt a land where they would dwell until the latter times, which of course infers that they will return from Aserath in the latter days, that's to say, our days. The second prophecy, the lost tribes would have the word of the Lord. Through Isaiah, the Lord clearly states that these exiles would have the word of the Lord. I have put my words in thy mouth. On the evening of the first day that Christ visited the Nephites, when he perceived that they were tired, he made the following statement, But now I go unto the Father, and also to show myself unto the lost tribes of Israel, for they are not lost unto the Father, for he knoweth whither he hath taken them. From this verse, we learn that the lost ten tribes literally had the word of the Lord to the same extent that the Jews and the house of Joseph had them. Furthermore, from other scriptures, we know that they have both written scriptures and living prophets living amongst them, and that one day their records will become our own. Third, the lost tribes would be hidden in the shadow of the Lord's hand. Isaiah saw that the knowledge of this group would be lost from mankind. As in all things, the Lord did this for his own purposes. Consider the following account from the allegory of the olive tree. And these I will place in the nethermost part of my vineyard, whithersoever I will, it mattereth not unto thee. And I do it that I may preserve unto myself the natural branches of the tree, and also 
that I may lay up fruit thereof against the season unto myself. For it grieveth me that I should lose this tree and the fruit thereof. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard went his way and hid the natural branches of the tame olive tree in the nethermost parts of the vineyard. The Lord had a reason in mind 2,400 years ago when he led the ten tribes away, just that he had a reason for keeping their whereabouts hidden. For the generations that passed away while the ten tribes were covered in the shadow of the Lord's hand, their whereabouts were not relevant. This is because they were never going to have any interactions with them. They were not there to interact with. The same will not be true for the latter days. Number four, the Lord would plant the heavens with the lost tribes. This reference fits very well with other citations we have reviewed such as the earlier citation from the Apocrypha, wherein it states that the Lord would lead the lost ten tribes to a place wherein never before man had dwelt. It also agrees with the wording of the Lord's covenant with Israel, as stated by both Moses and Nehemiah. Moses said the following, If any of thine be driven out to the utmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee? Nehemiah said, But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out to the uttermost parts of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Christ also mentions a host of his elect being gathered from the ends of heaven in the last days. Consider the following verse. The Son of Man shall come, and he shall send his angels before him with the sound of a great trump, and they shall gather together the remainder of his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. The common theme of these accounts is the ends of heaven. In connection with the gathering of Israel, it would be easy to misunderstand the words of a single prophet. But four, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And let us not forget the curious entry in Wilford Woodruff's journal. President Young said he heard Joseph Smith say that the ten tribes of Israel were on a portion of land separated from the earth. As we continue with this analysis, we will find that these are not the only such references. There are many more but these are sufficient for this illustration. Fifth, the Lord would use the lost tribes to lay the foundations of the earth. The foundations of the earth are typically associated with the creation. Therefore, this reference to the lost ten tribes and the creation of the earth cannot refer to the initial creation. We know, however, the Lord has much greater plans for the earth than its present state. Consider the following from the Doctrine and Covenants. Therefore, the earth must needs be sanctified from all unrighteousness, that it may be prepared for the celestial glory. For after it hath filled the measure of its creation, it shall be crowned with glory, even with the presence of God the Father. We learn here that the earth will become a new celestial sphere, we also learn that before this process can take place, the earth must be sanctified from all unrighteousness. This sanctification takes place by the cleansing of the earth by fire. Furthermore, we know that another part of the sanctification process will be when the New Jerusalem, or Zion, is built upon the American continent. We learn this fact in many different places, but the tenth article of faith is a great, succinct summary. We believe in the literal gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the ten tribes, and that Zion, the new Jerusalem, will be built upon the American continent, that Christ will reign personally upon the earth, and that the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisical glory. As the presence of God the Father is the glory with which the earth will be crowned, and Zion will be the city wherein God dwells, 
it could be said that the foundations of the new earth will be the foundations of Zion itself, the city of the Lord. Jesus Christ tells us that it will be the lost tribes of Israel that will lead the charge in the building of the new Jerusalem. Consider the following account. And the Gentile shall assist my people, the remnant of Jacob, the lost ten tribes, and also as many of the house of Israel as shall come, that they may build a city which shall be called the new Jerusalem. As we continue, we shall also come to understand that the remnant of Jacob, or the lost ten tribes, will destroy the wicked by fire, sanctifying the earth in preparation for the Lord's coming. Thus, they help lay the foundations of the new earth by both building Zion and by destroying the wicked. This latter part will be reviewed and elaborated upon greater as we move forward in the book. Number six, the lost ten tribes would serve to bring about the identification of Zion. As noted above, the lost ten tribes or remnant of Jacob will return to build Zion. While Zion is a place, it is best described as a people. And the Lord called his people Zion because they were of one heart and one mind and dwelt in righteousness, and there were no poor among them. Latter-day Saints know and look forward to the day when Zion will be built. This was a consuming desire of the early saints. However, the new Jerusalem will not be built until the remnant of Jacob returns. In a previous section, we learned that the remnant of Jacob will initially arrive in America. What better way to identify the Lord's people than the endorsement of a vast heavenly host who miraculously appear from a highway cast up out of the great deep. As we continue, we will see that all of these missions are consistently identified with the lost ten tribes of Israel. This is a major theme of Isaiah's work, particularly of the chapters Nephi transcribed into the Book of Mormon. Chapter 10 The Apostasy and Restoration As we learned in the previous chapter, Isaiah was shown that the northern kingdom of Israel would not return until after the great forsaken had taken place. We refer to this event as the Great Apostasy. Given the relevance of the apostasy to Israel, it should come as no surprise that Isaiah covered both it and the restoration in great detail. He discussed the apostasy among Judah, the ten tribes, and also among the Nephites. In these next verses, Isaiah uses the term Ariel to describe what would happen to the seed of the house of Joseph. The term Ariel can be translated as the altar of the Lord. There was but one temple among the Jews, and for a while there was one among the Samaritans as well. However, from the Book of Mormon, it appears that there were many temples among the Nephites. Furthermore, in the last days it would be Joseph that the Lord would use to restore temples once again. Therefore, the house of Joseph, more so than any other tribe, is associated with the holy altars of the Lord. The name Altar of the Lord is therefore uniquely fitting to the house of Joseph. But the house of Joseph also fell into apostasy and broke their covenants with the Lord. And so, according to the terms of the covenant, the Lord scattered them. Yet I will distress Ariel, and there shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be unto me as Ariel. And I will camp against thee round about, and will lay siege against thee with a mount, and I will raise forts against thee, and thou shalt be brought down and shall speak out of the ground, and thy speech shall be low out of the dust, and thy voice shall be as one that hath a familiar spirit out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. Nephi provides a perfectly clear and easily understood interpretation of Isaiah's words. He explained these words as follows. But behold, 
I prophesy unto you concerning the last days, concerning the days when the Lord God shall bring these things forth unto the children of men. After my seed and the seed of my brethren shall have dwindled in unbelief, and shall have been smitten by the Gentiles. Yea, after the Lord God shall have camped against them round about, and shall have laged siege against them with a mount, and raised forts against them, and after they shall have been brought down low in the dust, even that they are not. Yet the words of the righteous shall be written, and the prayers of the faithful shall be heard, and those who have dwindled in unbelief shall not be forgotten. For those who shall be destroyed shall speak unto them out of the ground, and their speech shall be low out of the dust, one that hath a familiar spirit. For the Lord God will give unto them power that they may whisper concerning them, even as it were out of the ground, and their speech shall whisper out of the dust. Although Nephi saw that his seed would fall, he also saw that the record of his people would be preserved. He witnessed that the Lord's covenants would be remembered and taught once again, even by a voice whispering from the dust of the earth. Accordingly, Isaiah testifies to the importance and veracity of the record. Isaiah foresaw that the Nephite record would be translated by an unlearned man, while the Jaredite record would remain sealed until the righteous of the earth could justify its opening. Isaiah's vision is remarkable and unmistakable for those familiar with the story of its translation. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men, Martin Harris and Joseph Smith, deliver to one that is learned, Charles Anton, of Columbia University, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, Joseph Smith, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. For those to whom Isaiah's words are not clear enough, Nephi, after transcribing them, offers this very plain interpretation of the process in which the Book of Mormon would come to light. Nephi also saw the Siljaredite portion of the record, as well as the three witnesses and the eight witnesses of the Book of Mormon. He also saw Martin Harris taking the characters of the book to Charles Anton, a scholar in ancient languages from Columbia University. And it shall come to pass that the Lord God shall bring forth unto you the words of a book, and they shall be the words of them which have slumbered. And behold, the book shall be sealed, and in the book shall be a revelation from God, from the beginning of the world to the ending thereof. Wherefore, because of the things which are sealed up, the things which are sealed shall not be delivered in the day of the wickedness and abominations of the people. Wherefore, the book shall be kept from them. But the book shall be delivered unto a man, and he shall deliver the words of the book, which are the words of those who have slumbered in the dust, and he shall deliver these words unto another. But the words which are sealed he shall not deliver, neither shall he deliver the book, for the book shall be sealed by the power of God, and the revelation which was sealed shall be kept in the book until the own due time of the Lord, that they may come forth. For behold, they reveal all things from the foundation of the world unto the end thereof. And the day cometh that the words of the book which were sealed shall be read upon the housetops, and they shall be read by the power of Christ. And all things shall be revealed unto the children of men, which ever have been among the children of men, and which ever will be until the end of the earth. Wherefore, at the day when the book shall be delivered unto the man of whom I have spoken, the book shall be hid from the eyes of the world, that the eyes of none shall behold it, save it be that three witnesses shall behold it by the power of God, besides him 
to whom the book shall be delivered, and they shall testify to the truth of the book and the things therein. And there is none other which shall view it, save it be a few according to the will of God, to bear testimony of his word unto the children of men. For the Lord God hath said, The words of the faithful should speak as if it were from the dead. Wherefore the Lord God will proceed to bring forth the words of this book, and in the mouth of as many witness as seemeth him good will he establish his word. And woe unto him that rejecteth the word of God. But behold, it shall come to pass that the Lord God shall say unto him, To whom he shall deliver the book, Take these words which are not sealed, and deliver them to another, that he may show them unto the learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And the learned shall say, Bring hither the book, and I will read them. And now, because of the glory of the world, and to get gain will he say this, and not for the glory of God. And the man shall say, I cannot bring the book, for it is sealed. Then shall the learned say, I cannot read it. Wherefore, it shall come to pass that the Lord God will deliver again the book and the words thereof to him that is not learned. And the man that is not learned shall say, I am not learned. Then shall the Lord God say unto him, The learned shall not read them, for they have rejected them. And I am able to do mine own work. Wherefore, thou shalt read the words which I shall give unto thee. Touch not the things which are sealed, for I will bring them forth in mine own due time. For I will show unto the children of men that I am able to do my own work. Wherefore, when thou hast read the words which I have commanded thee, and obtained the witness which I have promised unto thee, then shalt thou seal up the book again, and hide it up unto me, that I may preserve the words which thou hast not read, until I see fit in mine own wisdom to reveal all things unto the children of men. For behold, I am God, and I am a God of miracles, and I will show unto the world that I am the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that I work not among the children of men, save it be according to their faith. This is a remarkable prophecy from Nephi, and must have been part of the vision that he originally saw, but could not then expound upon any further. Indeed, the phrases used here are the same as the phrases used in Nephi's preamble to his vision. It speaks to the fact that we will have the golden plates once again, and all will one day read the sealed record. Isaiah also saw God the Father visit Joseph Smith, and heard the message that the Lord would deliver to the young boy. Isaiah went as far as quoting the Lord's words to the boy prophet. We know this We know this because Nephi preceded the transcription of the following verse from Isaiah with these words, And again it shall come to pass that the Lord shall say unto him that shall read the words that shall be delivered unto him. Wherefore the Lord said, Forasmuch as this people draw near unto me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear towards me is taught by the precept of men, therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid." The Lord's words to Joseph Smith in the grove are a perfect description of the doctrines taught by the religions of our day. Lip service is given to the Lord, but the weightier manners of chastity, brotherly love, charity, kindness, and patience are often set aside. Again we hear the reference to a marvelous work and a wonder. The same phrase used by Nephi in his vision associated with the events of the latter days. The bringing forth of the Book of Mormon is certainly part of the marvelous work in a wonder. The story of its preservation in ancient times and its discovery and translation are miraculous. However, the Book of Mormon and corresponding restoration represent a part of the work, not its sum and substance. There still remains a portion that will cause the wisdom of the wise men 
to perish. It is interesting to note the order of events that are presented by Isaiah regarding this topic. The order and events themselves can be found in either Isaiah chapter 29 or 2 Nephi chapter 27. The events happen as follows. First, the Book of Mormon whispers from the dust. Second, Isaiah sees the marvelous work and a wonder. Third, the wisdom of the wise perishes. After these three things have happened, Isaiah states the following, For assuredly as the Lord liveth, they shall see the terrible one is brought to naught, Satan and the great abominable church. And the scorner is consumed, and all that watch for iniquity are cut off. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob? Jacob shall not now be ashamed, neither shall his face now wax pale. But when the world seeth his children, the remnant of Jacob, the work of my hands in the midst of them, they shall sanctify my name, and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob, and shall fear the God of Israel. To me, this last part appears to be the marvelous work and a wonder to which Isaiah is referring. The same work that Nephi said would either lead to the peace and eternal life, or both temporal and spiritual destruction. Isaiah comes out and links this marvelous work and a wonder with the return of the remnant of Jacob. Isaiah speaks of the whole earth being in awe of this event. Let's face it, while the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints rightfully view the Book of Mormon as a marvelous work and a wonder, the world at large perceives the book as a hoax and a fraud. Our religion is mocked and ridiculed. The coming forth of the Book of Mormon and the restoration of the gospel has not yet confounded the wisdom of the wise. In their eyes, these things only give them more material with which to mock and scorn us. It appears to me that the undeniable work and a wonder in the world's eyes will arrive with the children of Jacob, the return of the lost ten tribes. This event will not only be glorious in the eyes of the church, but in the eyes of the world at large. At this host's presence, the world will both praise and fear the God of Israel. We must not forget that the restoration is not yet complete, not until the lost ten tribes of Israel have been restored. Isaiah continues to expound upon his vision of the restoration by commenting on the temple built on the top of the mountains. And it shall come to pass in the last days, when the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it, and many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. This verse has long been associated with the building of the Salt Lake Temple. To some degree, all nations have begun to trickle into it. Yet no one could reasonably argue that this prophecy has been fulfilled to the degree in which Isaiah envisioned above. To date, the members of the church still account for essentially 0% of the world's population. Isaiah's vision speaks of a scope far beyond this. Isaiah is describing the day when the church will be recognized for what it is, the church of God. That time has not yet come, for as Nephi foresaw, the dominion of the church of God was small compared to the hordes belonging to the great and abominable church. I suggest that after the gathering of Israel has been completed, such will no longer be the case. Chapter 11 The Remnant and the Assyrian In the first section of this book, we reviewed the account of Ezra's eagle. In that section we learned that in the latter days an antichrist with great power would arise and wage war against the saints. Isaiah also prophesied of an antichrist, 
but he used words and symbolism that the people of his day could relate with. In his day, Assyria was the arch enemy of the kingdom of Israel. It was Assyria that conquered Israel and carried them off into captivity, where they disappeared from the written record. It should come as no surprise, then, that Isaiah uses the term the Assyrian to indicate the arch enemy of the Lord's people in the latter days. For Isaiah, the usage of the term the Assyrian is the equivalent of Daniel's usage of the little or stout horn and John's usage of the term the mouth. All three of these terms denote the Antichrist. Isaiah foresaw the conditions of society immediately preceding the rise of the Antichrist. He understood that the world would rise up against the humble followers of Jesus Christ, whatever their label. He foresaw that their circumstances would become extremely dire. It was only after society had degraded to the point that they had become fully ripened in iniquity that this horrific leader would come to power. Consider Daniel's words regarding the same. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, an antichrist of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, and he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. I beheld, and the same Antichrist made war with the saints, and prevailed against them, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. As a result of this man's marvelous power, and Satan's evil enabling influence, this Antichrist will dominate the kingdoms of the earth in the latter days. As we learned in Ezra's Eagle, this will include the United States of America. In that section, we saw that during the 2016 presidential term, three leaders would rise to power in America. We saw that these three leaders were subsequently taken out by the rise to power of a stout horn. This horn would wage war against the saints, and they will suffer greatly as a result. Isaiah saw that such would be the case, but he also saw that the Lord would not allow this persecution to continue unchecked forever. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart I have written my law. Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revilings. For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. But until that time, the righteous saints will be subjected to the crushing push of the great and spacious building. Then, addressing the wickedness of the world, he leveled the following rebuke, which I imagine will cause them to crumble before the judgment bar of God at the last day. What mean ye? Ye beat my people to pieces, and grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord God of hosts, who justify the wicked for reward, and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Isaiah foresaw that in the latter days the poor, meek, and humble would be oppressed, as in many things the Book of Mormon provides the foreshadowing of these events. When Alma and his people were overcome and subjected to the dictates and punishments of evil and conspiring men. So we learn that this will happen again to the righteous in the latter days. As noted above, Daniel said that these things would happen in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full. Again referring to the Book of Mormon as the template, the iniquity of the Nephites seemed to come to the full when conspiring men overthrew the government of the land just before the tremendous physical destruction that occurred and the regulations of the government were destroyed because of the secret combinations of the friends and kindreds of those who murdered the prophets and they that did cause a great contention in the land insomuch that the more righteous part of the people had nearly all become wicked 
yea, there were but few righteous men among them. Now this secret combination, which had brought so great iniquity upon the people, did gather themselves together, and did place at their head a man whom they did call Jacob, and they did call him their king. Therefore he became a king over this wicked band, and he was one of the chiefest who had given his voices against the prophets who testified of Jesus. According to the Book of Mormon's account, an antichrist named Jacob was instrumental in destroying the Nephite government. Furthermore, he destroyed the faith of the people. The more righteous part of the people all turned to wickedness. In the Book of Mormon, this occurrence preceded the American ministration of Jesus Christ by five years. The similarities between this account and the Latter-day prophecy of Ezra's eagle are pronounced. It appears that history is about to repeat itself. Our society, too, has ripened in iniquity. In the day of Jacob, the Antichrist, those who stood up for virtue and chastity were considered weak-minded, archaic fools, worthy of the horrific persecution they received. So it shall be in our day. Isaiah saw that the latter-day world would be turned upside down and warned those of our day, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, that make a man an offender for a word, and that lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gate, and turn aside the just for a thing of naught. Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work of him that made it say, He made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, He hath no understanding? For the leaders of this people cause them to err, for they that are led of them are destroyed. Too many of our secular leaders have become corrupted. They speak one thing, but their hearts are fixed upon the things of the world. They lust after the things of the flesh, power, wealth, glory, and the praise of men. This is not limited to a few elite, but has become the attitude of the masses, thanks to a wide network of organizations and people that have long pushed to redefine the perceptions and core values of society. These are fighting against the Lamb of God. Behold all ye that kindle a fire, that compass yourselves about with sparks. Walk in the light of your fire, and in the sparks which ye have kindled. This ye shall have of mine hand. Ye shall lie down in sorrow. Christ is the light of the world's a light so penetrating and bright that it fills the immensity of space. However, Isaiah sees that men will discount the gospel for a thing of naught and walk after the light of their own sparks or the precepts of men and antichrists. Sadly, Isaiah warns that they who follow such a course will be pierced with sorrow when they finally realize the deficiency of what they have become compared to what might have been had they yielded to the promptings of the light of Christ, which at one time was present within their souls. And I will punish the world for evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay down the haughtiness of the terrible. After transcribing these verses from Isaiah, Nephi further expounded upon them with these insightful words. Because of pride and because of false teachers and false doctrines, their churches have become corrupted, and their churches are lifted up. Because of the pride, they are lifted up. They rob the poor because of their fine sanctuaries. They rob the poor because of their fine clothing. And they persecute the meek and the poor in heart. Because in their pride, they are puffed up. They wear stiff necks and high heads. Yea, Because of pride and wickedness and abominations and whoredoms, they have all gone astray, save it be a few, who are the humble followers of Christ. Nevertheless, they are led, that in many instances they do err, because they are taught by the precepts of men. 
and there shall also be many which shall say, Eat, drink, and be merry. Nevertheless, fear God. He will justify in committing a little sin. Yea, lie a little. Take the advantage of one because of his words. Dig a pit for thy neighbor. There is no harm in this. And do all these things, for tomorrow we die. And if it so be that we are guilty, God will beat us with a few stripes, and at last we shall be saved in the kingdom of God. O oh, the wise and the learned and the rich that are puffed up in pride of their hearts, and all those who preach false doctrines, and all those who commit whoredoms and pervert the right way of the Lord, woe, woe, woe be unto them, saith the Lord God Almighty, for they shall be thrust down to hell. Woe unto them that turn aside the just for a thing of naught, and revile against that which is good, and say it is of no worth. For the day shall come that the Lord God will speedily visit the inhabitants of the earth, and in that day they that are fully ripe in iniquity shall perish. If I have correctly interpreted the vision of Ezra's eagle, the day that the world has become fully ripened in iniquity is today. Therefore, the Lord will punish the world for its evil. As a result of the world's wickedness, nature itself has borne witness against the evil of men. Waves have heaved beyond their bounds. Earthquakes happen in diverse places. More powerful storm systems than have ever occurred are now occurring with greater and greater frequency. Unprecedented drought scourges. The list goes on and on and on. However, things are about to increase to a new level. The Lord will soon introduce the latter-day Antichrist, the Assyrian. This man, also called the Mouth and the Stout Horn, will be the enemy of the people of the covenant. This man will rise to power in America after that he has subdued three other corrupt leaders. Once he does, he will make a war against the saints and will overcome them for a season. These events were laid out in greater detail in the previous section called Ezra's Eagle. In that section, we reviewed Ezra's, Daniel, and John's account of those latter-day events. We now will review Isaiah's. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod, and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. For yet a very little while, and the indignation shall cease, and mine anger in their destruction. In this verse, Isaiah seems to be trying to reassure the saints in America that although they will suffer, their suffering will not be prolonged. The Assyrian will overcome them, but shortly the indignation shall cease. This is an interesting term. Indignation is typically associated with the term righteous. It infers anger that has been evoked for a just or righteous cause, such as when Christ drove the wicked from the temple in Jerusalem. Christ did not stay angry for long after the money changers ran from his father's house. So it seems that it shall be when the wicked are driven from Zion. This reference to indignation is also used by Daniel to describe the latter-day Antichrist. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that which is determined shall be done. From Daniel, we learn that the Assyrian will speak marvelous things against the God of gods. He exalts himself, and apparently he has the power and ability to do just that. However, he is only able to prosper until the indignation be accomplished. In other words, he prospers until it's time for the temple to be cleansed. That is to say, although he magnifies himself above the God of gods, he himself is the hired axe in the hand of the Lord. Isaiah continues, 
the Lord of hosts hath sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand, that I will bring the Assyrian in my land, and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off of them, and his burden depart from off their shoulders. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder, and his yoke from off thy neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Here Isaiah foresees that the Lord himself brought the Assyrian to this land, Zion, but that once here he should be tread under the foot of, on the mountains. Lehi prophesied long ago that no man could come into this land save they were brought here by the hand of the Lord. Wherefore I, Lehi, prophesy according to the workings of the Spirit which is in me that there shall none come into this land save they shall be brought by the hand of the Lord. What Lehi said and what Isaiah said that I will bring the Assyrian in my land, are in perfect agreement. If the Lord brought the Assyrian to his land, it was for a reason. Lehi explains what that reason is next. And if it so be that they, the inhabitants of America, shall keep his commandments, they shall be blessed upon the face of this land, and there shall be none to molest them, nor take away the land of their inheritance." and they shall dwell safely forever. But behold, when the time cometh that they shall dwindle in unbelief, and after they have received so great blessings from the hand of the Lord, having a knowledge of the creation of the earth, and all men, knowing the great and marvelous works of the Lord from the creation of the world, having power given them to do all things by faith, having the commandments from the beginning, and having been brought by his infinite goodness into this precious land of promise, behold, I say, if the day shall come that they will reject the Holy One of Israel, the true Messiah, their Redeemer and their God, behold, the judgments of him that is just shall rest upon them. Who can doubt that the judgments of the Lord now rest upon this country? Large portions of our society have recoiled away from the Lord like as if from a leper. The majority of Americans now openly mock the law of chastity, with only 3% of Americans refraining from sexual activity until they're married. Horrific violence serves as entertainment, just as it did in the days of the Roman Colosseums. Society has embraced secularism and hedonism is on the rise. The building block of society, the family, has been redefined by our judges, who fear men more than they fear God. Our government funds the abortions of hundreds of thousands of innocent children, whose organs are then harvested and sold like commodities. Many of the rising generation are addicted, detached, and desensitized, we have turned our back on the great God of Israel, so he allows the Assyrian to come into this land. Although wicked himself, he will unwittingly serve the purposes of the Lord. Once he has accomplished what the Lord intended him to do, evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate righteousness shall be desolate. It is because our society has trampled the God of Israel under their feet that he will bring this evil to our door. A covenant and a promise rests upon this land. For behold, this is a land which is choice above all other lands. Wherefore, he that doth possess it shall serve God or shall be swept off. For it is the everlasting decree of God. And it is not until the fullness of iniquity among the children of the land that they are swept off. After the Lord's purposes have been accomplished, the Assyrian will be driven from the land. Isaiah saw as much. Then shall the Assyrian fall with the sword, not of a mighty man, and the sword, not of a mean man, shall devour him. But the Assyrian shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall be discomforted. 
and the Assyrian shall pass over to his stronghold for fear, and his princes shall be afraid of the ensign. And the Lord, whose fire is in Zion, and his furnace is in Jerusalem. From the verses above, the sword comes to the Assyrian and his cohorts. To save himself, the Assyrian flees for the refuge of his stronghold. We can assume that this is not in the Americas. The question now becomes, from whom does this Assyrian flee? In Ezra's eagle, we saw that the hero of the vision was a roaring lion that came running out of the wilderness to confront the oppressor. And he will lift up an ensign to the nations from afar, and will hiss unto them from the ends of the earth. And behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. None shall be weary nor stumble amongst them. None shall slumber nor sleep. Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of their shoes broken, whose arrows shall be sharp and all bows bent, and their horses' hoofs shall be counted like flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind. They're roaring like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey and shall carry away safe and none shall deliver. The passage above and the passage before it both mention a mighty ensign that is raised. Many members of the church assume that the ensign that was raised in the last days is the restored church. This is true. But this is not the ensign that is alluded to in these two passages. The Assyrian was not afraid of the Latter-day Saints. The war he waged against them clearly shows that. However, when the second restorative event happens, a new ensign will be raised, and this one will terrify him. The restoration of the house of Israel. Furthermore, Note the similarity between the roaring lion in this passage and the roaring lion that confronted Ezra's eagle. This lion lays hold of the captives, that is to say the saints of God, and carries them away safely where none can harm them again. The Assyrian then flees to the security of his stronghold because he knows that he is not prepared to contend against such a mighty host. With regards to Isaiah's description of this host, the reference to ancient weaponry are purely symbolic. In his day, a horse-mounted soldier was a far more formidable foe than a foot soldier. The remnant of Jacob will be formidable. Additionally, there is a reference to wheels and whirlwinds, but chariots are not mentioned. There is a very interesting passage of scripture from Ezekiel, that uses both these terms in conjunction with the return of the remnant of Jacob. And I looked and I beheld a whirlwind came from the north, a great cloud, a fire enfolding in upon itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof was the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. For as the likeness of their faces, they fore had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they fore had the face of an ox on the left side, and they fore also had the face of an eagle. Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures, with his four faces, the appearance of the wheels and their work was likened to the color of beryl. Beryl is amber. And they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them four, and the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. And when the creatures went, the wheels went by them, and when the creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. These passages from Ezekiel are extremely curious. It starts with Ezekiel seeing a whirlwind come from the north. 
This is the direction associated with the return of the remnant of Jacob. The hosts arriving from the north are then described as living creatures in the form of men. But each have four faces, the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. Hopefully you will recall that these faces match the images on the four standards of the camps of Israel. Therefore, the host arriving from the north is identified with the four camps of Israel. It's the remnant of Jacob. Ezekiel sees the host of Israel arrive in an object that he describes as being amber in color and that emerges from a self-enfolding fire. Each of these four men, representing the host of Israel, are then seen rising and descending between heaven and earth on four amber-colored wheels. These wheels are described as going terribly high, moving as fast as lightning and being in form like a wheel within a wheel. The perimeter of these wheels were then described as being full of eyes. To me, it seems like Ezekiel is attempting to des describe the technology that the remnant of Jacob uses to arrive to earth. Isaiah continues, The remnant shall return, yea, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the Almighty God. Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor the sun smite them, for he hath mercy on them that leadeth them. Even by the springs of water shall he guide them. The Lord will provide for this remnant as he did for Israel in the days of Moses. And I will make all my mountains away, and my highways shall be exalted. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? Here again Isaiah describes the arrival of the remnant of Jacob. The Lord is glorified in their arrival. They arrive on a highway that is cast up out of the deep. We are told that this will be a new thing that most will have never even considered. In short, the arrival of this host will be breathtakingly awesome. Jeremiah said that the return of this host would rival the exodus of Egypt in wonder and glory. It will defy reasoning. Inasmuch that Isaiah said, Kings shall shut their mouths, for that which they had not been told shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. I give waters in the wilderness, and rivers in the desert, to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people have I formed for myself. They shall shew forth my praise. Thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend, thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant. I have chosen thee, and cast not thee away. Fear thou not, for I am with thee, be not dismayed, for I am thy God, and will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing, and they that strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them, and thou shalt not find them. Even them that contended with thee, they that war against thee shall be as nothing and as a thing of naught. No force on earth will be prepared to contend with this mighty host, just as there was no host in the land of Canaan that could resist the God of Jacob. There will be no foe on earth that can long stand before the remnant of Jacob in the last days. The remnant of Jacob will be the Lord's army. 
With their united faith placed in Jehovah, this host will be both great and terrible. As if to link this mighty host with the exiles from captivity that were planted among the heavens, Isaiah then states the following regarding the origin from whence this remnant comes. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven. Yea, the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Isaiah answers the question from whence this host comes. They come from the end of heaven. Therefore, the highway that is cast up out of the great deep refers to their return from the outmost parts of heaven. The return of such a host is explicitly stated in the Lord's covenants with Israel. The arrival of this host is part of the great and marvelous work that was shown to both Isaiah and Nephi, a work that shall be everlasting, either on the one hand or on the other, either to the convincing them of peace or the deliverance of them to the hardness of their hearts and the blindness of their minds, unto being brought down into captivity and also into destruction, both temporally and and spiritually. Isaiah continues describing the weapons of the Lord's indignation, the remnant of Jacob. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones, for mine anger is not upon them that rejoice in my highness. The noise of the multitude in the mountains is like that of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of the nations gathered together, the Lord of hosts mustereth the hosts of the battle. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall the hands be faint. Every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be amazed one at another, and their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Wherefore shall destruction come upon the world? Thou shalt not know from whence it riseth. It comes from the ends of heaven. And mischief shall fall upon thee, thou shalt not be able to put it off, and destruction shall come upon thee suddenly, which thou shalt not know. It should be noted that there is a difference between the great and dreadful day of the Lord and the second coming of Jesus Christ. The former precedes the latter. The return of the remnant of Jacob represents the ushering in of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Their coming precedes the Lord's coming, just as the destruction in ancient America preceded the visitation of the Lord. Isaiah is not only describing the power of the remnant of Jacob, but the utter shock and amazement of the people upon beholding the miraculous appearance of such a group. The remnant of Jacob truly does come as a thief in the night. It is in this great and terrible day that the wisdom of their wise men shall perish. This mighty host is the forerunner to the coming of Israel's king. For this purpose, the Lord made the remnant so mighty. Isaiah's vision continues, speaking now directly to the remnant. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument, having teeth. Thou shalt thresh the mountains, and beat them small, and shalt make the hills as chaff. Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them. And thou shalt rejoice in the Lord, and shalt glory in the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, their root shall be rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. 
Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he hath stretched forth his hand against them, and hath smitten them, and the hills did tremble. The hills trembling is an association with the lost ten tribes in America. And their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. This remnant represents a new sharp threshing instrument. They consume any remaining wickedness left in the land and liberate the captives. Isaiah notes that the hills did tremble. There is another reference to the hills trembling at this host's presence. And the boundaries of the everlasting hills shall tremble at their presence. And there shall they fall down and be crowned with glory, even in Zion, by the hands of the children of Ephraim. The reference to the hills trembling is an association to the everlasting hills, and therefore the children of Ephraim in Zion, a.k.a. America. This reference is also linked to the Assyrians' expulsion from America we previously reviewed. I will bring the Assyrian in my land, and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. With America liberated and occupied by such a powerful force, the following scripture will be fulfilled. And it shall be said among the wicked, Let us not go to battle against Zion, for the inhabitants of Zion are terrible, wherefore we cannot stand. Zion is America. The remnant of Jacob will come to America. They will save us from the jaws of complete destruction. The wicked in America will have endured a tremendous ordeal. This was only the case because of their actions and forgetfulness of the Lord. Up to this point, we have not gone into too much detail about what these trials will look like in America. Isaiah will discuss those in the next chapter. I conclude my analysis of this portion of Isaiah's words with the following passage. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the waster to destroy. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall revile against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. These prophecies of Isaiah are incredible. The remnant of Jacob will be a great and terrible force with which to be reckoned. The wicked will melt away before them as the frost before the sun. No weapon formed against them shall prosper. Nothing will be capable of standing in their way. They come from the end of heaven and fulfill the mission the Lord had entrusted with them. As the Lord prepared John the Baptist to make straight the way before his coming, so he has prepared a great and terrible forerunner for his second coming in great power and glory. The wicked are burned as stubble. Their faces are pained with awe, fear, and surprise. The imagery of this host is terrifying, and yet it is a righteous army. They love and serve the Lord and are performing His will with an eye single to His glory. They conquer not for glory nor for riches, but for the Mighty One of Jacob. Chapter 12 The Sanctification of Zion in previous chapters, we have seen how the Lord appointed a mission for the remnant of Jacob, or the Lost Ten Tribes, long ago, before they were ever lost. We have seen how part of their mission would be to lay the foundations of the new earth and to fulfill their role as the forerunner for Christ's second coming by sanctifying the world with fire. In addition, they will lay the foundations for the new Jerusalem, the city where God will dwell. The widespread destruction that will happen prior to the second coming is well documented and understood to one degree or another by most in the Christian community. What is less understood is how these events will impact the Christian community itself. 
Isaiah covers this topic very well, but some background will help clarify his message. We have learned that the remnant of Jacob will first come to Zion to subdue Israel's enemies and then to receive a blessing at the hand of the children of Ephraim and to bestow upon them their rich treasures. With this in mind, consider the following additional instruction regarding the great and terrible day of the Lord and its impact upon his church. Behold, vengeance cometh speedily upon the inhabitants of the earth, a day of wrath, a day of burning, a day of desolation, of weeping, of mourning, and of lamentation. As a whirlwind, it shall come upon the face of the earth, and upon my house shall it begin, and from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord, first among those among you who have professed to know my name, and have not known me, and have blasphemed against me in the midst of my house, saith the Lord. In the verses above, the Lord clearly states that the epicenter for the great and terrible day will be among the hypocrites of his church. We have seen that the Antichrist, the Assyrian, will make war with the saints of God. From the passage above, we learn that this is meant to be a purification and refining process for the saints. This should give a serious pause for self-reflection. From the saints, the persecution then spreads across America. This is the purpose for which the Lord brought the Assyrian to America to begin with. There is a tendency among many members of the church to believe, as the house of Israel did, that they are special beyond all others, an elevated and chosen people by birthright. However, it is impossible to separate the favor of the Lord from personal righteousness. Among none of Israel was the Lord's wrath kindled more than among the hypocrites, those that professed their faith with their lips, but were as whited sepulchres, appearing clean without, but being full of rottenness, decay, and death within. The Lord gave Israel a stinging rebuke along these same lines. But I tell you of a truth, Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Zarephetta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisu the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. This is a concept worthy of study. The Lord taught repeatedly regarding this subject. He gave his disciples the parable of the ten virgins, which refers to the Latter-day Church. In modern-day Revelation, the Lord expanded upon this parable, associating it directly with our day. And at that day, when I shall come in my glory, shall the parable be fulfilled which I spoke concerning the ten virgins. For they that are wise, and have received the truth, and have taken the Holy Spirit for their guide, and have not been deceived, verily I say unto you, they shall not be hewn down and cast into the fire, but shall abide the day. By stating that the wise members of the church, or wise virgins, would not be burned, the Lord infers that the unwise members or unwise virgins, will be. The ratio of the parable is 50%, an extremely sobering number. When I think of this subject, I cannot help but correlating it to the events previously discussed regarding the stout horn and the abominable church waging war against the saints of God. Satan is not some half-witted hack. He was in authority in the presence of God. He is intelligent, powerful, and extremely persuasive. He convinced one-third of all the hosts of heaven to willingly leave the presence of the Father. This is a staggering accomplishment. I will attempt to provide some perspective as to what this actually means. For illustration purposes, let's assume that only the inhabitants of this world were included in the premortal council, which I believe is an incorrect assumption. 
According to the Population Reference Bureau, it is estimated that the Earth has been home to some 108 billion people since its creation. We also know that the Earth will continue to bear the fruit of the womb for at least another thousand years after the Second Coming. If we assume that between now and the end of that thousand-year period, another 100 billion souls come to Earth, 7 billion living today assumes another 10 billion per 100-year period, we might estimate 208 billion souls coming to Earth in total. If we assume that these 208 billion represent the two-thirds of Heavenly Father's children that did not follow Satan initially, we can calculate that there were approximately 312 billion spirits from our earth that were involved in the premortal councils in heaven. Therefore, by this calculation, Satan convinced approximately 104 billion souls to follow him. Using this number today, Latter-day Saints are outnumbered by approximately 7,000 to 1 by Satan's pinched, calculating little minions. With odds like this, it is inconceivable to think that any mortal could expect to withstand the onslaught of Satan on his own. Samuel the Lamanite further confirmed this point when he prophesied to the members of the Church of Jesus Christ in his day. He prophesied that the day would come when they would realize their awful state, and when they did, they would howl these words with weeping and wailing. Behold, we are surrounded by demons, yea, we are encircled about by the angels of him who hath sought to destroy our souls. Samuel foresaw that in his day the members of the church would with anguished cries finally see the error of their ways. Satan and his unseen hosts are joined in their fight against the Lamb of God by the brick-and-mortar infrastructure of the great and abominable institutions of the world. This war is real, it is intense, and the stakes could not be higher. The counsel of Paul was meant for us in these dire circumstances. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand the evil day. It is because of Satan's war against the Lamb of God and his saints that so many who were once counted as faithful members of the church will fall prey to Satan and his minions. He will lull many away. He will seduce them, change them, slowly, patiently, almost imperceivably, until they are bound in his heavy chains. This was seen and testified of Enoch when he saw the condition of the earth in the latter days. And he beheld Satan, and he had a great chain in his hand, and it veiled the whole face of the earth with darkness. And he looked up and laughed, and his angels rejoiced. Satan's war against the Lamb of God, and those who would be his disciples, is not some dumb brute force attack. It has been highly calculated and crafted. He has been laying the foundations for this assault for many years, and the worst lies yet ahead of us. To date, his strategies have been primarily spiritual in nature. These strategies vary for men and women. Sins of a sexual nature are second only to murder in their seriousness. Given the world's open mockery of the law of chastity, this certainly goes to the heart of his strategy. To better understand Satan's stratagem, we must first clearly understand the Lord's standard regarding the same. These teachings can be found in the plain and simple language of the For the Strength of the Youth pamphlet. The following are extracts from that pamphlet. In God's sight, sexual sins are extremely serious. They defile the sacred powers God has given to us to create life. The prophet Alma taught that sexual sins are more serious than any other sins except murder or the denying of the Holy Ghost. 
treat others with respect, not as objects used to satisfy lust and selfish desires. Before marriage, do not participate in passionate kissing, lie on top of another person, or touch the private, sacred parts of another person's body, with or without clothing. Do not do anything else that arouses sexual feelings. I think of pornography. Do not arouse those emotions in your own body. This is a reference to masturbation. Your body is sacred. Respect it and do not defile it in any way. Through your dress and your appearance, you can show that you know precisely how important your body is. You can show that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ and that you love him. Prophets of God have continually counseled his children to dress modestly. When you are well-groomed and modestly dressed, you invite the companionship of the Spirit, and you can be a good influence on others. Your dress and grooming influence the way you and others act. Never lower your standards of dress. Do not use a special occasion as an excuse to be immodest. Think vacation bikinis or immodest prom dresses or party dresses, etc. When you dress immodestly, you send a message that is contrary to your identity as a son or daughter of God. You also send a message that you are using your body to get attention and approval. Immodest clothing is any clothing that is tight, sheer, or revealing in any other manner. Young women should avoid short shorts and short skirts, as well as shirts that do not cover the stomach, and clothing that does not cover the shoulders or is low cut in the front or back. Young men should also maintain modesty in appearance. Young men and young women should be neat and clean and avoid being extreme or inappropriately casual in their clothing, hairstyle, and behavior. They should choose appropriate, modest apparel when participating in sports. The fashions of the world will change, but the Lord's standard will not change. With the Lord's standard of modesty and morality clearly laid out in the Strength of the Youth pamphlet, Satan's scheme stands out in sharp contrast. We will first discuss a primary strategy Satan has employed against the women of the church, the daughters of Zion. Then we will discuss a primary strategy he uses against the men, or sons of Zion. First, the daughters of Zion. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The Lord has placed within women the noble desire to be loved, cherished, and honored. Satan knows this all too well and has incorporated these righteous desires into his strategy. An insightful introduction into Satan's stratagem against women can be found in Ether. Consider this account. Now the daughter of Jared, being exceedingly expert, and seeing the sorrows of her father, thought to devise a plan whereby she could redeem the kingdom unto her father. Now the daughter of Jared was exceedingly fair, and it came to pass that she did talk with her father, and said unto him, Whereby hath my father so much sorrow? Hath he not read the record which our fathers brought across the great deep? Behold, is there not an account concerning them of old, that they did by their secret plans obtain kingdoms and great glory? And now, therefore, let my father send for Achish, the son of Kimnor. And behold, I am fair, and I will dance before him, and it will please him, that he will desire me to wife. Wherefore, if he shall desire thee, that you shall give me unto him to wife, then shall ye say, I will give her, if ye will bring unto me the head of my father, the king. In this brief account, we get a glimpse into Satan's playbook. Satan took a beautiful daughter of God and convinced her to use her body as an object, a catalyst for instilling feelings of lust and desire within another person. In this way, this woman's body became a means to an end, a tool in the hands of the adversary. It is ludicrous to imagine a true disciple of Jesus Christ ever intentionally using her body in such a manner. This story is in 
stark contrast to the story of Queen Esther, who rather than relying upon the power and influence of sexual desire, fasted and prayed and put her trust in the Lord for the deliverance of her people. Thus we see the twisted genius of Satan's cunning plan, and how patiently he has worked behind the curtain to bring it to pass. Just as the deceitful tailor in the story of the emperor's new clothes, Satan has slowly molded and shaped the fashions of the day to serve his purposes, the objectification and sensualization of the female body. Thus, where once the thought of attending school in your underwear could only be contemplated in cold, sweat-inducing nightmares, it's now the fashion of the day to reveal as much as possible. Isaiah saw this play out to its awful end in a prophetic vision upon our lands. A cursory reading of which might lead one to believe that Isaiah is talking about vanity or pride. A more in-depth study, however involving the corresponding footnotes of both the Old Testament and Book of Mormon accounts as guidelines, paints a much more severe picture, along the same vein as the daughter of Jared. The footnotes relating to the first verses of Isaiah's account reference the following topical guide subjects, in modesty, vanity, walking in darkness, and carnal-mindedness, and associates these characteristics directly with the daughters of Zion. Let's consider Isaiah's words. Moreover, the Lord saith, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, sensuality and carnal mindedness, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet, deliberately creating a look at me scenario. Therefore, the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion and the Lord will discover their secret parts, cause them to be ashamed. In that day, the great and terrible day of the Lord, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments, the chains and the bracelets, and the ornaments of the legs, and the headbands, and the earrings, and the rings, and the nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel, and the crisping pins, and the fine linen, transparent clothing, and the hoods and the veils, and it shall come to pass, instead of a sweet smell there shall be stink, and instead of a girdle a rent, and instead of well-set hair baldness, and instead of a robe a girding of sackcloth, burning instead of beauty, reminiscent of the burning of the five unwise virgins. Thy men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty in the war referring to the war the Antichrist wages against the saints of God. And her gate shall lament and mourn, and she shall be desolate and shall sit down upon the ground. And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Isaiah's condemning vision has nothing to do with the beauty of these daughters of Zion. Queen Esther and Mary, the mother of Jesus, were both described as being exceedingly fair. The women Isaiah condemned were condemned because they had given in to Satan's sensuality. I cannot say for certain that the term daughters of Zion refers to the church specifically or the inhabitants of the United States generally. Regardless, Members of the church are included in either category and must therefore pay particular attention to this prophetic warning. Regarding this subject, the teachings of Brigham Young were as follows. He, President Brigham Young, conversed freely on the situation of the saints in the mountains and said that he dreaded the time when the saints would become popular with the world, for he had seen in sorrow in a dream or in dreams, this people clothed in the fashions of Babylon, and drinking in the spirit of Babylon, until one could hardly tell a saint from a black leg, and he felt like shouting, To your tents, O Israel! Much of women's clothing today is designed to showcase their secret parts. The tighter the better, nothing is left to the imagination. Clothing has become tighter than the skin itself. The cuts and fits emphasize the sensual. 
the curves and nuances of a woman's body are made to shout like flashy neon signs, augmented and pronounced. Shorter shorts, skirts, and shirts have become the norm. Unfortunately, too many Latter-day Saints have taken up the styles of Babylon, putting their bodies on display as if they were visitor centers rather than temples. Like the daughter of Jared, many today use their bodies to gain acceptance, validation, attention, and influence. These women were not described as harlots. They were described as daughters of Zion, and were therefore raised to one degree or another within the light of the Lord. Nevertheless, notwithstanding they believed in Jesus Christ, they supposed that whatsoever they did was right. They, like Lot's wife, had come to learn to embrace the unholy aspects of a decaying society. The consequences for these carnally-minded daughters of Zion are intense, for the Lord delights in the chastity of his daughters. However, according to his prophecy, these women are not destroyed like so many others. They are brought down low, humbled to the point of sackcloth and ashes, their beauty having been replaced by burning. However, they do not die in their sins. They live to repent. These accounts provide a terrifying insight into the genius of Satan, the great deceiver. The Lord has placed within women the noble desire to be loved, cherished, and honored. Satan attempts to manipulate these righteous desires. Satan is the greatest counterfeiter the world has ever known. He takes the God-given desires of women and turns them upside down. Rather than being content in the love and honor of a virtuous man, seek for and relish in the validating, lustful gazes of passing strangers. Their bodies bring them attention, status, and acceptance, but at a terrible price. They trade their birthright for a mess of porridge. An honest and objective review of one's wardrobe in the light of the Lord's standard will help the sincere-hearted discern between the apparel of the five unwise virgins and those of the wise ones. I say unto you, all that are desirous to follow the voice of the Good Shepherd, Come ye out from the wicked, and be ye separate, and touch not their unclean things. Now, the sons of Zion. The Lord has engineered into the human body a remarkable attraction to the opposite sex. This attraction is natural. It is meant to serve as the foundation of society and the gospel. It is meant to ennoble and to create. However, Satan is all too familiar with how to use this ingrained programming against the sons of Zion. Wilfred Woodruff warned the sons of Zion of the trials coming upon them in the latter days. Consider his warning. I would to God that the eyes of the latter-day saints were open far more than they are to those things that rest upon them. By and by, great Babylon will fall, and there will be wailing and mourning and sore affliction in their midst. The sons of Zion have got to stand, 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 and to be preserved in the midst of the judgments that will shortly overtake the world. If immodesty and sensuality are the problems among the daughters of Zion, lust is the black plague amongst its sons. Isaiah's account above includes a telling ratio of one man to seven women. The account states that the reason is related to the number of men that are killed in the war. If the Lord will preserve the righteous sons of Zion as they stand in holy places, what can we infer by the great numbers of Zion's sons that perish? In the same chapter that Isaiah talked about the daughters of Zion, he says the following of the world. The show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sins as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded unto themselves evil. Sodom was guilty of many sins, but those of sexual impurity were at the forefront. Unfortunately, it appears that such sins are spreading like a decimating scourge through the ranks of the sons of Zion. 
The statistics of pornography usage among the men of our day are astounding. In a study involving six college researchers, four of whom were from BYU, it was found that nine out of ten young men actively use pornography. From the many talks regarding the usage of pornography in general conferences of the church, it is evident that pornography usage among church members has swelled to epidemic levels. The scope and magnitude of this problem is a direct result of Satan's strategy against the sons of Zion. In fact, evidence suggests that rather than being less of a problem amongst LDS men, it is likely far greater. The Journal of Economic Perspectives published an article on the dissemination of pornography on the Internet. The following information was taken from that study. The team worked with some of the top 10 pornography suppliers on the Internet, each with hundreds of affiliated distribution sites. These companies provided several years' worth of subscription data, including the zip codes of all of their paid subscribers. The team then analyzed this data by state in the following ways. Subscriptions per capita, subscriptions per internet connection, and subscription per broadband connection. In every single instance, Utah had the highest pornographic subscription rates by far. According to this study, Utah's subscription rates were 30% higher than the second worst state, Mississippi, and 70% higher than the third highest state, Oklahoma. The results of this study are shocking, especially given that Utah has the highest concentration of Latter-day Saints in the world. Pornographic addiction enslaves men. It transforms them into the equivalent of spiritual zombies, living but spiritually dead. Such are hollow and incapable. The Lord warned these men, Behold, it is written by them of old time that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already in his heart. Behold, I give unto you a commandment, that ye suffer none of these things to enter into your heart, for it is better that ye should deny yourselves of these things, wherein ye take up your cross, than that ye should be cast into hell. A staggering number of the sons of men are bound by Satan's heavy chains, whose daily lives have become a living hell. They are trapped feeling helpless to break the cycle of addiction. Once Satan has enslaved a son of Zion, he and his demonic angels shame and embarrass him into passive silence, thus keeping him from ever reaching out to the God-given resources provided for just such a purpose. Such men have opened Pandora's box, and they lack the strength, will, or capacity to close it on their own. They must break their silence and solicit help or die in their sins. For those Precious few who do cry out for help from the depths of their anguished despair, we should not shrink away in unrighteous judgment and disgust. To such we should rally as the father to the prodigal son, in love and brotherly kindness, with patience and forgiveness, for far more will suffer in hellish silence and die in their sins than will ever find the strength to reach out for aid. The destruction amongst the Nephites before the Savior's coming was a foreshadowing of the things to come in our day. The more righteous part of their people were spared, but it was not without pain. Many of their loved ones fell. Mormon's lament will be heard once again to ring out in the homes and families of the Latter-day Saints. O ye fair ones, how could ye have departed from the ways of the Lord? O ye fair ones, how could ye have rejected that Jesus who stood with open arms to receive you? Behold, if ye had not done this, ye would not have fallen. But behold, ye are fallen, and I mourn your loss. O ye fair sons and daughters, ye fathers and mothers, ye husbands and wives, ye fair ones, how is it that ye could have fallen? This topic has been a dreadful one, but as the saying goes, 
the night is always darkest before the dawn. As we have discussed previously, in all things the Lord works to bring about the salvation of his children. Such will be the case amongst the children of Ephraim. The prophet Jeremiah saw that Ephraim would be chastised for their backsliding, but once corrected, they would remain forever true. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus, Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastened, as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. Turn thou me, and I shall turn, for thou art the Lord my God. Surely after that I was turned, I repented, and after I was instructed, I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the approach of my youth. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. Whereas there are those among Ephraim that have strayed, after the church's purification, Ephraim will be stalwart in the Lord's service forevermore. There can be no doubt that the purging events described above happen for a glorious purpose. Isaiah makes this unmistakably clear. And it shall come to pass that they that are left in Zion shall be called holy, every one that is written amongst the living, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the sons and daughters of Zion by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. In light of this great destruction, Nephi sought to reassure the righteous living amongst the wicked during this horrific time of trial. Despite the widespread destruction, Nephi expressed optimism for the righteous. He saw that the righteous would be saved and need not fear the days to come. After transcribing Isaiah's words of destruction, Nephi wrote the following, For the time soon cometh that the fullness of the wrath of God shall be poured out upon all the children of men. For he will not suffer that the wicked shall destroy the righteous. Wherefore he will preserve the righteous by his power, even if it so be that the fullness of his wrath must come, and the righteous be preserved even unto the destruction of their enemies by fire. Wherefore the righteous need not fear, for thus saith the prophet, They shall be saved, even if it so be as by fire. While the righteous will be spared, the fact that they will not be exempt from feeling pain and sorrows of that day did not escape Isaiah. He saw their pain and suffering at the loss of their loved ones, their friends, and their neighbors, and their sons and daughters. He felt their heartache. He knew that there would be many that would look heavenward and cry as did the Lord from the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But we must not despair. We must endure the refiner's fire with patience. Through this affliction, the Lord is bringing about greater things. Consider the following verses from Isaiah. But behold, Zion hath said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. But he will show that he hath not. For can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion upon the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget. Yet I will not forget thee, O house of Israel. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. For the mountain shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. While the refining process will not be relished, it does serve a purpose. No unclean thing can dwell in the presence of the Lord, and the Lord will dwell in America. 
Therefore, after the stout horn has waged his war against the saints, the saints will be saved by the return of their brothers, long since lost into obscurity, the remnant of Jacob. These will save the saints and act as the weapon of the Lord's indignation to destroy the wicked out of the whole land. Once America is sanctified, it will stand as the ensign to the nations it was meant to be. America, or Zion, will then be ready for the construction of the new Jerusalem. Zion will then become the launching pad for the last great harvest. While up to this point in time the house of Joseph will have carried the bulk of the workload, now the mighty remnant of Jacob will take up the mantle. The remnant will go out in force, 144,000 strong, 12,000 from each tribe, into the vineyard one last time. Those that will hearken to the call will be gathered to the refuge of Zion, while the rest of the world will languish in civil war and sin. Orson Pratt, an early apostle, taught regarding this subject. Before the Lord shall come, there is to be a great work amongst the nations. The ten tribes will have to come forth and come to this land and be crowned in glory in the midst of Zion by the hands of the servants of God, even the children of Ephraim. And twelve thousand high priests will be selected from each of the ten tribes, as well as from the scattered tribes, and sealed in their foreheads, and will be ordained and receive power to gather out of all nations, kindreds, and tongues, and people, as many as will come unto the general assembly of the church of the firstborn. While the house of Joseph will have spent the last two hundred years fishing for the scattered remnants of Israel from amongst all nations, the returning lost tribes will represent the last wave that will be sent out in the final hours to bring the remaining stragglers into the safe holds of Zion. Jeremiah saw this day and prophesied regarding it as follows, Therefore, behold the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, The Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north, and from all the lands whither he hath driven them. And I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish for them. And after... I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain, and from every hill, and out of all the holes of the rocks. And first I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double, because they have defiled my land. They have filled mine inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable and abominable things. O Lord, my strength and my fortress, and my refuge in the day of affliction. The Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth, and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and the things wherein there is no profit. The order of the events from Jeremiah are insightful. The hunters come after the fishers, and after the wicked have received a double portion of the Lord's wrath. We have learned that while the stout horn will rage against the saints, the remnant of Jacob will deliver them, acting as the weapons of his indignation, to prepare the way before his coming and to destroy the wicked. This highlights another distinction between fishers and hunters. The latter are associated with the use of weaponry, while the former not so much. Isaiah saw that this last great gathering would happen and attested to it as follows. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. 
These scattered remnants will flow unto the safety of Zion. Some will come in time to help the remnant of Jacob and the saints of God to build the holy city. Regardless of the timing of their coming, the rest that they will enjoy in Zion will be glorious. The Doctrine and Covenants further elaborates upon this subject. And it shall be called the New Jerusalem, a land of peace, a city of refuge, a place of safety for the saints of the Most High God. And the glory of the Lord shall be there, and the terror of the Lord shall be there, insomuch that the wicked will not come unto it. And it shall be called Zion. And it shall come to pass among the wicked, that every man that will not take up his sword against his neighbor must needs flee unto Zion for safety. And there shall be gathered unto it out of every nation under heaven by Jeremiah's hunters. And it shall be the only people that shall not be at war one with another. And it shall be said amongst the wicked, Let us not go up to battle against Zion, for the inhabitants of Zion are terrible, wherefore we cannot stand. And it shall come to pass that the righteous shall be gathered out from among all nations, and shall come to Zion, singing with songs of everlasting joy. In conclusion, let's review the events surrounding the purification process of America. From prior chapters, we have learned that in the last days, Satan and his supporters will wage a war against the saints. While this has been a spiritual war, with the introduction of the Antichrist, it will develop into much more in the very near future. Under this persecution, the saints will suffer. But they will be purified and prepared to meet their Lord. The Lord will preserve his people by fulfilling his covenants to restore Israel in the latter days. The remnant of Jacob will come to the children of Ephraim and preserve the saints and take the fight to the wicked. As a result, the Antichrist will retreat from America to regroup elsewhere. After the Lord has sanctified America, there will be a significant missionary effort wherein 144 hunters will go forth into all the nations of the earth and gather those that will to Zion, which will become the only remaining place of refuge in the world. These will assist the remnant of Jacob in constructing the new Jerusalem upon the American continent. Zion will be a place of peace and love and will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Chapter 13, Powerful Latter-day Leadership Apart from discussing the sanctification process that both America and the world will endure in those days, Isaiah discusses several leaders that will play critical roles, all of which, I believe, will be affiliated with the remnant of Jacob. These leaders will have roles in the American and Jewish chapters of this great and dreadful day of the Lord. Each of these leaders' unique mission was foreseen thousands of years before the events would actually occur. As with most prophecy, the main points are highlighted, but the details are fuzzy. It was for this reason that Nephi provided the following clarification. Now I, Nephi, do speak somewhat concerning the words which I have written, which have been spoken by the mouth of Isaiah. For behold, Isaiah spake many things which were hard for many of my people to understand. But behold, I proceed with mine own prophecy, according to my plainness, in the which I know that no man can err. Nevertheless, in the days that the prophecies of Isaiah shall be fulfilled, men shall know of a surety at the times when they shall come to pass. Therefore, when these men fulfill their foreordained missions, it will be crystal clear the world will know with a surety that it's them. Let's consider these men and their latter-day missions. Isaiah prophesied the following, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow up out of his roots. This verse, and indeed the entire chapter from which it comes, discusses several different leaders that will descend from the lineage of Jesse, the father of King David. They are as follows. A stem, a rod, a branch, and a root. The first thing to note here is that the stem of Jesse 
is the source from which all others spring. The rod came forth from the stem, and the roots and branch are associated with the rod. To my mind, this verse creates the imagery of the cutting of a plant. This cutting is taken from the stem of the original plant and is then transplanted where roots and an additional branch then can grow. It is my opinion that the cutting and transplanting represents the removal of this plant from the body of the house of Israel. I believe the cutting represents the lost ten tribes. I will explain in more detail why I believe this is the case as we continue. As each of these last three leaders stem from the first, let's begin our study with a focus on the stem of Jesse. The stem. As all others received their strength from the stem, one might guess that the stem represents the God of Israel. In a question and answer section of the Doctrine and Covenants, we are provided with a clear interpretation of the meaning stem, as well as additional information regarding the roles of some of these other men. Consider the following. Question. Who is the stem of Jesse spoken in the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth verses of the eleventh chapter of Isaiah? Answer. Verily thus saith the Lord, it is Christ. The identity of the stem of Jesse is therefore as one might have supposed, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ once provided a description of his role as the stem as follows. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Without Christ we can do nothing. Isaiah noted that these other leaders abided in Christ in the same manner as the branches abide in the vine. They draw their power and their authority from Christ. As the roles described by Isaiah will take place in the latter days, let us briefly discuss the latter-day mission of Jesus Christ. We know from John the Revelator that Jesus Christ himself will liberate Jerusalem in its final hour. He will lead a mighty host, and together they will lay waste to those distressing Judah. Consider the following from the book of Revelations. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vestiture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. This description of the Lord is totally awe-inspiring. At his second coming, the stem of Jesse cannot be mistaken for a gentle lamb, but will be known as the Millennial Messiah, the King of King and Lord of Lords. I noted earlier that I thought that all four of these leaders were affiliated with the remnant of Jacob. I have noted earlier how Isaiah described the remnant of Jacob as the weapon of the Lord's indignation. Therefore, it is interesting to note that John the Revelator describes Christ as being accompanied by the armies which were in heaven. This is a curious reference, as it is another way of saying the armies that used to be in heaven. Heaven is also the location from whence Isaiah saw the remnant of Jacob coming from. I do not believe this description is coincidental. The above verse also references Christ as having a rod of iron. This rod represents Christ's power and authority, and is spoken of in conjunction with the destruction of the wicked and the ultimate subjection of all nations to Jesus Christ. Thus, the symbol of the rod is a symbol of power. A rod of iron would therefore symbolize absolute power. The imagery of Christ's rod reminds us of the reference to the rod of Jesse in the verse from Isaiah above, which we will now review. The rod. 
In the same Doctrine and Covenants section, where we learned the identity of the stem of Jesse, we also learn more about the identity of the rod. The Lord provides the following answer when asked regarding the rod. Behold, thus saith the Lord, It is a servant in the hands of Christ, who is partly a descendant of Jesse, as well as of Ephraim, or of the house of Joseph, on whom there is laid much power. This description does not give enough information to definitively identify this individual with any degree of certainty. Certainly not with the degree of surety that Nephi prophesied would happen in the latter days. Therefore, I would suggest that this person is yet to be identified. There are some who have claimed that the rod is Joseph Smith. It is my personal opinion that this is not the case. Joseph Smith was certainly given great authority. The keys of prior dispensations were given into Joseph Smith's hands actually from the dispensation heads. But authority is not the same thing as power. Many men have received the priesthood, but far fewer have received power in the priesthood. The Jews largely rejected the Messiah when he came, not because he did not have authority. His works plainly demonstrated that he did. They rejected him because he did not come in the strength and power the prophets have testified that would accompany the latter-day Messiah. I am certainly not stating that Christ did not have inexhaustible priesthood power during his ministry. He surely did. However, the exercising of that great power was not the hallmark of his ministry. Redemption and mercy were. In a similar manner, power was not the hallmark of Joseph Smith's life. While he was physically strong, he was not perceived by the world as being powerful. His ministry was one of restoration, of unseen priesthood power. It is my opinion that the hallmark of the rod of Jesse will be a man that displays an indisputable outward display of great power. The Branch Unfortunately, there were no inquiries regarding the person with the title The Branch in the question and answer section of the Doctrine and Covenants. However, the Old Testament prophet Zechariah provides a wonderful description of who this mighty leader is. Consider the following verses. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is interesting to note that the chapter heading from whence this scripture is taken identifies the branch as Jesus Christ. While the branch certainly has many messianic qualities, I would suggest a potential alternate interpretation for various reasons. First, a primary mission of the branch will be to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. This is one of the signs that will precede the Lord's second coming. Therefore, it needs to happen before he comes. It would be difficult for the Lord to literally fulfill this prophecy without it constituting his own second coming. Secondly, does it make sense that Jesus Christ would be a branch of himself? To me, this is similar to thinking that Christ was praying to himself. To me, there are other interpretations that make more sense than this. But if the branch is not Jesus Christ, then who is he? The above verses themselves provide some assistance in identifying the branch. The first identifier we received from Zechariah regarding the branch is not a mission that he will perform, but rather a reference to his origins. Zechariah specifically states, He shall grow up out of his place. The obvious reason behind highlighting a person's origins is to assist in identifying the individual, such as when Christ's birth in Bethlehem was foretold. How, then, does a reference as general as his place assist in identifying this individual? It serves as an identifier if the place he comes from is altogether unique and different from the place that all of us come from. There are few places that could meet such a qualification. However, the end of heaven would certainly qualify. 
In such a case, his place is quite meaningful. The branch of Jesse, along with the rod of Jesse and the root of Jesse, it seems to me, will come to earth with the remnant of Jacob. As we have noted, one of the prominent missions of the branch will be to rebuild the temple of the Lord. This will be a truly amazing feat, as the Dome of the Rock, a holy Muslim site, currently sits where this temple will one day stand. The presence of a temple in Jerusalem prior to the second coming is a well-documented sign of the times, but how it will happen has been a mystery given the presence of the Muslim shrine. However, one who comes with the power and authority of the remnant of Jacob could certainly make it happen. As noted previously, the remnant of Jacob is associated with the building of the New Jerusalem. In the book of Ether, when Ether wrote concerning the building of the New Jerusalem in America, he also spoke concerning the holy sanctuary of the Lord. We know that sanctuaries of the Lord are the equivalents of temples. Moroni provides a very curious description of how the New Jerusalem and the holy sanctuary of the Lord will be established in the latter days. Consider the following verse from Ether chapter 13, verse 3. And that it, meaning America, was the place of the new Jerusalem, which should come down out of heaven, and the holy sanctuary of the Lord. In this verse, Ether describes both the new Jerusalem, which is associated with the remnant of Jacob, and the holy sanctuary of the Lord descending from heaven. To me, one possible interpretation of this scripture is that both of these structures are associated with the ends of heaven, just as is the remnant of Jacob. Another unique qualifier to the branch's mission is that he will rule in Jerusalem. Joseph Smith provides some additional information on just such a leader who will rule in latter-day Jerusalem. Although David was a king, he never did obtain the spirit and power of Elijah and the fullness of the priesthood. And the priesthood that he received and the throne and kingdom of David is to be taken from him and given to another by the name of David in the last days, raised up out of his lineage. The first David to which Joseph referred to was King David, as in David and Goliath. David was the most powerful king Israel had ever known. In fact, one of Christ's titles is the Son of David. Sadly, David committed a horrific sin in the shedding of innocent blood and lost much. This latter-day David will assume the role that King David once held. It should be remembered that it was King David who first sought to build a temple to the Lord. However, being a man of blood, he was not allowed to do so. It appears that this modern David will be able to do that which his forefather was not. Further evidence that David and the branch are one and the same comes from Ezekiel. Ezekiel lived over 400 years after King David. So it stands to reason that he would not be prophesying about the past king of Israel. Consider the following verses. Therefore will I save my flock, and they shall no more be a prey, and I will judge between cattle and cattle. Think separating sheep from goats. And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David. He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken it. From Ezekiel's words, David is described as Christ's servant. So again, we see that the branch cannot be Jesus Christ. In addition, we learn that David will have a saving role to play in the preservation of the Jews with great power in the latter days. The branch will literally be a godsend for Israel. Consider the following description of Judah under the leadership of the branch in the last days. 
In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. I'll conclude this section with an excerpt from Orson Hyde's dedicatory prayer over the land of Israel for the commencement of their Latter-day Gathering. Consider the following. Thou, O Lord, did once move upon the heart of Cyrus to show favor unto Jerusalem and to her children. Do thou now also be pleased to inspire the hearts of kings and the powers of the earth to look with a friendly eye towards this place, and with a desire to see thy righteous purposes executed in relation thereto. Let them know that it is thy good pleasure to restore the kingdom unto Israel, raise up Jerusalem as its capital, and constitute her people a distinct nation and government with David thy servant, even a descendant from the loins of ancient David, to be their king. As all other things in Orson Hyde's blessing regarding Jerusalem have come to pass, we can therefore confidently look forward to the day when the branch, or David, will reign in Jerusalem. We now turn to the root. The root. The Doctrine and Covenants section previously cited also makes mention of the root. This is what the Lord said when queried about the root. Behold, thus saith the Lord, it is a descendant of Jesse, as well as of Joseph, unto whom rightly belongs the priesthood and the keys of the kingdom for an ensign and for the gathering of my people in the last days. The popular interpretation for the root of Jesse is Joseph Smith. We know that Joseph Smith was a descendant of Joseph of Egypt. Although I do not know about Jesse. Furthermore, Joseph Smith received the Melchizedek priesthood from Peter, James, and John, and so could arguably lay claim to those keys. After all, it is through Peter, James, and John that all Melchizedek priesthood holders can trace their authority back to Jesus Christ. Furthermore, we know that Joseph Smith received the keys to gather Israel from Moses. We also know that Joseph Smith raised an ensign to the nations by way of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. As well as Joseph Smith seems to fit this description, I believe there is another that is even better suited. That's John the Revelator. John is the only other person I know of that is better suited than Joseph Smith to be the root of Jesse. I do not know what John's tribal affiliation was, but given that he was an Israelite, having a joint lineage would not be a surprise. Furthermore, John the Revelator restored the Melchizedek priesthood, conferring it upon Joseph Smith, whereas John himself received the priesthood directly from the hand of the God of Israel himself. Furthermore, we understand that John was also given the keys to gather Israel in the last days and to restore all things. Consider the following verses from another question and answer section of the Doctrine and Covenants. Question. What are we to understand by the little book which was eaten by John, as mentioned in the tenth chapter of Revelations? Answer. We are to understand that it was a mission and an ordinance for him to gather the tribes of Israel. Behold, this is Elias, who, as it is written, must come and restore all things. From this verse, we learn that John was given a similar role to that ascribed to Joseph Smith, the difference being that John is still alive, while Joseph Smith is not. We have learned from the 10th article of faith that one of the things that needs to be restored, but was not restored through Joseph Smith, is the restoration of the 10 tribes. This restoration will be done through John. Furthermore, from John's last writing in the book of Revelations, he is told by an angel of the Lord the following, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. We will be hearing more from John again. Isaiah provides additional insight into the mission of the root. Consider the following, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. 
And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, and from Egypt, and from Pathros, and from Cush, and from Elam, and from Shinar, and from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. There are many interesting points in these verses. While some of the points listed in these verses could apply to Joseph Smith, all of them apply to John. Note that here Isaiah does make reference to the gathering of Israel and refers to the lost tribes of Jacob, again with an Assyrian reference. Isaiah also makes two separate references to tribes of Israel, those that will be gathered from the nations of the earth and those that were outcasts. To me, the term outcast elicits a different meaning than dispersed. It infers a group that was cast out of a larger group, whereas a group that was dispersed is no longer a group at all and therefore needs to be gathered. It also brings to mind, once again, the Lord's covenant to Israel. If any of thine be driven out to the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. While we do not know where John is, we do know that he is ministering to the lost ten tribes and preparing them for their return. In a church conference held on June the 3rd, 1831, Joseph Smith taught the saints that John the Revelator was then among the lost ten tribes of Israel, preparing them for their return from their long dispersion. In this section, we have learned about four incredible Latter-day leaders. I have provided evidence that suggests all four of these leaders will be affiliated with the remnant of Jacob. The stem of Jesse is Christ. The rod of Jesse will be a leader among the remnant of Jacob in Zion, who will demonstrate a tremendous display of power in America. A man like Captain Moroni comes to mind. We also learned about the branch of Jesse, who will be the latter-day ruler in Israel that will rebuild the temple and assist in preserving the Jews from total destruction. Lastly, the root of Jesse will be the restorer of all things, including the restoration of the lost ten tribes. This will be John the Beloved. Chapter 14 The Sanctification of Judah Up to this point, the bulk of what we have covered in Isaiah has pertained to the latter-day events that will transpire in America. Now we expand the scope of Isaiah's vision beyond America's shores. As we mentioned at the beginning of this section, Isaiah wrote about all things touching the house of Israel. Therefore, he also wrote regarding the events surrounding the Jews in the last days. The Lord has now gathered the Jews. They have returned to their homeland after more than 1,800 years. However, despite being the covenant people of the Lord, in general, today's Jews tend to be less influenced by religion than the average American. According to an article published on www.harzitz.com, an Israeli website, only 38% of Jews consider themselves to be religious. Furthermore, only 16% of Jews attend a religious service at least once a month. Many Jews have greatly struggled trying to reconcile the existence of a loving God. I have heard it said that for many Jews, God died in the Holocaust. There is no doubt that the Jews have had a difficult time over the course of history, but Isaiah tells us that it will not always be so. There will come a day when the Jews will be a glorious and holy people, but unfortunately circumstances for them will get much worse before they get better. In the first section of this book, the account of Ezra's eagle, it was demonstrated that apart from Zion, all the Gentile nations of the earth would be gathered together against Israel. Furthermore, we saw that these countries would be led and excited by what I interpreted to be a Russian-led coalition, with an Antichrist speaking out great blasphemies against God. This Antichrist was referred to as a mouth by John and as a stout 
horn by Daniel. Since the founding of Israel, the Jews have lived on an island in a turbulent sea of open hostility. Their enemies surround them. Comparing Israel's population to those of the Arab states that share physical borders with them, Israel is outnumbered by more than 20 to 1. Expanding this comparison to all Arab states, this jumps to more than 70 to 1. These are not good odds for Israel. Combine this with the total population of all other Gentile nations, and Israel is in serious trouble. In light of these sobering circumstances, Isaiah foresaw the following, And the Gentile nations shall pass through Judah, they shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck, and the stretching out of his wing shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. In mine ears, saith the Lord of hosts, of a truth many houses shall be desolate, and great and fair cities without inhabitant. For Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is fallen, because their tongues and their doings have been against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunk the dregs of the cup of tremblings wrung out. From other prophets, we learn that Israel will be besieged for three and a half years. And there was given me a reed likened to a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God and the altar, and then that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. The devastation from this siege will be horrific. The Jews will be in dire circumstances, starving, destitute, and at some point the Jewish state will be left leaderless. It appears that the country will be on the verge of total collapse. Consider the following verses from Isaiah. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, does take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole staff of bread and the whole stay of water. Judah will be starving for lack of both food and water. The mighty man and the man of war the judge and the prophet and the prudent and the ancient, the captain of fifty and the honorable man and the counselor and the cunning artificer and the eloquent orator. Judah's leadership will have been decimated. They will be on the brink of annihilation. When a man shall take hold of his brother and the house of his father and shall say, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let not this ruin come under thy hand. In that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be a healer, for in my house there is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. Judah will be desperately looking for someone to lead them out of their dire circumstances and to give them hope. Now back to Isaiah. And none to guide Jerusalem among all the sons she hath brought forth, neither that taketh her by the hand of all the sons she hath brought up. For I beheld, and there was no man, even among them, and there was no counselor, that when I asked of them, could answer a word. Isaiah plainly states that the Jews will lose their leadership. Given the list of leadership voids, it would appear that only the common citizenry will remain at that day. This is indicative of a war of extinction. As in traditional wars, the leadership is kept alive to be able to surrender and negotiate terms. These wicked hordes are interested in extermination, not negotiation. These will be desperate times. If Israel is to survive, they must receive assistance, and that assistance must come from outside their desperate borders. The prophet Zechariah gives further insight into the horror that will rage among the Jews in that day. Consider the following verses. Awake, O sword against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. And it shall come to pass, that in all the land, saith the Lord, 
two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. And they shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, It is my people. And they shall say, The Lord is my God. The suffering of the Jews in that day will be beyond comprehension. The horrific slaughter of two-thirds of the population, the starvation, and the hopeless state our brothers will find themselves in is awful to consider. But as Zechariah noted, there is a purpose behind their suffering. They, like the American Zion, must be refined. The Lord is making something of them that we must conclude would not be possible through any other method. As a diamond can only be formed under intense pressure, so it will be with the Jews in that day. In the end, the remaining third will remember and keep their covenants made of old. As desperate as those days will become, the Lord will provide an escape for his people as they turn to him. As we have seen, in those days Israel shall be bereft of internal leadership. Isaiah therefore speaks of external leaders that will come to Israel's aid. We have already learned of one such leader, the branch. The branch will not be alone, however. We also learn of two mighty prophets that will come into Israel to comfort her. Let us now consider these two prophets. These two sons are come unto Israel, who shall be sorry for thee, thy desolations and thy destruction, and the famine and the sword. Thy sons have fainted, save these two. They lie at the head of all the streets as a wild bull in a net. They are full of the fury of the Lord and the rebuke of thy God. These two sons that come unto Israel are from some other location. They are called sons, so it is reasonable to assume that they are Israelites, perhaps even descendants of Jesse, as we have seen the other three mighty Latter-day leaders will be. I believe that these will arrive at the same time the remnant of Jacob arrives to liberate America from the filth of the stout horn. Their purpose is clear. These three are to preserve Israel until the Messiah comes. These two sons are the same two witnesses identified by John the Revelator. John's testimony of these individuals adds valuable insight to Isaiah's prophecy. Consider the following verses from Revelations. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth, and if any man will hurt them, he must in like manner be killed. These have power to shut the heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues, as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of that great city which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds of tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three and a half days, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put into graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three and a half days the Spirit of the life of God entereth into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon all which saw them. According to John, the mission of these two witnesses corresponds with the length of the siege on Jerusalem noted earlier, 42 months. Furthermore, the siege happens outside of the temple, so we can assume that the temple will have been rebuilt in Jerusalem prior to this event. Who knows but that the building of the temple will be the spark that ignites this powder keg. We do know that the branch is associated with the rebuilding of the temple and therefore likely will precede the arrival of the two prophets. Regarding the powers given into the hands of these two sons, it appears that they will hold the sealing power. 
Elijah and Nephi, the son of Helaman, both were given the sealing power and were able to seal the heavens and perform acts similar to those described by these two sons. In order for these two witnesses to have had the sealing power, they must have had the Melchizedek priesthood. Perhaps these two sons will be one of the many missionary companions sent forth from the ranks of the 144,000. The hunters sent to witness to the world one last time prior to the Lord's coming. As noted, the whole world will be watching the activities of these two witnesses. The fact that their deaths will be celebrated as a telling sign of the ripened condition of the world. Isaiah also makes further reference to the branch who will come to Israel in her desperate times. From previous verses, we have noted that the lost ten tribes will return from the north, and we also noted that they will first come to America. With this in mind, consider the following verses from Isaiah. The first shall say to Zion, Behold them, and I will give to Jerusalem one that bringeth good tidings. It's important to note, the first refers to Judah. Judah was the first to receive the gospel. In this verse, Judah speaks to Zion, telling them to behold them. Who is the them they are to behold? I believe it's the remnant of Jacob in America. Because as the verse continues, it's these that they behold that bring good tidings. Isaiah continues, I have raised up one from the north, and he shall come. From the rising of the sun shall he call upon my name, and he shall come upon my princes as upon mortar, and as the potter treadeth the clay. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girder of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. This leader, who brings good tidings to Israel from the north, has definite messianic qualities. However, I am not aware of any prophecy that states that Christ will come from the north. His return is associated with the east. We saw in previous chapters that it is not uncommon for the Lord's leader to exhibit messianic aspects in their ministries. Such will be the case for the stem, the branch, the root, and the rod of Jesse. In other words, this great leader will have many wonderful Christ-like attributes. In the prior chapter, we learned that the branch was described as growing up in his place. I conclude that this linked him to the remnant of Jacob. In these verses, we receive further confirmation of that assumption. His place is in the north. As the lost ten tribes first come to America, Zion, from the north. The branch is noted in these verses as having been first seen in Zion. The timing of David's coming is not clear. I do not know if he will precede the main body of Jacob or if he will come with them. We know that he will rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. We know from Scripture that the Lord was able to lift up the entire city of Enoch, and he will return that city to the earth during the millennium. As such, if it was the Lord's will, the same could be done with the temple in Jerusalem. Just like Ether 13 verse 3 suggests. I'm not sure that the Arabs would sit down idly by while the Dome of the Rock was destroyed and the temple rebuilt in its place. My feeling is that the temple will be constructed very quickly, if not instantaneously, through an Enoch-like event, because the scriptures say that once it's built, it will be under siege. I have speculated that the temple's appearance may end up being the spark that ignites the tinderbox. Isaiah continues as follows, 
Howl, O gate, cry, O city, thou whole Palestina art dissolved. Palestina is Palestine, Judah's symbolic enemy. For there shall come from the north a smoke. The reference to the north again is a reference to the lost ten tribes. And none shall be alone in his appointed times. After the arrival of the smoke, Israel is no longer alone or leaderless in its fight. But thus saith the Lord, Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. Regarding the timing of these events, we learn from these verses that the arrival of this smoke is from the north, and it ends the conflict with finality. Israel's enemies are dissolved. Regardless of how dire the Jews' circumstances are, or how powerful their enemies are, they are delivered. A careful reading of the above verses identifies the Lord's presence among the returning remnant of Jacob. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. From a previous verse, we know that this is not a reference to the symbolic presence of the Lord, but his actual presence. Let us revisit those verses from the book of Revelations. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vestiture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven the smoke from the north, or the remnant of Jacob, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. And he hath on his vestiture, and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is an awe-inspiring description of the long-awaited Messiah, the one true King of kings and Lord of lords. With eyes aflame and cloaked in red, he comes to liberate his desperate people, the Jews. The description of the armies that follow the Lord agree with that of the remnant of Jacob, who are likewise described as horsemen, we shall come to understand in future chapters. Christ himself further expounds upon this matter when he was speaking to the apostles regarding the last days. Consider the following verses. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, and from one end of heaven to the other. Christ does not infer that the armies of the angels will surround him, but rather that he will send his angels to gather his elect from one end of heaven to the other. On numerous occasions I have shown that this phrase is also associated with the return of the remnant of Jacob. For further corroborative evidence that the lost ten tribes will arrive in Jerusalem with the Lord at their head, call to remembrance Isaiah's reference that Palestina would be dissolved at the arrival of the northern smoke. With this in mind, consider the description of the curse that will come upon the Jews' enemies at the arrival of the Lord. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouths. The description from this verse sounds very similar to the description of Palestina being dissolved by the northern smoke. There are too many similarities between these different prophecies regarding the same events to be insignificant. 
The prophet Zechariah provides additional information regarding the salvation of Jerusalem. His prophecies are harmonious with the message shared up to this point, and words expound certain portions of the message beyond what we have hitherto done. Consider the following verses from his prophecies. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angels of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for me as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem, on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, towards the east and towards the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove towards the north, and half of it towards the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, and the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening it shall be light. And it shall be in that day that living water shall go forth out of Jerusalem, half of them towards the former sea, and half of them towards the hinder sea, in the summer and in winter shall it be. Zechariah's amazing prophecies add tremendous insight to those already provided by Isaiah. Zechariah mentions that even the feeble among the Jews in that day will be as David, with David's strength likened to the strength of God and the angels of God. I interpret this as meaning the Jews in general will be as strong as David of old in that day, and that the branch's strength will be likened unto God. What an amazing prophecy! Another interesting insight into these events is that they will take place in either the summer or in winter. Note that these two seasons occur simultaneously depending upon which part of the hemisphere you live in, a reference to the universal knowledge of these happenings in these days. After the Jews have been saved and the Lord has returned, Isaiah makes mention that the lands of Israel, once desolate, shall be again filled with Israelites. So much so that Israel must expand her borders in order to accommodate the arrival of this mighty host. There will not be enough space for all of them to fit. Consider the following verses. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles, and set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. Again, this verse eludes to the fact that the returning tribes will come from America. Lift up thine eyes round about, and behold, all these gather themselves together, and they shall come to thee. And as I live, saith the Lord, thou shalt surely clothe thee with them all, as with an ornament, and bind them on even as a bride. For thy waste and thy desolate places, and the land of thy destruction, shall even now be too narrow by reason of the inhabitants, and they that swallowed thee up shall be far away. The children whom thou shalt have, after thou hast lost the first, shall again in thine ears say, The place is too straight for me. Give me place that I may dwell. Then thou shalt say in thine heart, Who hath begotten me these, seeing that I have lost my children and am desolate, a captive and removing to and fro? And who hath brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. These, where have they been? Then shall their watchmen lift up their voice, and with one voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye. 
For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, and will yet choose Israel, and set them in their own land, and the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them, and bring them to their place, yea, from the far ends of the earth, and they shall return to the lands of their promise, and the house of Israel shall possess them. And the land of the Lord shall be for servants and handmaids, and they shall take them captive of whom they were captives, and they shall rule over their oppressors. Then will the Father gather them together again, and give unto them Jerusalem for the land of their inheritance. And then shall that which is written come to pass, Seeing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, Break forth into singing, and cry aloud, Thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. These verses describe in plain language a host of the children of Israel coming into Jerusalem and overflowing all her borders, causing all the desolate places of ancient Israel to be inhabited once more. They speak of Judah's surprise after they have suffered so much loss to see so many of their righteous brothers and sisters inhabiting their ancestral lands once again. These verses are beautiful. The events in Jerusalem will conclude the worldwide purification process. The process that began in America will end in Jerusalem, thus fulfilling the saying, The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. It will be glorious beyond description. Isaiah attempts to describe it in the following words, And it shall come to pass that they that are left in Zion and remain in Jerusalem shall be called holy every one that is written amongst the living in Jerusalem, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof, by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow, and from thy fear, and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shall not remember the reproach of thy youth, and shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, for the feet of those who are in the east shall be established, referring to the Jews finally becoming firm in the faith. And break forth into singing, O mountains, for they shall be smitten no more, for the Lord hath comforted his people, and will have mercy upon his afflicted. And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee, Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. The whole earth is at rest, and is quiet. They break forth into singing, and he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. 
Hasten the day of this glorious rest. Horrible will be the crucible that refines the world, but how glorious the residual peace. If there is a correlation between the intensity of the darkness and the brilliance of the peace, between joy and sorrow, pain and pleasure, how unfathomable will be this millennial day. Thus concludes this arrangement of the words of Isaiah, as recorded by the hand of Nephi. The scope of Isaiah's sweeping visions of future events is magnificent. From the scattering to the gathering, he saw it all. He saw the restoration and the rise of the glorious gospel ensign, the Book of Mormon, and the life and works of Joseph Smith. He saw the founding of the greatest nation the earth has ever seen. He saw that that nation began to canker and decay. In the midst of that decay, he saw another ensign raised, to which the lost ten tribes would rally and consume the dross. The vessel will be thoroughly cleansed both within and without. He saw the nations returned to their original majesty and the founding of Zion within its borders, the building of the new Jerusalem, and the coming of the millennial Messiah, and much more besides. It is my testimony that Nephi also saw these things, but he was forbidden to communicate them using his own precious and plain words. The Lord in his wisdom, however, prepared a way. In the context of the covenants of the Lord and the house of Israel, the words of Isaiah ring clear and true. The message related in this section of the work is incredible. It's fantastic and even unbelievable. With good reason, this topic is not one that is taught in such detail in our Sunday school classes. It's too incredible to be taught by anything other than a very deep study. As such, the burden of understanding, of learning and discerning these things is where the Lord intended that it should be between him and the individual. Chapter 15 Christ in America Hitherto I have made an attempt to demonstrate that the revelations of Isaiah both support and expound upon that which was seen by Nephi in his great Latter-day Vision. I would now like to demonstrate how the sermon Christ delivered through express command of his father, to the Nephites, also ties back to Nephi's great vision. Included in Nephi's narrative of his vision is the following direct quote from the premortal Messiah. For behold, saith the Lamb, I will manifest myself unto thy seed, that they shall write many things which I shall minister unto them, which shall be plain and precious, and after thy seed shall be destroyed and dwindle in unbelief, and also the seed of thy brethren, behold, these things shall be hid up to come forth unto the Gentiles by the gift and power of the Lamb. As this verse is found in the heart of Nephi's vision, it's reasonable to assume that the plain and precious truths that the Lord was referring to would be in relation to the things that Nephi saw in his vision. From this we learn that Nephi was not only instructed by an angel of the Lord, but by the premortal Messiah himself, some 600 years prior to his birth. Apart from this verse, we do not have a record of what Christ shared with Nephi, but it is clear from Nephi's subsequent commentary regarding his vision that he knew much more than he wrote. It cannot be a coincidence that both Nephi and the Savior spent so much of their time on this subject, nor that both Nephi and Christ reference Isaiah and John the Revelator. The book of Third Nephi contains 19 chapters where the resurrected Lord is teaching the Nephites in person. His American ministry begins at the Temple Mount, where he delivers the same sermon he gave back at the Galilean Mount. He then performs miracles, prays with the Nephites, and teaches of baptism and the Holy Ghost. He institutes the sacrament and teaches them what his church should be called. This part of his message takes up less than half of the written record. What is the rest of his message? 
It's spectacular, but seldom is it studied in depth. His message relates to the gathering of Israel in the latter days and is the clearest discourse on the subject matter in all the scriptures. His message is so straightforward that it can be easily understood sequentially as it is written. Therefore, rather than studying select passages from multiple chapters, I will go through Christ's entire discourse, verse by verse, in the order in which they appear in the Book of Mormon. Christ's message concerns America and the modern-day gathering and restoration of the House of Israel. As we have noted previously, when we are discussing these gathering events, there are distinct groups that we need to consider, namely the Gentiles, the remnant of Jacob that will return in a body, those of the House of Israel that were scattered amongst all the nations of the earth, the House of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, and the Jews. For clarification purposes, it will be beneficial to identify these groups in the language that Christ uses prior to examining the Lord's message in greater detail. Let's start with the House of Joseph. Members of the church often refer to the Native Americans as Lamanites. This is a stereotypical reference rather than a genealogical declaration. Among the Lamanites are remnants of many different groups of people, Mulekites, Nephites, Jaredites, and probably many other of which the religious record does not identify. This is not to say that there were not those of other tribes among them, nor does it require that all present were literally descendants from Abraham. Any surviving Jaredites were not. Whether by adoption, literal descent, or geographical references, the Lord associates the American remnants as being affiliated with the tribe of Joseph. Consider the following verse. Ye are my disciples, and ye are a light unto this people, who are a remnant of the house of Joseph. To better understand the above verse, let's contrast it with another verse regarding another remnant. Consider the following. The remnant shall return, yea, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. When Christ refers to the Nephites, he calls them a remnant of the house of Joseph, not the remnant of Joseph, as Isaiah does to the remnant of Jacob. This may seem a minor difference, but it is actually profound. A is an indefinite article, referring to more than one. The, on the other hand, is a definite article, inferring singularity. The Lord, whose collective wisdom surpasses the combined wisdom of all other sons and daughters of God combined, does not use words lightly. He used the indefinite article before, a remnant of Joseph, because there are more than one remnant of Joseph. Of all the tribes of Israel, only Joseph was subdivided into two half-tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. Therefore, the Lord must be inferring to the ancient American remnants as if they were affiliated to one rather than both of these. The following scripture from Alma teaches us which of these is meant. Consider the following verse. And Aminadi was a descendant of Nephi, who was the son of Lehi, who came out of the land of Jerusalem, who was a descendant of Manasseh, who was the son of Joseph, who was sold into Egypt by the hand of his brethren. As all of the remnants of ancient America were generally called after the name of the son of Lehi they choose to follow, namely Laman for Lamanites or Nephi for Nephites, though it appears that they were likewise associated with the tribe of Manasseh, from which all Lehi's sons descended. The Lamanites and Nephite remnants are from Manasseh. The Jews of the four groups, this is the most obvious. Throughout history, the Jews, more than any other tribe we know of, have maintained their identity as a tribe of Israel. The Jews, as referred to by Christ in this revelation, appear to have a geographical reference. The reference to Jerusalem is common. Consider the following verse. Then shall they break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Father hath comforted his people, he hath redeemed Jerusalem. 
We know without hesitation that the Jews were scattered among all nations of the earth. We also know that in large part, the gathering of the Jews has taken place. It is no coincidence that the Jews have been gathered primarily to one of two places, America, soon to become Zion, and Jerusalem. The Gentiles In Christ's teaching to the Nephites, the Gentiles encompass two groups, the righteous and the wicked. It is important to understand that the word Gentile is a biblical term and therefore comes to us by way of the Jews. The term Gentile denotes a non-Jewish person. From a strict interpretation, the other non-Jewish tribes in the house of Israel could be, and in the case of the Samaritans, were considered to be Gentiles. Therefore, in the Lord's eyes, the term Gentile is neither good nor bad, but rather a classifier. It is by their fruits that these shall be known, not by their pedigree. Righteous Gentiles The Book of Mormon, which takes a Jewish perspective as its authors did come from Jerusalem, teaches that the restoration was to happen at the hand of the Gentiles. What this really means is that the people of the Book of Mormon knew that the Latter-day Restoration would not come to them by way of Judah. And so it was. The church was restored through Ephraim. From this perspective, consider the following verse. Therefore, when these works and the works which shall be wrought among you hereafter come forth from the Gentiles, Ephraim, unto your seed, Manasseh, which shall dwindle in unbelief because of iniquity. For thus it behooveth the Father that it should come forth from the Gentiles, that he may show forth his power unto the Gentiles. For this cause that the Gentiles, if they will not harden their hearts, that they may repent and come unto me and be baptized in my name, and know of the true points of my doctrine, that they may be numbered among my people, O house of Israel. Note in this verse, Ephraim is referred to as a Gentile. But all people that repent and hearken unto God are numbered among his people. From the Book of Mormon perspective, the righteous Gentiles and the tribe of Ephraim are one and the same. Unrighteous Gentiles the unrighteous Gentiles are associated with all the unbelieving, regardless of tribal affiliation. It is interesting to note that of the twelve tribes of Israel, the only two tribes that are explicitly named as being scattered and subsequently gathered into tribes are the tribe of Judah and Joseph. This is so in both the Book of Mormon and the Bible. Consider the following verses from Zechariah. And I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph, and I will bring them again to place them, for I have mercy upon them, and they shall be as though I had not cast them off. For I am the Lord their God, and will hear them, and they of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man, and their heart shall rejoice as through wine, yea, their children shall see it, and be glad, and their heart shall rejoice in the Lord. I will hiss for them and gather them, for I have redeemed them, and they shall increase as they have increased. And I will sow them among the people, and they shall remember me in far countries, and they shall live with their children and turn again. In these verses, the prophet clearly calls out two complete tribes as having been scattered and gathered again, as though I had not cast them off. It is exciting and a little scary to note that both these groups have largely been gathered, Judah and the house of Joseph. Furthermore, Ephraim is called out separately for a greater work that will bring him untold joy. This joy will come from their supportive role in the restoration, along with an incredible missionary effort, which it turns out will largely result in the further gathering of Joseph. It is through Ephraim that the gathering of the house of Israel commenced. The Lost Tribes of Israel As we have noted previously in this work, the remnant of Jacob refers to an existing body of the Lost Ten Tribes. 
The definitive article, the, identifies them as a specific group. These are a group apart from the many scattered individuals from all the tribes of Israel that do exist to one degree or another among all the nations of the earth. While those scattered individuals have lost their identity, the remnant of Jacob has not. They know who they are. They have been led away out of the land by the Father and will return again being led by him. With this in mind, we will begin our study of Christ's words to the Nephites regarding the events of the latter days. Chapter 16, Third Nephi, chapters 15 through 17. Christ begins this particular discourse after having delivered the Sermon on the Temple Mount and called his twelve disciples. It is interesting to note that this is a different title than the Jewish apostles, to whom these twelve disciples were to be subordinate to. After calling these righteous men, Christ informs them of a particular message that he has been instructed to give them by the Father of us all. The message he was instructed to give us begins as follows. Ye are my disciples, and ye are a light unto this people, who are a remnant of the house of Joseph. And behold, this, America, is the land of your inheritance, and the Father hath given it unto you. And not at any time hath the Father given me commandment that I should tell it unto your brethren at Jerusalem, the Jews. Neither at any time hath the Father given me a commandment that I should tell unto the Jews concerning the other tribes, the lost ten tribes, of the house of Israel whom the Father hath led away out of the land. These first few verses are packed with information. First, Christ identifies his audience as a remnant of Joseph. The group to whom Christ is speaking to is the apostles, but the assembled multitude that has gathered in the temple in the land bountiful is also likely present. Christ confirms that the house of Joseph, according to their faithfulness, will inherit the Americas. Christ also confirms what we have read in the Apocrypha regarding the lost tribes is true, namely that they were led out of the land by the Father. There is a tremendous connotative difference between the words associated with the lost tribes and those of Joseph and Judah. Consider the differences between led and scattered, return and gather. The differences are pronounced. The lost tribes were led away and will return. Judah and Joseph were scattered and need to be gathered. One more point worth mentioning here is the specific word choice the Savior used. The Savior specifically stated that the lost ten tribes had been led away out of the land. Let's consider the different potential meanings this phrase could have. The meaning of the word land here could have a range of meanings the land of Assyria, the Middle East, the entire continent, or the earth itself. If it were to be written that the people of Enoch were led away out of the land, we would equate the land with the earth itself. There is a scriptural precedent for a large group of people being removed entirely from the land. We have now encountered numerous inferences that the remnant of Jacob is, in fact, located somewhere in the heavens rather than on earth. Christ continues as follows. This much did the Father command me, that I should tell unto them, the Jews, that other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And now, because of the stiff-neckedness and unbelief, they, the Jews, understood not my word. Therefore, I was commanded to say no more of the Father concerning this thing unto them. But verily I say unto you, that the Father hath commanded me, that I tell it unto you, that ye were separated from them, the Jews, because of their iniquity. Therefore, it is because of their iniquity that they know not of you. And verily I say unto you, again, that the other tribes hath the Father separated from them. And it is because of their, the Jews, iniquity, 
that they know not of them, the lost ten tribes. And verily I say unto you, that ye, Manasseh, are they of whom I said, Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And they, the Jews, understood me not, for they supposed that it had been the Gentiles, for they understood not that the Gentiles should be converted through their, the Jews, preaching. This is an interesting comment made by the Christ to the Nephites. He provided commentary to the meaning of his words to his followers in Jerusalem. He explicitly limits the meaning of the sheep in that verse to them, a remnant of Joseph. Christ continues, And they, the Jews, understood me not that I said, They, a remnant of Joseph, shall hear my voice. And they, the Jews, understood me not that the Gentiles, the rest of the world, should not at any time hear my voice, that I should not manifest myself unto them, the Gentiles, save it were by the Holy Ghost. But behold, ye, a remnant of Joseph, have both heard my voice and seen me, and ye are my sheep, and ye are numbered among those whom the Father hath given me. Now Christ provides additional insight, which clearly identifies the lost ten tribes to be a group existing as a body 900 years after the disappearance from the scriptural record. Consider this as Christ continues. And verily, verily, I say unto you, that I have other sheep, the lost ten tribes, which are not of this land, neither of the land of Jerusalem, neither in any parts of the land round about, whither I have been to minister. For they of whom I speak are they who have not as yet heard my voice, neither have I at any time manifested myself unto them. By this he means a personal visitation, such as the Nephites were then currently receiving. But I have received a commandment of the Father, that I shall go unto them, and they shall hear my voice, and shall be numbered among my sheep, and there may be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore I go to show myself unto them. Up to this point, the Lord has made mention of all four groups, the Gentiles, a remnant of the house of Joseph, the lost ten tribes, and the Jews. Furthermore, Christ has given some additional background to the meaning of the phrase, led away out of the land. He further states that the lost tribes are not of this land, meaning America, neither of the land of Jerusalem, neither in any parts of the land round about. He openly states that all twelve tribes of Israel are to hear his gospel directly from him, not second-hand through the ministration of others. This goes back to the Lord's covenant with them. Jehovah covenanted that he would be their God and they would be his people. This means that Jesus Christ, who is the God of Israel, will be their personal instructor with the Holy Ghost in conjunction with missionaries instructing the Gentiles. He personally brought the gospel to the Jews. He personally brought the gospel to the American remnants. And he clearly states that he would also visit the lost ten tribes and personally bring the gospel to them. Today we are aware of Christ's personal ministration to the house of Joseph and to the house of Judah. We have no knowledge of any other personal visitations of Jesus Christ to any other group of people on earth. It is conceivable that Satan could twist and corrupt a culture's memory to the personal visitation of God, but completely erase it? It does not follow the pattern. The New Testament has sparked thousands of new religions, has been suppressed from publication, but never has its influence altogether disappeared. Likewise, among the Native Americans, stories of a white-bearded god were well known and ingrained into the culture. Where then is the evidence of Christ's ministration to the lost ten tribes? The ten tribes by rights should have been about ten times the size of Judah or Joseph. It would be hard to imagine such a large group on earth without any hint of a cultural imprint. 
we have no record of any early missionary efforts coming across a large group of people that already claimed the knowledge of the gospel to be among them. If the lost ten tribes are among us today, say in Siberia or the northern bloc countries, how is it that all such evidence of Christ's personal ministration among them has been completely erased? Does not the absence of this cultural imprint suggest that this people may have been led away out of the land as we know it? The next point is that the Jews missed out on a major teaching opportunity regarding the other tribes. Why? Because they supposed that they understood the words the Master spoke. What hidden treasures of knowledge are kept from us for similar reasons? Christ knew that they did not understand this point. But Christ's pattern of teaching is not one of force-feeding, but rather, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. How many doctrines have only been given after a question was asked? In the following passage, Christ continues to illustrate this point. And I command you that ye shall write these sayings after I am gone, that if it so be that my people at Jerusalem the Jews, they that have seen me and been with me in my ministry, do not ask the Father in my name that they may receive a knowledge of you, a remnant of Joseph, by the Holy Ghost, and also of the other tribes, the remnant of Jacob, whom they know not of, that these sayings which ye shall write shall be kept, and shall be manifested unto the Gentiles, that through the fullness of the Gentiles, the remnant of their seed, the Jews, who shall be scattered forth upon the face of the earth because of their unbelief, may be brought in, or may be brought into a knowledge of me, their Redeemer. Above, Christ confirms that he would have given the Jews more information if they had asked for it. Also, Christ specifically confirms that the tribe of Judah was about to be scattered upon the face of the earth, because they broke their covenants and rejected him. But as a rising tide lifts all ships, so the faith of the Gentile in the latter days will bring the Jews to a knowledge of their Redeemer. Note this is a very low threshold to meet. The Jews are not being converted to the Savior by the Gentiles, just being brought to a knowledge of Him. The LDS Church has made agreements to not proselyte amongst the Jews in Israel. Any students that would like to attend BYU Jerusalem must promise not to discuss the gospel with the Jews. This may seem strange, but the Jews, who of all people were first to have heard the gospel, will be the last to receive it in the latter days. Ultimately, while the Jews will obtain a knowledge of Christ, their wholesale conversion will not happen until the Lord comes in great power and glory to liberate them from annihilation. At that time, they will look upon him and realize who he is that has saved them. This is made clear by an Old Testament prophecy regarding this event. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? And he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. We see above that while the Jews will have a knowledge of Christ, only when they actually see him coming in great glory, seeing the marks in his hands and feet and side, only then will the realization begin to set upon them. Finally, they will fall at the feet of the king of the Jews and mourn for the wickedness of their fathers. Then will that realization come to them that the truth is not among them, but within the American Zion. Only then... At the end will the righteous nation who holds the restored gospel of Jesus Christ come among them and restore that which they had long since lost. 
Christ continues in his discourse. And then will I gather them, the Jews, in from the four quarters of the earth, and then will I fulfill the covenant which the Father hath made unto all the people of the house of Israel. Note the gathering of Judah was always an antecedent for the return of the lost tribes, and this requirement is now fulfilled. And blessed are the Gentiles because of their belief in me, in and of the Holy Ghost, which is witnessed unto them of me and of the Father. Behold, because of their belief in me, saith the Father, and because of the unbelief of you, O house of Israel, in the latter days shall the truth come unto the Gentiles, that the fullness of these things shall be made known unto them. The usage of the term house of Israel lets us know that Christ is addressing more than one of the typical subgroups, Judah, Joseph, or the lost tribes. Without specific context, it would be safe to assume that he's addressing all three. However, in this instance, Christ has given us additional context. He called out specifically which subgroups he is referring to. He did this as the Americas were engulfed in darkness, which followed the massive destruction that killed many of their own. Consider the following verse. And again, how oft would I have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings? Yea, O ye people of the house of Israel who have fallen. Yea, ye people of the house of Israel, ye that dwell at Jerusalem, as ye that have fallen. Yea, how oft would I have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chickens, and ye would not. It appears from this verse that Christ has excluded the lost tribes from this reference. Only Manasseh and Judah are mentioned. Could it be that the lost tribes were excluded because they were not wicked like unto these other two? Christ continues, But woe, thus saith the Father unto the unbelieving of the Gentiles. General reference to all unbelieving Americans, north and south. For notwithstanding, they have come forth upon the face of this land and have scattered my people, who are of the house of Israel, Manasseh, and my people, who are of the house of Israel, have been cast out from among them, think Indian reservations, and have been trotted down under feet of them. And because of the mercies of the Father unto the Gentiles, and also of the judgments of the Father upon my people, who are of the house of Israel, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that after all this, and I have caused my people who are of the house of Israel to be smitten, and to be afflicted, and to be slain, and to have been cast out from amongst them, and to become hated by them, and to become a hiss and a byword amongst them. And thus commandeth the Father that I should say unto you, At that day, when the Gentiles shall sin against my gospel, and shall reject the fullness of my gospel, and shall be lifted up in the pride of their hearts above all nations, and above all the people of the whole earth, and shall be filled with all manner of lines, and of deceits, and of mischiefs, and all manner of hypocrisy, and murders, and priestcrafts, and whoredoms, and of secret abominations. And if they shall do all those things, and shall reject the fullness of my gospel, Behold, thus saith the Father, I will bring the fullness of the gospel out from amongst them. Perhaps the latter part of the above verse is better understood when put in context with other teachings from the Book of Mormon. The following verses discuss those that once belonged to the Church of God, but openly sinned against the gospel and rejected it. Once they did so, they became hardened far beyond that of any other group of people we have knowledge of among the Nephites. Consider the following verse. Now these dissenters, having the same instruction and the same information of the Nephites, yea, having been instructed in the same knowledge of the Lord, nevertheless it is strange to relate, not long after their dissensions, they became more hardened and impotent, more wild, wicked, and ferocious than the Lamanites, drinking in with the tradition of the Lamanites, 
giving way to indolence and all manner of lasciviousness, yea, entirely forgetting the Lord their God. In the above verse, it was the dissenters from the church whose wickedness exceeded all other peoples and nations. They hardened their hearts and were filled with an unquenchable hatred towards their former brothers. Perhaps Glenn L. Pace of the former presiding bishopric said it best, You can leave the church, but you can't leave it alone. The basic reason for this is simple. Once someone has received a witness of the Spirit and accepted it, he leaves neutral ground. One loses his testimony only by listening to the promptings of the evil one. And Satan's goal is not complete when a person leaves the church, but when he comes out in open rebellion against it. These, who were once members, filled with the love of Christ, drove the Spirit from their lives by knowing the good and choosing the evil. They didn't lose their testimonies, they gave them away. They became consumed with hatred. They mocked their former fellows, persecuted them, and openly conspired and schemed against them. Among all the wickedness upon the earth, it's hard to imagine a more vile group than these, who have felt the love of God, but now openly resist and venomously fight against it. We know from modern revelation that the restored gospel shall never be taken again from the earth. Therefore, when Christ said the following, If they shall reject the fullness of my gospel, Behold, saith the Father, I will bring the fullness of my gospel from among them. Rather than inferring that the gospel will be taken from the Americas, it infers that the wicked will be swept off the face of the land. This will not be the first time an event like this has ever happened. It happened in the ancient church. Consider the following verse from the New Testament. For the time has come that the judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin with us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? This happened with the early church. It happened with the Nephites. And it was also present during the beginning of the Restoration. After events such as the failing of the Kirtland Safety Society and the unyielding mob persecutions, many of the early members of the church apostatized. All three witnesses to the Book of Mormon a member of the First Presidency, four members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and a large percentage of church members all fell away. Many of these apostates thought that their leaving the church would bring the fledgling organization to its knees. It did not. While the church had reason to mourn for the loss of so many, the standard of truth had been erected, and no unhallowed hand could stop the work from progressing. Though persecutions raged, armies assembled, and reputations were defamed, the truth of God went forth boldly, nobly, and independent of these apostates. The Lord showed forth once again that he could perform his own work. He purged his vineyard. He then refreshed the church with thousands of foreign converts. As Christ continues in his discourse, it would appear that this is a pattern that we should expect to see again. Consider the following verses. And then will I remember my covenant, which I have made unto my people, O house of Israel. And I will bring my people unto them. And I will show unto thee, O house of Israel, that the Gentiles, the enemies of God, shall not have power over you. But I will remember my covenant unto you, O house of Israel, and ye shall come unto the knowledge of the fullness of my gospel. Like the earlier foreign saints who renewed the strength of the church, so will the house of Israel come to renew the church in these last days. But unlike the early saints whose feet came to America to tread down the prairie sod, these that come will tread down something much different. But if the Gentiles will repent and return unto me, note, returning to notes that they were once with him, apostates. Thus saith the Father, Behold, they shall be numbered among my people, O house of Israel, and I will not suffer my people, who are of the house of Israel, to go through amongst them and tread them down, 
saith the Father. But if they will not turn unto me, and hearken unto my voice, I will suffer them. Yea, I will suffer my people, O house of Israel, that they shall go through among them, and shall tread them down. And they shall be as the salt that has lost its savor, which is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out, and to be trodden under the foot of my people, O house of Israel. Let's be clear about what the Lord has just said. He is talking to Latter-day America. The United States is the most powerful nation on the planet. Yet the Lord is saying that if America does not repent and turn again to him, they will be destroyed. Not just destroyed, tread underfoot, walked over as if we were not even there. Who could do such a thing? Christ claims it will be the house of Israel. What are we to understand by the house of Israel in this instance? Are we to assume that Manasseh from the south, Judah from the east, and Ephraim from within will converge upon the Americans and accomplish this great purge? From Isaiah we learned that this purging task was to be done at the hand of the remnant of Jacob. And so we shall see, as Christ's discourse progresses, that his teachings align perfectly with Isaiah's. Until then, however, Christ continues, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Thus hath the Father commanded me, that I should give unto you this people. This people refers to Manasseh. This land for their inheritance. And then the words of the prophet Isaiah shall be fulfilled, which say, Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. This verse infers to the watchmen of Joseph, the leaders of the church, meeting and seeing eye to eye with the watchmen of those that come in the name of the house of Israel. Break forth into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. It will be through the coming of the house of Israel that the waste places of Jerusalem will be inhabited. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of God. The coming of this group of Israel will be a worldwide news flash. Everyone will know about it. Note that while thus far, Christ has not specifically identified this coming group of Israel, other than the house of Israel. He has associated them both with redeeming Jerusalem and inheriting the gospel in America. With this statement, such would cause one to believe that this group will not be affiliated with either Judah or Joseph, as we know them today. Christ will bring further clarity to this point shortly, but for clarification purposes, it's the remnant of Jacob, the Lost Ten Tribes. Christ uses the verses that we have reviewed so far as an introduction to this topic among the group that had gathered together around the temple in the land bountiful. Keep in mind, this group had gathered together for many hours now. They have had a lot of information to take in. They had seen the promised Messiah, they had personally touched his hands, his feet, and side. They had heard the Sermon on the Temple Mount. They had seen Christ call the twelve disciples. It had been a very eventful day. Joseph Smith associated being in the presence of a glorified being as a very exhausting experience. Suffice it to say that this group was weary in body and mind. Christ perceived this fact. As a result, he understood that they were not grasping the scope of his father's message. They needed a break. The narrative therefore continues as follows. Behold now it came to pass that when Jesus had spoken these words, he looked round about again on the multitude, and he said unto them, Behold, my time is at hand. I perceive that ye are weak, that ye cannot understand all my words, which I am commanded of the Father to speak unto you at this time. Therefore, go ye into your homes, and ponder upon the things which I have said, and ask of the Father in my name, that ye may understand, and prepare your minds for the morrow, and I come unto you again, 
But now I go unto the Father, and also to show myself unto the lost tribes of Israel, for they are not lost unto the Father, for he knoweth whither he hath taken them. This closing part of Christ's message is fascinating. He reiterates again that the message he is bringing is not his own, but the Father's. We know that this message, while given to the Nephites, is really meant for the people of the latter days. Nevertheless, Christ admonished the Nephites to petition the Lord for understanding regarding this message. How much more should we, who now live in the latter days, petition the Lord that we too might understand Christ's stunning message? Furthermore, as Christ prepares to leave the Nephites, he tells them that he will now go to be amongst the lost tribes of Israel, but will return to continue his message the following day. Chapter 17, Third Nephi, Chapter 20 After Christ leaves, the Father's message is not picked up again until Chapter 20 of the same book. By the time Christ returns to the Nephites, their numbers have swelled from about 2,500 people to an exceedingly great number. Many people worked the whole night through getting the word out and assembling on the spot where Christ would again return. Christ's disciples update the people regarding Christ's teachings of the previous day, and then Nephi baptized all the disciples Christ had chosen the previous day. After the disciples are baptized, they are administered to by angels, and Christ appears in their midst. Christ confers upon the disciples the Holy Ghost. The Lord then administers the sacrament to the entire multitude, and then he continues his sermon from the previous day. Behold, now I finish the commandment which the Father hath commanded me concerning this people, who are a remnant of the house of Israel. Remember when he last spoke, he was discussing a group from the house of Israel that would come through and tread down the unrepentant Gentiles. He spoke about the people that would come and inherit the gospel from the unbelieving among the Gentiles and refresh the church as in the early days of its history. He likewise spoke of the group that would redeem Jerusalem. This group of which he spoke was the lost tribes of Israel, the same group that he had visited that night while the Nephites were sleeping. Ye remember that I spake unto you, and said, that when the words of Isaiah should be fulfilled, behold, they are written, ye have them before you, therefore search them. The words he was referring to is when the watchmen of Joseph at the coming of Israel would see eye to eye for the first time. And verily, verily, I say unto you, that when they shall be fulfilled, then is the fulfilling of the covenant which the Father hath made unto his people, O house of Israel. Note, Christ is now addressing the entire house of Israel, so to the extent that something is specific to a certain group, he will make it clear. And then shall the remnants, which shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth, be gathered in from the east and from the west, and from the south and from the north, and they shall be brought to the knowledge of the Lord their God, who hath redeemed them. And the Father hath commanded me that I should give unto you, Manasseh, this land for your inheritance. These verses imply that once this large body of Israel returns, there will be a mighty missionary effort that will yield pronounced results. All the remaining remnants will be gathered together at that time. This fact is confirmed by Jeremiah. Reconsider the following passage. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, The Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north, and from all the lands whither he hath driven them. And I will bring them again to the land that I gave unto their fathers. Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish for them. And after will I send for many hunters, and they shall hunt for them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. Jeremiah, like Christ, 
clearly indicates that there is a missionary component that accelerates once the Lord has brought back the lost tribes from the land of the north. The fishing effort is ongoing now and has been from the founding of the church. Fishing, however, conjures different images than hunting. With fishing, you catch what comes to you, whereas the hunter actively pursues its prey. The image of a hunter is similar to that of a soldier or that of a warrior. Envision powerful and fearless missionaries, overcoming any and all obstacles. The laws of men will not hold these back. Hunters will penetrate every climb, every valley, and every cave. It will be unlike any preceding effort, as the merciful Father oversees the great and last midnight harvest. Christ continues, And I say unto you, that if the Gentiles do not repent after the blessing which they have received, after they have scattered my people, then shall ye, who are a remnant of the house of Jacob, Christ formally put a name to this host of Israel, or the lost ten tribes. He calls them a remnant of Jacob. Go forth among them, and ye, the lost ten tribes, shall be in the midst of them, the Gentiles, or the enemies of God who shall be many, and ye shall be among them as a lion among the beasts of the forest, and as a young lion amongst the flocks of sheep, who if he goeth through both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Thy hand, the lost ten tribes, shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries, and all thine enemies shall be cut off. And I will gather my people together as a man gathereth his sheaves into the floor. Again, referencing the great and last harvest of men's souls. For I will make my people with whom the Father hath covenanted, the lost ten tribes. Yea, I will make thy horn iron, and I will make thy hoofs brass. And thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. And behold, I am he that doeth it. And it shall come to pass, saith the Father, that the sword of my justice shall hang over them in that day, and except they repent, it shall fall upon them, saith the Father, yea, even upon all the nations of the Gentiles. The Lord is quoting the above verses from Micah in the Old Testament, albeit with some modification. The context of the chapters being quoted is worth considering in light of its context from which they were extracted. The opening verse of Micah chapter 4 puts these events in context. It should sound very familiar. It begins as follows. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. Micah then identifies three distinct groups of people in the following unique manner. In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted. All three of these groups are referred to as being female. The scriptures often refer to Israel as a woman and the Lord as her bridegroom. These three women represent three distinct groups in the house of Israel. The first group, her that halteth, could refer to any of the groups we have previously discussed, as all the groups struggled with consistently following the Lord. Let's therefore look at the other two groups first. Her that is driven. Of all the tribes of Israel, the term driven best applies to the house of Joseph. Both Ephraim and Manasseh have been driven. Consider the following verses. But behold, it shall come to pass that they, Manasseh, shall be driven and scattered by the Gentiles. And after they have been driven and scattered by the Gentiles, behold, then will the Lord remember the covenant which he hath made unto Abraham and unto all the house of Israel. Clearly Manasseh was driven before the Gentiles. Now, consider the following verse from the Doctrine and Covenants regarding Ephraim, or the early church. Thy brethren have rejected you and your testimony. Even the nation has driven you out. And now cometh the day of their calamity, even the days of sorrow, 
like a woman that is taken in travail, and their sorrow shall be great unless they speedily repent, yea, very speedily. This verse refers, of course, to the church being driven out of the United States. As we know, early church members were driven before mobs, losing all the possessions they had on multiple occasions, from New York to Ohio, from Missouri to Illinois. After the saints had left the country, the country descended into civil war. The term woman in travail is the same term Micah uses in the same chapter that we are discussing, as will be noted subsequently. Micah's reference to being driven refers to the house of Joseph. Her that I have afflicted. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunk the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. Among the twelve tribes, it is Judah that has drunk most deeply from the cup of trembling. This group is clearly Judah. With the above two groups identified, the third group should default to the remnant of Jacob or the lost ten tribes. As Micah continues, this assumption is validated. Consider the following. And I will make her that halted a remnant, and her that was cast off far a strong nation. This reference is indicative of the remnant of Jacob who was taken to the utmost parts of heaven. And the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. Mount Zion is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, so we know that ultimately this remnant will settle there. And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee it shall come, even the first dominion. This indicates that the remnant of Jacob will first come to Ephraim to both purify and establish Zion upon the American continent. The kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. First Zion is established, then the remnant moves to Jerusalem. Now why dost thou cry aloud, Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished? Things have taken thee as a woman in travail. Be in pain, and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. This birthing process speaks to the purification that America will go through. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. There thou shalt be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. This last part has reference to when the Jews were taken captive by Babylon around 600 BC. The Lord delivered them from Babylon, and they were redeemed from the hand of their enemies by him. A similar redemption at the hand of the Lord awaits those that wait upon the Lord in the latter days. But there will be a period of great travail, which has been likened unto birthing pains, before that deliverance occurs. But then will the Lord's people likewise be innocent and pure, just like a newborn infant. Therefore will he give them up, until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. And the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a dew from the Lord, as the showers upon the grass that tarrieth not for man, nor waiteth for the sons of men. And the remnant of Jacob shall be amongst the Gentiles in the midst of many people as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion amongst the flocks of sheep, who, if he goeth through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Arise, and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thy horn iron, and I will make thy hoofs brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. These last verses are the same the Lord quoted to the Nephites. Although Christ linked the last verse to the remnant of Jacob, whereas Micah uses the term daughter of Zion, a clear reference to Ephraim. These two accounts are not contradictory. The remnant will come to Ephraim first, 
to receive the fullness of the gospel at her hand. But, as we have learned from the parable of the ten virgins, membership in the church is not the objective. It is knowing the Savior and being known by Him, having His image engraven upon our countenances. In that sobering parable, He claimed to not know half of the church at the time of His coming. Just as Zion could not be established in the past under certain circumstances, nor will it be in the future while the same holds true. Therefore, the purification process is likened to the pains of childbirth. The child being birthed is Zion and the new Jerusalem, and a righteous people. The righteous of Joseph shall see eye to eye with the returning remnant in that day, and shall be one in purpose. Thus, the acceptable interchange of these two terms, daughters of Zion and remnant of Jacob. But it should be noted that these terms were interchanged only after the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion. The Lord and country will be purified, that Zion may finally be established upon the American continent. Then will Jerusalem also be redeemed. Christ will continually expound upon this as his discourse continues. And it shall come to pass that I will establish my people, O house of Israel, and behold, this people will I establish in this land unto the fulfilling of the covenant which I made with your father Jacob, and it shall be a new Jerusalem, and the powers of heaven shall be in the midst of this people. Yea, even I will be in the midst of you. In this verse, the Lord uses the term establish, which denotes bringing into being on a firm and stable basis. This brings to mind a strong and firm foundation, one which will hold through the millennium. Christ is the rock upon which our foundation must be established. Wickedness fosters instability and breeds apostasy and sin. Christ is the only saving salve against sin. Christ continues his discourse, highlighting this fact. Behold, I am he of whom Moses spake, saying, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be cut off from among the people. This prophet is Jesus Christ. Verily I say unto you, yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that followed after me, as many as have spoken, have testified of me. And behold, ye are the children of the prophets, and ye are of the house of Israel, and ye are of the covenant which the Father hath made with your fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed, the Father having raised me up unto you first and sent me to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities, and this because ye are the children of the covenant. In these verses, Christ teaches that the Father raised him up to bless them, meaning the house of Israel, and turn every one of them from their iniquities. Those who will be numbered amongst the house of Israel will be humble. Those that are wicked, regardless of their genealogy, will be cast off. These verses have far-reaching ramifications for the latter-day generation that will experience the things discussed in this book. After the remnant of Jacob has come, all those still among the living shall be called holy. We live in a society saturated with the stench of sin, but fewer and fewer among us can perceive it. Just because a skunk has become accustomed to its own stink does not mean its stench is not wildly offensive. A society whose senses have become so desensitized is not easily made aware of the awfulness of its situation. Just months before their destruction, the people of Ammonihah openly mocked Alma and Amulek, gnashing their teeth upon them and spitting upon them and saying, How shall we look when we are damned? Unfortunately, it seems that such a society tends to only be aroused to a sense of its horrible state by the affliction of terrible destruction. In such cases, the Book of Mormon and the Lord's Covenants to Israel serve as the playbook. 
Unfortunately, the events of the past will become the events of our day. It is just a matter of timing and ripening. Consider the events preceding the Savior's first coming to America. And it came to pass in the thirty and fourth year, in the first month, on the fourth day of the month, there arose a great storm, such a one as had never been known in all the land. And there was also a great and terrible tempest. And there was a terrible thunder, insomuch that it did shake the whole earth, as if it were about to divide asunder. And there were exceedingly sharp lightnings, such as never had been known in all of the land. And the city of Zarahemla did take fire, and the city of Moroni did sink in the depths of the sea, and the inhabitants thereof were drowned. And the earth was carried up upon the city of Moroniha, that the place of the city became a great mountain. And there was a great and terrible destruction in the land southward. But behold, there was a more great and terrible destruction in the land northward. For behold, the whole face of the land was changed because the tempest and of the whirlwinds, and the thunderings and the lightnings, and the exceedingly great quaking of the whole earth. And the highways were broken up, and the level roads were spoiled, and many smooth paces became rough, and many great and notable cities were sunk, and many were burned, and many were shaken till the buildings thereof had fallen to the earth, and the inhabitants thereof were slain, and the places were left desolate. And there were some cities which remained, but the damage thereof was exceedingly great, and there were many in them who were slain. And there were some who were carried away in the whirlwind, and whither they went no man knoweth, save they know that they were carried away. And thus the face of the whole earth became deformed, because the tempests and the thunderings and the lightnings and the quaking of the earth. The destruction that came upon American inhabitants was apocalyptic in nature, beyond anything they had ever known. Such will be the degree of our latter-day destruction, such as they have not heard. It is important to note that this destruction did not come by the hand of some known enemy. The hand of God brought this destruction upon them suddenly and in an instant. It was a purification process. The wicked were destroyed so that an extended period of peace and prosperity could be ushered in, where Christ himself would walk among his people. Consider the following verses. And all ye that are spared, because ye were more righteous than they, will ye not now turn unto me and repent of your sins and be converted, that I may heal you? Yea, verily I say unto you, if ye will come unto me, ye shall have eternal life. Behold, mine arm of mercy is extended towards you, and whosoever will come, him will I receive, and blessed are those who come unto me. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I created the heavens and the earth, and all things that in them are. I was in the Father from the beginning. I am in the Father, and the Father in me, and in me hath the Father glorified his name. I came unto my own, and my own received me not. And the scriptures concerning my coming are fulfilled. And as many as have received me, to them have I given to become the sons of God. And even so will I, to as many as shall believe on my name. For behold, by me redemption cometh, and in me is the law of Moses fulfilled. I am the light and the life of the world. I am Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end. And thus far were the scriptures fulfilled which had been spoken by the prophets. And it was the more righteous part of the people who were saved. And it was they who received the prophets and stoned them not. And it was they who had not shed the blood of the saints who were spared. And they were spared and they were not sunk and buried into the earth. And they were not drowned in the depths of the sea, and they were not burned by fire, neither were they fallen upon and crushed to death, and they were not carried away in the whirlwind, neither were they overpowered by the vapor of smoke and darkness. And now, whoso readeth, let him understand. He that hath the scriptures, let him search them, 
and see and behold, if all these deaths and destructions by fire and by smoke and by tempests and by whirlwinds and by the opening of the earth to receive them, and all these things are not unto the filling of the prophecies of the many holy prophets. Behold, I say unto you, yea, many have testified of these things at the coming of Christ. It is difficult to miss the similarities between these past events which preceded the Lord's first coming to America and those prophesied to precede his second coming. Just as John the Baptist was the forerunner for the Lord in his day, the Book of Mormon and the remnant of Jacob are the forerunners in ours. The voices from the dust cry out from its pages, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. The coming forth of the Book of Mormon is the sign to the world that the great and marvelous work and a wonder long foretold has already commenced. Similar to the more righteous part that survived the destruction preceding the coming of the Lord in their day, shall the more righteous part in our day be blessed in a similar manner and for a similar purpose, that the Lord himself might reign in righteousness amongst them. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. And it shall come to pass that they that are left in Zion and remain in Jerusalem shall be called holy, every one that is written amongst the living in Jerusalem. The Lord continues his discourse to Manasseh. And after that ye were blessed by turning from their iniquities, then fulfilleth the Father the covenant which he made unto Abraham, saying, In thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed, unto the pouring out of the Holy Ghost through me upon the Gentiles, Ephraim, which blessing upon the Gentiles, the United States of America, shall make them mighty above all, unto the scattering of my people, O house of Israel, and they shall be a scourge unto the people of this land, Manasseh. Nevertheless, when they shall have received the fullness of my gospel, then, if they shall harden their hearts against me, I will return their iniquities upon their own heads, saith the Father. And I will remember the covenant which I have made with my people, and I have covenanted with them, that I would gather them together in my own due time, that I would give unto them again the land of their fathers for their inheritance, which land is the land of Jerusalem. Note that the land of Jerusalem has been promised to Judah and to the lost tribes, which is the promised land unto them forever, saith the Father. It shall come to pass that the time cometh when the fullness of my gospel shall be preached unto them, referring to the fact that Judah will be the last to receive the gospel in the latter days. And they shall believe in me that I am Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and shall pray unto the Father in my name, then shall their watchmen lift up their voice, and with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye, Judah, Joseph, and the remnant of Jacob. Then will the Father gather them together again, and give unto them Jerusalem for the land of their inheritance. Though not expressly noted in the preceding verses, Christ is referring to the reunion of the entire house of Israel after the worldwide purification process has taken place. Before this day comes, the Jews shall drink down the dregs of the cup of trembling wrung out, but they will come out of the events of that day a pure and holy people. They will then forget the shame of their youth, the days of their constant rebellion before the Lord of hosts, and will at last see with joy eye to eye. Note, for the remainder of this chapter, the Lord quotes directly from Isaiah. Then shall they, Judah, Joseph, and the remnant of Jacob, break forth into joy, sing together ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Father hath comforted his people, he hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Father hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of the Father. And the Father and I are one. And then shall be brought to pass that which was written, Awake, awake again, and put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem. 
the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Just as the gospel will never again be taken again from the earth, neither will the Jews as a people falter again after their suffering. Shake thyself off from the dust, arise, sit down, O Jerusalem, loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, Ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that my people shall know my name. Yea, in that day they shall know that I am he that doth speak. This last part refers to the fact that the Jews, who for millennia have known the titles King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jehovah, the Great I Am, the Messiah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, etc., but have not known the Lord, shall at last see eye to eye with the mighty God of Israel. And then shall they say, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings unto them, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings unto them of good, that publish salvation, and saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Finally, when the Jews receive their king, how grateful they will be to have the everlasting gospel taught to them by their long-lost brothers. These brothers, who once vexed each other, will now joyfully unite, and the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And then shall a cry go forth, Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch not that which is unclean, go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. This refers to the great and last missionary effort, where the hunters of the Lord will bring in the remaining scattered children of Israel and bring them to Jerusalem and to Zion. For ye shall not go out with haste nor by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel shall be your rearward. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently, he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any other man, and his form more than the sons of men. This draws a similarity between the Jews and Christ. As the Son of God was beaten and torn by the Jews, so will they have been beaten and torn by the Father, more so than any other people. So shall he sprinkle many nations, refers to Judah's prior scattering. The kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which they had not been told, them shall they see, and that which they had not heard, shall they consider, referring to the amazing restoration that will happen with Israel in the last days. Verily, verily, I say unto you, all these things shall surely come, even as the Father hath commanded me. Then shall this covenant which the Father hath covenanted with his people be fulfilled, and then shall Jerusalem be inhabited again with my people, and it shall be the land of their inheritance." Care should be taken when discussing the lands of inheritance for the children of Israel. The children of Israel shall be free to go wherever they would like. Their inheritances are a reward, not a prison cell. The twelve tribes will not be forcefully segregated. The earth will be theirs, and they can dwell where they will. But Zion and Jerusalem will be the lands of Israel. Never again will they be taken from them so long as the earth shall stand. Chapter 18, Third Nephi, 21 Any student of the Second Coming has made a study of the signs of the times leading up to the main event. As Christ continues his discourse, he focuses on the timing of when these events will happen. As we focus on this particular message, we will note those things that have already occurred and those that have not. Christ continues his message as follows. And verily I say unto you, I give unto you a sign, that ye may know the time when these things shall be about to take place, that I shall gather in from their long dispersion my people, O house of Israel, and shall establish again among them my Zion. And behold, this is the thing which I give unto you for a sign, 
For verily I say unto you, that when these things which I declare unto you, and which I shall declare unto you hereafter of myself, and by the power of the Holy Ghost, which shall be given unto you of the Father, shall be made known unto the Gentiles, people who are a remnant of the house of Jacob, and concerning this my people who shall be scattered by them. In the above verses, Jesus Christ clearly notes two separate groups of people that must come to the Gentiles' knowledge, both of which will serve as signals that these events are at the door. One is that the Gentiles will come to the knowledge of Manasseh, who was scattered by the Gentiles. This is to say that we as Gentiles will know and understand the religious history of the people who once prospered upon this hallowed land, why they prospered, and why they were scattered, driven, and destroyed. This is an important sign because these people went through these same events that foreshadowed what will shortly happen to us. The other signal that the events long foretold by the prophets is at our door is that the Gentiles will know concerning the remnant of Jacob, the lost ten tribes, that is to say, the lost tribes of Israel. In other words, the Gentiles will come to understand the true meaning of the tenth article of faith. We believe in the literal gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the ten tribes, the remnant of Jacob, that Zion, the new Jerusalem, will be built upon the American continent, that Christ will reign personally upon the earth, and that the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisical glory. It is my hope that the reader of this book can now clearly see that the remnant of Jacob is an important and inextricable theme of the Latter-day message told by the Book of Mormon. Despite this being such an important aspect of the Book of Mormon, it has been largely overlooked. Our realization of this important fact is a necessary step. Indeed, it's a sign that the time is at hand. Let us hasten the work by fulfilling this requirement. Consider the Book of Mormon. Mormon said he literally had hundreds of plates he could have chosen from. Why did Mormon select the passages that he did? Consider his words. And now there cannot be written in this book even a hundredth part of the things Jesus did truly teach unto the people. And these things I have written, which are a lesser part of the things which he taught to the people. And I have written them to the intent that they may be brought again unto this people from the Gentiles, according to the words which Jesus hath spoken, for the very reasons we are presently discussing. And when they shall have received this, which is expedient that they should receive it first, to try their faith, and if it shall be that they shall believe these things, then shall the greater things be made manifest unto them. And if it so be that they will not believe these things, then shall the greater things be withheld from them unto their condemnation. Behold, I was about to write them all which were engraven upon the plates of Nephi, but the Lord forbade it, saying, I will try the faith of my people. Therefore, I, Mormon, do write the things which have been commanded me of the Lord. Mormon did not haphazardly slap records together while on the run from the Lamanites. He was shown by the Lord what he should include. It is our responsibility to search these things. We have been commanded to do so. Yet, too many of us can barely find time to crack the book open. On the other hand, many have read and reread the Book of Mormon, but far fewer have dipped below a cursory surface level of study, like a rock skipping along the surface of an otherwise profound depth of knowledge. Case in point, Isaiah's words as recorded in the Book of Mormon are read by most with glazed eyes, if they're read at all. In this light, consider the following warning given to us all. And your minds in times past have been darkened because of unbelief, and because you have treated lightly the things you have received, which vanity and unbelief have brought the whole church under condemnation. And this condemnation resteth upon the children of Zion, even all, and they shall remain under this condemnation until they repent and remember the new covenant, even the Book of Mormon, and the former commandments which I had given them, not only to say, but to do according to that which I have written. The above verse 
is also reminiscent of Nephi's closing remarks to his record, where he stated, Wherefore, now after I have spoken these words, if ye cannot understand them, it will be because ye ask not, neither do ye knock. Wherefore, ye are not brought into the light, but must perish in the dark. And now I, Nephi, cannot say more. The Spirit stoppeth mine utterance, and I am left to mourn. Because of the unbelief, and the wickedness, and the ignorance, and the stiff-neckedness of men. For they will not search knowledge, nor understand great knowledge, when it is given unto them in plainness, even as plain as the word can be. Clearly, the Lord expects more of us than just a stone skipping across the surface of knowledge. Too few of us truly seek to understand the word of the Lord. Are we too busy being distracted by virtual reality to listen to reality crying out to us as a voice from the dust? On the other hand, the timing of all things is in the Lord's hands and operates on the Lord's timetable. This self-reflective question should be asked by every reader of this work. Have I felt the Spirit of the Father speak to me as I have heard the message found in this book? After more than 2,700 years of absence, am I becoming aware of this remnant of Jacob? Has Elijah planted the promises made to my fathers in my heart? The Lord continues his discourse. Verily, verily, I say unto you, when these things shall be made known unto them, the Gentiles, of the Father, and shall come forth of the Father from them, Ephraim, unto you, Manasseh. Again, note the use of the plural in the word things. These things are a knowledge about both the remnant of Jacob and Manasseh. The Lord continues, for it is wisdom in the Father that they should be established in this land, and be set up a free people by the power of the Father, that these things might come forth from them unto a remnant of your seed, that the covenant of the Father may be fulfilled, which he hath covenanted with his people, O house of Israel. Therefore, when these works and the works which shall be wrought among you hereafter shall come forth from the Gentiles, unto your seed, which shall dwindle in unbelief because of iniquity. For thus it behooveth the Father that it should come forth from the Gentiles, that he may show forth his power unto the Gentiles. For this cause that the Gentiles, if it will be that they harden not their hearts, that they may repent and come unto me and be baptized in my name and know of the true points of my doctrine, that they may be numbered among my people, O house of Israel. And when these things come to pass, that thy seed, Manasseh, shall begin to know these things, it shall be a sign unto them, that they may know that the work of the Father hath already commenced unto the fulfilling of the covenant, which he made unto the people who are of the house of Israel. And when that day shall come, it shall come to pass that kings shall shut their mouths, for that which had not been told them shall they see and that which they had not heard shall they consider. The phrase, and when that day shall come, is referring to the fulfillment of the Lord's covenant, the gathering of Judah and Joseph, and the return of the remnant of Jacob. When this happens, kings will shut their mouths. That is to say, the world will be stunned into amazed silence, for that which Babylon had not foreseen shall they see, and that which they had not heard, shall they consider. However, for Latter-day Saints, we should be joyfully waiting their return, for this information is not new to us. It has been written before us for almost 200 years now in the pages of the Book of Mormon. Christ continues, For in that day, for my sake, shall the Father work a work, which shall be a great and a marvelous work among them, and there shall be among them those who will not believe it, although a man shall declare it unto them. If no one else has declared this message, Christ has. Note that Christ repeatedly used the word declare when discussing these things. This is the thing which I, Christ, give unto you for a sign. For verily I say unto you that when these things which I declare unto you 
in which I shall declare unto you hereafter of myself, and by the power of the Holy Ghost, which shall be given unto you of the Father, shall be made known unto the Gentiles, that they may know concerning this people who are a remnant of the house of Jacob, and concerning this people who shall be scattered by them. Through his declaration of the remnant of Jacob in the Book of Mormon, we have the key of knowledge to illuminate the meaning of the prophets regarding the same topic, regardless of the dispensation from which they were called to serve. From a secular standpoint, these things are too sensational to believe. It is the same with the gospel at large. The things that the Latter-day Saints believe are foolish in the sight of the world. Without the confirming testimony of the Holy Ghost, they truly are unbelievable. It is precisely for this reason that many members of the church today are falling away. They have exchanged their testimonies for the philosophies of men. They look for answers that are pleasing unto the carnal mind. They dismiss the things of the Spirit as emotional responses, thereby cutting themselves off from the only reliable source of spiritual knowledge. Without the confirming witness of the Holy Ghost, those who once walked in the light will eventually turn and rail against the gospel and denounce the servants of the Lord. Such is the continued message of Christ's discourse. But behold, the life of my servant shall be in my hand. Therefore, they shall not hurt him, although he shall be marred because of them. Yet I will heal him, for I will show unto them that my wisdom is greater than the cunning of the devil." Who is this servant of Christ that will have been marred by the people, but healed through the great and marvelous work? Of all the latter-day servants of Christ, is there one whose reputation has been more marred by the people than Joseph Smith's? Did he not declare these things? Is not his name spoken for good and evil among all people? It was his blood that was shed to seal his testimony. Today, perhaps more than ever, the man from Palmyra evokes vehement opposition, ridicule, and slander. However, imagine the great and terrible day when the mighty hosts of Jacob come forth from their highway cast up out of the great deep to be crowned at the hands of the children of Ephraim. Will the events of that great day not heal the marred reputation of this great prophet of God? To echo the words of the 135th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, Joseph Smith, the prophet and seer of the Lord, has done more save Jesus only for the salvation of men in this world than any other man who has ever lived in it. In the short space of 20 years, he has brought forth the Book of Mormon, which he translated by the gift and power of God, and has been the means of publishing declaring it on two continents, has sent the fullness of the everlasting gospel, which it contained, to the four quarters of the earth, has brought forth the revelations and commandments which compose this book of Doctrine and Covenants, and many other wise documents and instructions for the benefit of the children of men, gathered many thousands of the Latter-day Saints, founded a great city, and left fame and a name that cannot be slain. He lived great, and he died great in the eyes of God, and his people, and like most of the Lord's anointed in ancient times, he has sealed his mission and his work with his own blood. And so has his brother Hiram. In life they were not divided, and in death they were not separated. In the days that these things are finally seen and considered by the kings of the earth, Joseph Smith will be vindicated, his reputation healed. Christ continues his discourse. Therefore, it shall come to pass that whosoever will not believe in my words, who am Jesus Christ, which the Father shall cause him, referring to Joseph Smith his servant, to bring forth unto the Gentiles, and shall give unto him, Joseph Smith, power that he shall bring them forth unto the Gentiles. It shall be done even as Moses said, they shall be cut off from among my people who are of the covenant. 
and my people who are a remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles, yea, in the midst of them, as a lion amongst the beasts of the forest, a young lion amongst the flocks of sheep, who, if he goeth through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Their hand shall be lifted up upon their adversaries, and all their enemies shall be cut off. Yea, woe unto the Gentiles, the world, except they repent, for it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Father, that I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee, and I will destroy thy chariots, and I will cut off thy cities of thy land, and will throw down all thy strongholds, and I will cut off the witchcrafts out of the land. Note, the Lord is quoting Micah chapter 5 from the Old Testament here. The term witchcraft is translated from the Greek word pharmakeia, the root term for pharmaceuticals. Thus, witchcraft should be associated with the illicit drug trade. This verse closely mirrors the destruction previously seen on the American continent. We continue. And thou shalt have no more soothsayers. Thy graven images I also will cut off, and thy standing images out of the midst of thee, and thou shalt no more worship the workmanship of thy hands, and I will pluck up thy groves out of the midst of thee, so will I destroy thy cities. And it shall come to pass that all lyings and deceivings and envyings and strifes and priestcrafts and whoredoms shall be done away. For it shall come to pass, saith the Father, that at that day whosoever will not repent and come unto my beloved Son, them will I cut off from among my people. O house of Israel, and I will execute vengeance and fury upon them, even as upon the heathen, such as they have not heard. The fulfillment of the Lord's covenants to Israel, to gather all twelve tribes, is followed by breathtaking destruction at the hands of the remnant of Jacob. Such destruction as the Gentiles have not heard. The destruction that happened preceding the Lord's coming to the Nephites was truly awe-inspiring, and in a similar manner, unheard of. A prophecy of such widespread destruction might elicit feelings of great anxiety and despair. But those who have put their faith in the Mighty One of Jacob need not fear. God is merciful, giving the wicked abundant opportunities to repent. For in his own words, God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Christ continues along the same vein. But if they will repent and hearken unto my words, and harden not their hearts, I will establish my church among them, the repentant Gentiles, and they shall come in unto the covenant, and be numbered among this the remnant of Jacob, unto whom I have given this land for their inheritance. Both Jerusalem and Zion will be open to all the house of Israel. And they, the repentant Gentiles, shall assist my people, the remnant of Jacob, and also as many of the house of Israel as shall come, that they may build a city, which shall be called the New Jerusalem. The building of the New Jerusalem is a precursor to the second coming, and will be built after the remnant of Jacob returns to America. And then shall they assist my people, that they may be gathered in, who are scattered upon the face of all the land, in unto the new Jerusalem. This is the last great missionary effort of which we have already spoken. And then shall the power of heaven come down among them, and I will be in their midst. In the above section, Christ offers hope to all of us. If we will repent, this mighty host comprising the remnant of Jacob will be welcomed with open arms. These verses tie back to the vision of Nephi. Reconsider what Nephi described in the following verse. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God, that it descended upon the saints of the church of the Lamb, and upon the covenant people of the Lord, who were scattered upon all the face of the earth, and they were armed with righteousness and with power of God in great glory. Together these verses provide a complete picture. The repentant saints of God will be endowed with power alongside the remnant of Jacob. At this time, wherever the ungathered of Israel are upon the face of the earth, 
the Spirit will move upon them with great power. We can assume that missionary work will accelerate to breakneck speeds never before seen in our era. They will pour into America from all nations of the earth, thus fulfilling the following prophecy of Isaiah. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Together we will build Zion upon the American continent. Despite the wickedness and tribulation of those days, the brotherhood that will be felt among the Israelites and their adopted brethren gathering in America will be euphoric. For the righteous, these will be days of such wonder, happiness, and glory that words cannot express, nor can enter into the hearts of men the joy of those days. These are not days to be feared, but greatly and joyously anticipated. Not only will the remnant of Jacob return, but Enoch's great city also, with its hosts, will return among us in that day. Christ now returns to the timing of these events. And then shall the work of the Father commence at that day, the day when the previous two conditions have been met. The Gentiles learn via the Book of Mormon regarding both Manasseh and the remnant of Jacob. Even when this gospel shall be preached among the remnant of this people, referring to Manasseh, Verily I say unto you, At that day shall the work of the Father commence among all the dispersed of my people, yea, even the tribes which have been lost, which the Father hath led away out of Jerusalem. Yea, the work shall commence among all the dispersed of my people evidently including Enoch's people as well, with the Father to prepare the way whereby they may come unto me, that they may call on the Father in my name. Here the Lord clearly states that at the same time the gathering is taking place among Judah and Joseph, a similar work will be taking place among the lost ten tribes. According to the history of the church, on June 3, 1831, Joseph Smith prophesied that such was indeed the case. Consider the following. The Spirit of the Lord fell upon Joseph in an unusual manner, and he prophesied that John the Revelator was then among the ten tribes of Israel, who had been led away by Shalemanser, king of Assyria, to prepare them for their return from their long dispersion, to again possess the lands of their fathers. This is an amazing prophecy, but not a unique one. According to Mormon, who was ministered by the three Nephites firsthand, these three have a similar mission to John. Jesus Christ informed them of this fact. This should come as no surprise since all four of these have so much in common. Given Mormon's account, it would appear that these four will be intimately involved with the remnant of Jacob and the marvelous work and a wonder that will be associated with their return. Consider the following regarding when the three Nephites were called by the Savior. And he said unto them, Behold, I know your thoughts, and ye have desired the thing which John, my beloved, who was with me in my ministry before I was lifted up by the Jews, desired of me. Therefore, ye shall never taste of death, but ye shall live to behold all the doings of the Father unto the children of men, even until all things shall be fulfilled according to the will of the Father when I shall come in my glory with the powers of heaven. The Lord mentions John the Beloved to the three Nephites at the time he grants them the same thing that he granted to John. It is therefore only reasonable to assume that since they have the same calling, they will work together to accomplish the same wondrous end. Mormon then provides the following insight that is relevant to our present discussion. Behold, I have seen them, the three Nephites, and they have ministered unto me, and behold, they will be among the Gentiles, and the Gentiles shall know them not, and they will also be among the Jews, and the Jews shall know them not. And it shall come to pass that the Lord shall see fit in his wisdom that they shall minister unto the scattered tribes of Israel. Therefore, great and marvelous work shall be brought by them, before the great and coming day, when all people must surely stand before the judgment seat of Christ, 
Yea, even among the Gentiles shall there be a great and marvelous work wrought by them before the judgment day. And if ye had all the scriptures which give an account of all the marvelous words of Christ, ye would, according to the words of Christ, know that these things must surely come. It is clear from Mormon's account that we do not have even the hundredth part of the marvelous words that Christ shared with the Nephites. There is a reason we do not have all of his words. After having what we do have for now almost 200 years, we are only now coming to realize what they mean. It is clear from the words that we do have that this marvelous work in a wonder has to do with both the remnant of Jacob and these four amazing servants of Jesus Christ. Who knows but that among the prophets that shall no longer stay themselves are counted these four. Regardless, as attested to once again, these coming events will be spectacular. Christ continues his discourse as follows. Yea, and then shall the work commence with the Father among all nations in preparing the way whereby his people may be gathered home to their land of inheritances. And they shall go out from all nations, and they shall not go out in haste, nor by flight, for I will go before them, saith the Father, and I will be their rearward. The word rearward refers to the rear part of an army positioned behind the main body for defense. Christ is stating that he will be their defender as they gather to Zion. This infers that the environment at the day will be hostile towards them. However, if God is with us, who can stand against us? Chapter 19, 3rd Nephi, 22 and 23. Throughout the different sections that we have covered up to this point, we have seen that there will be a purification process both in America and Israel. No unclean thing can dwell in the presence of God, and God will dwell among his people during the millennium. Therefore, people must either repent or be swept off the face of the land. We have seen that many will be lost during this great purge. However, as we have seen before, the remnant of Jacob will repopulate the decimated ranks of Israel. Here Christ quoted Isaiah in reference to Israel's repopulation after they have suffered so much at the hand of the Gentiles. And then shall that which is written come to pass. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Zechariah notes two-thirds of the Jewish population will be destroyed in that day. With the host of Jacob, the land will once again teem with Israelites. Thus the phrase, For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife. Christ continues, Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy youth and shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. For thy maker, thy husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. The remaining third will be sanctified, they will cling to the Lord. He will frankly forgive them. Their sinful past will be remembered no more. They will become a pure and righteous people, firm and immovable in keeping the commandments of God evermore. As the Lord promised to never again flood the earth after the days of Noah, so again the Lord promises that Israel will never again have cause to drink the dregs of the cup of trembling wrung out. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee, 
In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment. But with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. For this, the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I would not be wroth with thee. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. The above verses are a wonderful reminder that the trials and sufferings of this life are but a small blip when compared to the unfathomable depths of time. All suffering, so long as it turns one to the Lord, will have an end. But the everlasting kindness of the Father is as endless as his name. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, Behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, and lay thy foundations with sapphires, and I will make thy windows of agate, and thy gates of carbuncles, and thy borders of pleasant stones. The above verses refer to the building of the new Jerusalem, which will be built of most precious materials. Consider the following verses from Revelations describing the same. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardis, the seventh crystallite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth a chrysasperus, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. It is interesting to note that the stones from which the New Jerusalem will be constructed are the same stones that were embedded into the breastplate of the high priest in the days preceding the scattering of Israel. As noted in the above verses, John did not see a separate temple within the walls of the city. Instead, he noted that God the Father and Jesus Christ were the temple of it. Perhaps another way of saying this is that the whole city of the New Jerusalem is a temple, for the city itself will be the house of the Most High God, a place for the instruction of all. Thus, only the best of materials will be used in its construction, similar to our temples. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. In righteousness shall thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. Behold, they shall surely gather together against thee, not by me. Whosoever shall gather against thee shall fall for thy sake. The Lord finishes his unparalleled sermon on the latter-day gathering of Israel with a powerful statement regarding the remnant of Jacob. Ultimately, the Lord says it was he himself that would purify and purge Israel. The remnant of Jacob, like the Assyrians, Babylonians, Romans, Gentiles, and many others who were used to one degree or another as tools in his omnipotent hand to bring about the salvation of his covenant people. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire, and that brings forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the waster to destroy. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall revile against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. This brings us to the end of the Lord's marvelous sermon. It is my sincere hope that the power of Christ's message has resonated within your heart. There is no other sermon on record with such authority on this subject as this, spoken directly to us in our day by the Son of God. The ramifications of this marvelous sermon are as far-reaching as they are amazing. Upon concluding this message, 
that the Father commanded the Son to share, Christ reiterates the importance of his words in the following way. And now behold, I say unto you, that ye ought to search these things. Yea, a commandment I give unto you, that ye search these things diligently. For great are the words of Isaiah, and all things that he spake have been and shall be, even according to the words which he spake. Therefore give heed unto my words, write the things which I have told you, and according to the time of will of the Father, they shall go forth unto the Gentiles. Search the prophets, for many there be that testify of these things. Christ links his message to the message provided by the prophet Isaiah. I have done my best to lay out the message of that great prophet in an understandable format. It is now up to the reader to decide for himself the veracity and correlation of these accounts. After Christ concluded his message, he went on to quote additional prophets to the Nephites, including sharing with them the sealed portion of the Jaredite record. We have learned that the Jaredite record was had among them at that time, so it shall be had by us in the future. Of the other prophets the Lord quoted to the people, we know that Malachi was one. However, rather than discussing the meaning and purpose of those revelations in this section, we will address them in the next section of this work, as they were also specifically quoted to Joseph Smith by the angel Moroni. Chapter 20 Moroni Moroni is one of the greatest figures of the Restoration. He was a prophet, a warrior, a historian, and the symbol of the fullness of the restored gospel. Both the writers of the Old and New Testaments witnessed his mission. He was a stalwart prophet who would not deny the Christ, for the which he wandered in the wilderness alone, protecting the record that now bears his father's name. He was a witness to the fulfillment of the Lord's covenants with the children of Israel, having borne witness of the destruction of his people as a result of their not keeping those covenants. He bore latter-day testimony to the prophet Joseph Smith that the Lord was shortly to fulfill those covenants. It is evident by the writings of Moroni that he knew much regarding the gathering of Israel and the happenings among the Gentiles in the latter days. Behold, I speak unto you as if ye were present, and ye are not. But behold, Jesus Christ has shown you unto me, and I know your doing. Not only did Moroni see our day, he was intimately familiar with the greatest prophecies ever to be written by the hands of man. His testimony confirms that like Nephi, he was shown the same revelation that John the Revelator saw. He bore record of it and its tremendous importance to the Gentiles. Consider the following. Come unto me, O ye Gentiles, and I will show unto you the greater things, the knowledge which is hid up because of unbelief. Come unto me, O ye house of Israel, and it shall be made manifest unto you how great the things the Father hath laid up for you from the foundations of the world, and it hath not come unto you because of unbelief. Behold, when ye shall rend that veil of unbelief, which doth cause you to remain in your awful state of wickedness and hardness of heart and blindness of mind, then shall the great and marvelous things which have been hid up from the foundations of the world from you, yea, when ye shall call upon the Father in my name, with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, then shall ye know that the Father hath remembered the covenant which he hath made unto your fathers." O house of Israel. And then shall my revelation, which I have caused to be written by my servant John, be unfolded in the eyes of all the people. Remember, when ye see these things, ye shall know that the time is at hand, that they shall be made manifest in very deed. Therefore, when ye shall receive this record, ye may know that the work of the Father has commenced upon all the face of the land. Therefore, Repent, all ye ends of the earth, and come unto me, and believe in my gospel, and be baptized in my name. For he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned, and signs shall follow them that believe in my name. 
What an extremely powerful admonition. Moroni knew, just as well as any other prophet ever did that lived regarding these prophecies of the last days. His words were powerful, and so was his message. Apart from being familiar with the revelations of John, he was familiar with the revelations of the brother of Jared. Behold, I have written upon these plates the very things which the brother of Jared saw, and there never were greater things made manifest than those which were made manifest unto the brother of Jared. Wherefore, the Lord hath commanded me to write them, and I have written them. And he commanded me that I should seal them up, and he hath also commanded me that I should seal up the interpretation thereof. Wherefore, I have sealed up the interpreters according to the commandment of the Lord. For the Lord said unto me, They shall not go forth unto the Gentiles until the day that they shall repent of their iniquity and become clean before the Lord. I am fascinated by a brief account that Moroni provided us in the book of Ether regarding the latter days. While it is brief, it validates much of what is written in this book. Consider the following account. And Ether spake also concerning the house of Israel, and the Jerusalem from whence Lehi should come. And after it should be destroyed, it should be built up again, a holy city unto the Lord. Wherefore, it could not be a new Jerusalem, for it had been in a time of old, and it should be built up again, and become a holy city of the Lord, and it should be built up unto the house of Israel. And that a new Jerusalem should be built up upon this land, unto the remnant of the seed of Joseph. Note the usage of the definitive article, the, here signifying both Ephraim and Manasseh. For which things there has been a type. For as Joseph brought his father down into the land of Egypt, even so he died there. Wherefore, the Lord brought a remnant of the seed of Joseph, note the usage of the indefinite article A here, signifying this remnant is made up only of a subgroup, out of the land of Jerusalem, that he might be merciful unto the seed of Joseph, that they should not perish, even as he was merciful unto the father of Joseph that he should not perish. Wherefore, the remnant of the house of Joseph, both Ephraim and Manasseh, shall be built upon this land, and it shall be a land of their inheritance, and they shall build up a holy city, the new Jerusalem, unto the Lord, like unto the Jerusalem of old, and they shall no more be confounded, till the end come, when the earth shall pass away, and blessed are they who dwell therein, for it is they whose garments are white through the blood of the Lamb, and they are they who are numbered among the remnant of the seed of Joseph, who were of the house of Israel. And then also cometh the Jerusalem of old, and the inhabitants thereof, the Jews, blessed are they, for they have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, and they are they who were scattered and gathered in from the four quarters of the earth, and from the north countries and are partakers of the fulfilling of the covenant which God made with their father Abraham. And I was about to write more, but I am forbidden. In this brief but wonderful account, Moroni sees the whole house of Israel. He saw Manasseh come to America from Jerusalem of old. He saw Ephraim in America at the time of the building of the new Jerusalem upon this land. And he saw the Jews in Jerusalem. He also saw all the remnants of the tribes that were scattered to the four quarters of the earth. And lastly, he saw the remnant of Jacob, those that came from the north countries in a body. It is interesting that he, like Nephi, was constrained by the Spirit to not elaborate more. Given what both Nephi and Moroni saw regarding the day of the Gentiles, it should not be too surprising that they closed their records in such a similar way. Let's consider both. This is how Nephi closed his record. I also have charity for the Gentiles, but behold, for none of these can I hope except they shall be reconciled unto Christ and enter into the narrow gate and walk in the straight path which leads to life and continue in the path until the end of the day of probation. And if these are not the words of Christ, judge ye. 
For Christ will show unto you with great power and glory that they are his words at the last day. And you and I shall stand face to face before his bar, and ye shall know that I have been commanded of him to write these things, notwithstanding my weakness. And now, my beloved brethren, all those who are of the house of Israel, and all ye ends of the earth, I speak unto you as the voice of one crying from the dust, Farewell, until that last great day shall come. And you that will not partake of the goodness of God, and respect the words of the Jews, and also my words, and the words which shall proceed forth out of the mouth of the Lamb of God, behold, I bid you an everlasting farewell, for these words shall condemn you at the last day. For what I seal on earth shall be brought against you at the judgment bar. For thus hath the Lord commanded me, and I must obey. Amen. Now consider how Moroni closed his writing in ether, which he thought would be his final words. And it came to pass that I prayed unto the Lord that he would give unto the Gentiles grace, that they might have charity. And it came to pass that the Lord said unto me, If they have not charity, it mattereth not unto thee. Thou hast been faithful. Wherefore, thy garment shall be made clean. And because thou hast seen thy weakness, thou shalt be made strong, even unto the sitting down in the place which I have prepared in the mansions of my father. And now I, Moroni, bid farewell unto the Gentiles, yea, and also unto my brethren whom I love, until we shall meet before the judgment seat of Christ, where all men shall know that my garments are not spotted with your blood. And then shall ye know that I have seen Jesus, and that he hath talked with me face to face, and that he told me in plain humility, even as a man telleth another in mine own language concerning these things. And only a few I have written because of my weakness. And now I would commend you to seek this Jesus, of whom the prophets and apostles have written, that the grace of God the Father, and also the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost, which beareth record of them, may be and abide in you forever. Amen. After having witnessed the great and terrible calamities of the latter days, both of these good men show great concern that the Gentiles become charitable. This is a critical observation and should be considered very carefully by the reader. Both witness to having known the Savior and witness that their message was given to them by the very God of Israel. Both warn us that we will meet them again at the judgment bar of God, where their testimony will have either helped us or condemned us. Both are sobering farewells and are witnesses to the severity of the events that await us in the latter days. Moroni's account differs from the other accounts in that he provides a significant portion of it as a resurrected being. Moroni's message to Joseph Smith is both miraculous and sobering. Of its importance to us, we can have no doubt. Moroni recounted it verbatim no less than four times. Of all Moroni's visitations to the prophet, it is the only one with which we have much detail. Moroni touches on all the themes we have hitherto covered and adds invaluable insights into the messages we have gleaned from Nephi, Isaiah, and Jesus Christ. The latter-day restoration of the great and terrible day of the Lord and the remnant of Jacob are the common themes that weave these accounts together. I hope that you will thoughtfully consider the message Moroni was commanded to share with the boy prophet Joseph Smith, for he was talking to the world every bit as much as he was talking to him. Chapter 21 Moroni and Malachi It is interesting to contemplate the role that the inquiring of the Lord has played in the Restoration. The long-foretold mission of the prophet Joseph Smith began only after a simple question was asked on bended knee. Likewise, would Nephi have ever received such a glorious vision had he not inquired of the Lord? A few years after Joseph's vision of God the Father and his Son Jesus Christ, he found his mind being weighed down with yet another question. 
Joseph, like many of us, felt a deep and abiding concern for the welfare of his soul. Upon a period of self-reflection, he felt there were aspects of his life that were not in accordance with the glorious visitation he had received a few years prior. As such, he retired to his room on the 21st of September, 1823. There, in a shared bedroom, he bowed his head in supplication to the God who knew his name. He asked for forgiveness. Consider the following account in Joseph's own words. I had retired to my bed for the night. I betook myself to prayer and supplication to Almighty God for forgiveness of all my sins and follies, and also for a manifestation to me that I might know of my state and standing before Him. For I had full confidence in obtaining a divine manifestation, as I previously had had one. While I was thus in the act of calling upon God, I discovered a light appearing in my room which continued to increase until the room was lighter than at noonday, when immediately a personage appeared at my bedside, standing in the air, for his feet did not touch the floor. The manner in which the angel introduced himself was not casual. The wording was deliberate and a fulfillment of long-foretold prophecy. The angel introduces himself as a messenger sent from the presence of God. He then told Joseph his name was Moroni. This was, of course, the son of Mormon, the chief architect of the record that would bear his name. Approximately 1,400 years prior, Moroni deposited that record underneath a large stone not more than a few miles from the boy's home, in which he now appeared as a resurrected being. There are very few first-hand descriptions of resurrected beings available to us. Joseph provides an amazing account of this messenger of the Lord. He had on a loose robe of most exquisite whiteness. It was a whiteness beyond anything earthly I had ever seen, nor do I believe that anything earthly could be made to appear so exceedingly white and brilliant. His hands were naked, and his arms also a little above the wrist. So also were his feet naked and were his legs a little above the ankles. His head and neck were also bare. I could discover that he had no other clothing on but this robe, as it was open so that I could see into his bosom. Not only was his robe exceedingly white, but his whole person was glorious beyond description, and his countenance truly like lightning. The room was exceedingly light, but not so very bright as immediately around his person. As we have noted previously, Moroni told the young Joseph that all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people would mar his name and reputation. How strange this must have been for a young boy, technologically and economically confined to a limited geographical footprint as he was, to contemplate the possibility of such infamy. Nor could he have imagined at that time the terrible cost such slander would bring. It would cause him and his older brother Hiram, who likely slept quietly at his side, to bleed out their lives at the hands of a blackened mob. It would be the impetus that would drive thousands and thousands of converts from their possessions, their homes, and their country. Moroni told the young boy of the record that he and his father had compiled and protected. The record that would give a whispered voice to the tens of millions who had lived their lives in rebellion and now slept in the dust. A record whose coming forth was a sign that the father had already begun the work of gathering Israel once again. Was there any way Joseph could have felt the magnitude of this moment? This was the moment Malachi had long foretold, and that countless hosts in the spirit world had anxiously waited for for thousands of years, the dispensation of the fullness of times. After Moroni had described to Joseph the record that would be his privilege to translate, the angel explained to him, Moroni accomplished this by expounding upon the prophecies of both Old and New Testaments. Joseph Smith said that Moroni began his explanation with the prophecies of Malachi, 
as contained in the third and fourth chapters of that book. These were the exact same prophecies that Jesus Christ also quoted verbatim to the Nephites right after his magnificent discourse found in the previous section of this work. Therefore, there can be no doubt that these chapters from Malachi relate to the message the Father sent his Son to share. Therefore, their meaning is one of great importance and relevance. We will begin our examination of Moroni's message with these two chapters. Moroni quoted Malachi as follows, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. A messenger is defined as a person who carries a message or goes on an errand for another. Moroni announced to Joseph that he was a messenger sent from the presence of God. I believe that Moroni's visit to Joseph Smith's bedroom was a literal fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy. It should also be noted that for clarification purposes, I removed the following line from the above verse, And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. It is interesting to note that most Latter-day temples are crowned with a golden statue of the Lord's messenger, Moroni. Malachi continues, But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when the Lord appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like a fuller soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver. That they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old and as the former years. Malachi begins by asking an open-ended question, Who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? The answer to Malachi's question is given next, Those that withstand the refiner's fire and the cleansing of the fuller soap. The symbolism of the refiner's fire is clear. The reference to fuller soap is similar. Fuller soap is a harsh alkaline chemical used for cleansing wool. It is symbolic of the Lord's ability to cleanse his people. The process may seem harsh at the time, but the end result is a product of much greater worth and beauty. The reference to the sons of Levi is, of course, referring to the purifying process that will take place among the house of Israel prior to the Lord's coming. Levi was the tribe of Israel who, rather than receiving an inheritance of land, was given the right to officiate in the temple. Therefore, this reference refers to the restoration of the fullness of the gospel among the house of Israel, which is not complete without the crowning blessings reserved for in the house of the Lord. In the latter days, the house of Israel will receive these crowning ordinances at the hands of the children of Ephraim. Consider the following verse. And the boundaries of the everlasting hills shall tremble at their presence, the remnant of Jacob's. And there they shall fall down and be crowned with glory, even in Zion, by the hands of the servant of the Lord, even the children of Ephraim. And they shall be filled with songs of everlasting joy. Behold, this is the blessing of the everlasting God upon the tribes of Israel, and the richer blessing upon the heads of Ephraim and his fellows. And they also of the tribe of Judah, after their pain, shall be sanctified in holiness before the Lord, to dwell in his presence day and night, for ever and ever. In the above verses, Malachi has identified those that will abide the day of the Lord's coming. He then focuses on on those that will not abide the day. And I will come near to you in judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, and against the adulterers, and against the false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right. And fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. Malachi's warnings sound similar to Isaiah's warnings to those that grind upon the face of the poor. The common denominator behind all these groups of people is greed 
and selfishness. It is the natural man that allows the children of God to trample over each other in their race to accumulate wealth, power, and position, all of which, to their great dismay, will be left behind upon their deaths. By putting the insatiable lusts of the flesh before the needs of the destitute, will condemn themselves before God and man. We need not look to the shadowy back rooms of evil and conspiring men to find these characteristics when they are readily found in the family rooms of our own houses. Is there a difference between the spirit possessing such evil and conspiring men as a poor person who consumes their family's resources on vain commodities for themselves while their children suffer and want? What about the wealthy person that spends their time pursuing their own interests and pleasure at the expense of their spouse and family? Is it not a difference in scope and means rather than of spirit? Selfishness is the great antichrist. My needs are more important than your needs. Christ yielded his will to the will of the Father in all things. We must learn to do the same if we want to abide the day. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob, those that put the will of the Father before their own, are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers ye are gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. In other words, they did their own will rather than the Father's. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. The law of tithes and offerings is not about money. It is about putting God first and foremost in your life. Will you put off the natural man, or will you put off God? If God commands you to return 10% of your increase to Him, will you do it? If He commands you to fast once a month and provide a fast offering to the poor, will it be done? The Lord's law of tithes and offerings, properly lived, is a stepping stone to enable the disciple of Christ to seek the kingdom of God first, rather than himself. The reader of these verses too often looks at the promised blessings of obedience in too narrow a scope. If we pay our tithing in this life, are we to expect to abound with physical abundance here and now? What are we to understand from the windows of heaven opening up and showering out a blessing upon our heads until we have no more room to receive it? Our God is not as short-sighted as we are. Put the kingdom of God first and foremost in your life, and then have Job-like trust in God. If he will bless you abundantly in this life, then praise his holy name and consecrate your gain to him. If he chooses to store your temporal treasures in heaven, rather than on earth. Trust him. He above all has your best interest at heart. Would you rather receive the vast treasuries the Father has in this life, which passes in the blink of an eye, or the next, which lasts forever, worlds without end? Regardless of the timing of God's great outpouring, the outpouring will come. Consider the following verse from the New Testament. I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Malachi continues, noting a blessing of particular worth. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, For ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. When Malachi teaches of the Lord rebuking the devourer for our sakes, I understand it on two levels. The first is a spiritual sense. For those that put the kingdom of God first in their lives, 
Satan will be rebuked for their sake. His efforts to destroy them and their families will shatter upon the shield and protection the Lord will provide. Their temporal needs will be met, albeit not necessarily their wants. The second meaning of this verse applies to those that will be called upon to abide the great day of the Lord and His coming. This meaning should be taken literally. The devourer spoken of in this instance is the mighty remnant of Jacob. This will become more apparent as we get further into Moroni's message to Joseph Smith. The delightsome land is the land of Zion, which in those days will be the only refuge in a sea of violent conflict. Consider the following verse from Doctrine and Covenants for clarification. And the remnant shall be gathered unto this place, America, and it shall come to pass among the wicked that every man that will not take up his sword against his neighbor must needs flee to Zion for safety. And the glory of God shall be there, and the terror of the Lord shall be there, the remnant of Jacob insomuch that the wicked will not come to it, and it shall be called Zion, and there shall be gathered unto it out of every nation under heaven, and it shall be the only people that shall not be at war one with another. And it shall be said among the wicked, Let us not go up to battle against Zion, for the inhabitants of Zion are terrible, wherefore we cannot stand. During the time of this great conflict, the remnant shall devour the wicked, the righteous shall be gathered into Zion. All nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land. The Lord knows that the days of our mortal probation will not always be enjoyable for the righteous. In fact, the more ripened the world becomes in its iniquity, the harder it will be for the righteous. In these last days, Satan will wear out many of the saints. It will also appear to the righteous that the world has been turned upside down and that the Lord has abandoned them. The Lord acknowledges this fact through Malachi. Your words, those that have waited upon the Lord, have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, What have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinances, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. The righteous will grow weary in their sufferings. They will see the wicked prospering, while their way will appear to be hedged at every turn. The world will prosper in its war against the saints for a season and some will not be able to abide it. But to those that put their trust in the Lord, come hell or high water, to these the following verses apply. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord, and that thought upon his holy name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them, as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Jewels, by their very nature, are more valuable than other elements. It takes tremendous and constant pressure to transform carbon, a common element, into a diamond, a rare and valuable variant of the same element. Although the two might start out identical, horrific pressures significantly enhance the value of one. In a similar way, the Lord will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Such will be the case in the day that the Lord makes of his people his jewels. Then the difference between those that served the Lord and those that served him not, will be as stark as that between the light from the sun and that from the stars. Moroni then began to quote chapter 4 from Malachi. But he made a minor but profound change in the first verse. This is how this verse appears in both the Old Testament and the Book of Mormon as Christ gave it to the Nephites. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, 
All that do do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. When Moroni quotes this same verse, he does it as follows. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall burn as stubble, for they that come shall burn them saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Moroni changed a key phrase from a passive tone to an active one, from the day that cometh shall burn them, to they that come shall burn them. Moroni's phrase gives us several things to consider. First, he refers to they, a plural pronoun indicating a group of people. Secondly, for identification purposes, in order to distinguish this group from all others, they are described as they that come. The general nature of that phrase indicates that their very coming is the identifying event by which they will be known. Therefore, their coming must needs be of an extraordinary nature for it to serve as the sole means of identification, such as when the Savior comes. Lastly, they come with a purpose, to destroy, specifically to burn with fire. The great and dreadful day of the Lord has long been associated with the wicked being consumed by fire. This host will be the means by which the destruction comes. Compare what Moroni related from Malachi to the words of Isaiah regarding the coming of the remnant of Jacob. They come from a far country. From the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them, and they shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed at one another, and their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Moroni, Malachi, and Isaiah are all referring to the same group, they that come. In the prior chapter, Malachi assured the righteous that the Lord would rebuke the devourer for your sakes, that he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. In the next section of this book, we will learn that John's vision of the coming remnant held a similar connection, that the righteous would not be destroyed, nor any green thing. Malachi again confirms that the Lord will preserve the righteous as the chapter continues. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall, and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in those days. saith the Lord of hosts, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. In these verses, Malachi has identified those that will be numbered among the righteous in that day. He starts out by identifying those that fear the Lord. The Bible Dictionary adds some valuable insight into what it means to fear the Lord. Consider the following. Care should be taken to distinguish between two different uses of this word. The fear of the Lord is frequently spoken of as part of man's duty. It is described as godly fear. In such passages, fear is equivalent to reverence, awe, worship, and is therefore an essential part of the attitude of mind in which we ought to stand towards the all-holy God. On the other hand, fear is spoken of something unworthy of a child of God, something that perfect love casteth out. The first effects of Adam's sin was that he was afraid. Sin destroys that feeling of confidence God's child should feel in a loving father and produces instead a feeling of shame and guilt. 
Ever since the fall, God has been teaching men not to fear, but with patience ask forgiveness in full confidence of receiving it. With this in mind, we know that Malachi is referring to the righteous as those who maintain an attitude of reverence, awe, and worship towards the Father. Malachi continues using some of the most beautiful symbolism recorded in the Old Testament. He says, For that those that fear the Lord, the Son of Righteousness, rather than the S-O-N of Righteousness, shall rise with healing in his wings. By capitalizing the word Son, S-U-N, we know that Malachi is linking the glowing orb to the Son of God. In both senses of the word, it is the sun that dispels the darkness of night. It is the sun around which our world revolves. The sun gives life, hope, warmth, and joy. This is not idle symbolism. For those days will be great and terrible, and to abide the day, our lives must revolve around the Son of God. Lastly, Malachi mentions the Ten Commandments, a reference to the fact that the righteous are to give the Lord more than just lip service. They should keep his commandments. This calls to mind the following insightful scripture from the New Testament. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into my kingdom, but he that doth the will of my Father which is in heaven. The last two verses that Moroni quotes to Joseph are regarding the latter-day mission of Elijah. Moroni changes the wording of both these verses from how they appear in Malachi. This is how the first verse reads in Malachi. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Compare this to Moroni's version of these same verses. Behold, I will reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Malachi's version of this verse is much more vague than Moroni's. Malachi simply states that the Lord will send Elijah the prophet, but provides no reason for the visit. Moroni's version clarifies that the reason for Elijah's visit is revealing or conferring the priesthood keys. The modification to the next verse is even more interesting. Consider the original to Moroni's version. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now Moroni's version. And he shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers, and the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. If it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. This is a fascinating alteration. Plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers. The children refers to the earth's latter-day inhabitants. The fathers refers to the house of Israel. The promises refer to the covenants that the Lord made with the house of Israel. These covenants have been reviewed in detail in an earlier section of this book. The term plant in the hearts of the children infers that the children will become aware of the great importance of the promises that were already made to their fathers. Therefore, Moroni's clarification of this verse to Joseph Smith was that before the great and terrible day, Elijah would do more than just turn the hearts of the fathers to the children in the reciprocal. Elijah would also cause an understanding of the promises that were made to the fathers to be known to the children. These children would then, with joyous anticipation, look for the day of their fulfillment, i.e., the literal gathering and restoration of the house of Israel. This concludes the analysis of Moroni's quotation of Malachi to the boy prophet Joseph Smith. Chapter 22, Moroni and Joel From Joseph Smith, we also know that Moroni quoted from the second chapter of Joel in the Old Testament. This chapter is directly associated with the chapters 
of the Malachi that we have previously reviewed. For purposes of context, we will review the entire chapter. Joel opens this chapter with a dire warning to Latter-day America. Consider the following. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and strong. There hath never been the like, neither shall be any more after it, even unto the years of many generations. Joel is warning of the coming of the mighty remnant of Jacob. He highlights the fact that nothing like their coming has ever occurred before. This is very similar to Joel's previous chapter, where he was speaking on the same subject. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, O ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. Clearly, the coming of this remnant will be the thing of legend. America has the most powerful military force on the planet. There is no other country that has weapon systems as advanced as our own. However, despite the unmatched military might of American armed forces, Joel clearly states that the world will have never seen such a host as the one that comes. Joel continues, A fire devoureth before them and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as a garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. This brings to mind Malachi and Moroni's warning, The proud, yea, and all they that do wickedly shall be burned as stubble, for they that come shall burn them. Joel continues, the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on tops of mountains shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array, before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. This last description sounds incredibly similar to that put forth by Isaiah as if they were both describing the same vision, just using their own words. Consider Isaiah's words. The noise of the multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of the nations gathered together. The Lord of the host mustereth the hosts of the battle. How will ye? For the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, Every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Joel continues with his horrifying description of the coming Magnificent host. Consider the following passage. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march every one on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. This last portion of Joel's prophecy brings to mind another of Isaiah's prophecies regarding the same group. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. It appears that the technology available among the remnant of Jacob will negate the military might that the world currently possesses. The casualties of friendly fire that plague even the most advanced of armies will not be an issue for the remnant of Jacob. They will neither break their ranks nor thrust each other through. When the host is confronted with the swords of their enemy, they suffer no injury. Literally, no weapon on earth will prosper against them. 
Joel continues, They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Notice how many signs typically associated with the second coming are linked to the arrival and activities of this mighty host. Earthquakes, heavens trembling, stars falling from the sky, and darkness. Joel continues, And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Joel clearly states here that this is the Lord's army doing the Lord's will. As John the Baptist was the Lord's forerunner when the Lord came to the earth in meekness and humility, so the remnant of Jacob will be his forerunner in the day that he comes in power and great glory. The prophet Jeremiah also spoke concerning the Lord's army. Consider the following witness from Lehi's contemporary. The portion of Jacob, the remnant of Jacob, is not like them, the vein of the earth. For he, the Lord, is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Thou art my battle axe and weapon of war, for with thee I will break in pieces the nations, and with thee I will destroy kingdoms. Having prophesied of the destruction that will fall upon the proud and the wicked, Joel calls the world at large to repent, but also the members of the church. The inward vessel must be cleansed, not just the outward parts. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even unto me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments. Turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will repent? and return and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. The above reference to fasting, weeping, mourning, and a broken heart are all signs of true humility and sincere repentance and are easily understood as such. The latter reference to a meat and drink offering may be less understood. To obtain the context of these offerings, we must look to the books of Moses. In them, the Lord commanded Israel to offer a meat and a drink offering once the Lord had delivered them into their land of promise. Consider the following passage. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the lands of your habitations, your promised land, which I give unto you, and will make an offering by fire unto the Lord. Then shall he that offereth his offering unto the Lord bring a meat offering of a tenth dill of flour, mingled with the fourth part of a hin of oil, and the fourth part of a hin of wine, for a drink offering shalt thou prepare, with the burnt offering or sacrifice of one lamb. The meat and drink offering were the Old Testament forerunners to the sacrament, as noted in the above verses, meat consists not of flesh, but of the ingredients for bread, flour, and oil. The flour and oil requirement, rather than actual bread, may be symbolic to the fact that the bread of life had yet to take physical embodiment. Christ had not yet been born and was a spirit person. The flour, oil, and wine, as well as the sacrifice of one lamb, were all symbols of Christ's atonement and are associated with the new covenant, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those who would participate in this covenant are those who would claim to be his disciples. It is to them that Joel is speaking. He now continues. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, 
gather the children. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to a reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is thy God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. The above references are clear indications of the chastising that the Lord will do with his people. Solemn assemblies, elders, fasts, these are all terms Latter-day Saints are very familiar with. These verses are reminiscent of those we have heard before from the Doctrine and Covenants. Reconsider the following. Behold, vengeance cometh speedily upon the inhabitants of the earth, a day of wrath, a day of burning, a day of desolation, of weeping, of mourning, and of lamentation. And as a whirlwind it shall come upon all the face of the earth, saith the Lord. And upon my house shall it begin, and from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord. First among those among you, saith the Lord, who have professed to know my name, and have not known me, and have blasphemed against me in the midst of my house. After the remnant of Jacob has come to the everlasting hills in America, the Lord's church and the Lord's land will have been purified. Zion can then be truly established for the first time since Enoch City was taken from the earth. The Lord will then send his army to the rest of the world, ultimately liberating the Jews. Consider the following verse as Joel continues. But I will remove far off from you the northern army. The remnant of Jacob is associated with the lands of the north and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face towards the East Sea. The rest of the world is to the east of America, and his hinder part towards the utmost sea. The utmost sea is in the west. Thus, the army will move from west to east. And his stink shall come up, just as you can smell a carcass before you can ever see it. The report and fear of this army shall precede it as a stench does a carcass. And his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, America. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. The day of the Lord is referred to as being great and terrible. It will be a great day because of the scope, magnitude, and resulting Zion that the Lord will cause to be brought to pass at the hands of his army. It will be a terrible day because of the unimaginable destruction and death that will be wrought upon the proud and the wicked. As Christ described to his apostles regarding the same period, and except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved, but... For the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Once America is purified, the rest of the world will descend into war and bloodshed. But the Lord will open the windows of heaven upon America, and his blessing will flow out upon its hallowed shores. All that was lost will be abundantly restored. Joel continues, be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month, and the floors shall be full of wheat and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, and the cankerworm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, 
and my great army which I sent among you. The aforementioned references to insect infestations are references to the damage that will be done by the remnant of Jacob. And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that he hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. The above verses describe the temporal blessings that will be poured out upon the heads of the righteous after the days of purification. These blessings are reminiscent of those promised to them that pay their tithes and offerings, for whom the Lord rebukes the devourer for their sakes. According to modern revelation, at least some of these blessings will be brought to the righteous from the remnant of Jacob, as noted in the Doctrine and Covenants, and they shall bring forth their rich treasures unto the children of Ephraim, my servants. Apart from the temporal blessings that will be poured out upon Ephraim, the Lord will shower down spiritual blessings without measure. Consider the following, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and old men shall see dreams, your younger men shall see visions, and upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. The Lord will pour out a portion of his spirit upon his people such as was had on the day of Pentecost. This will not be a fleeting experience, lasting hours or days, but such will become the status quo in Zion. Joel, having shown how these things will be in the end, returns to the signs preceding these events, so that we might discern when these days are drawing near. Consider the following verses. And I will show wonders in heaven, and in the earth blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. As the Lord hath said, and in the remnant who the Lord shall call. It is interesting to note that the General Conference of the Church held the month following the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center. President Hinckley pronounced the fulfillment of the above verses. Anyone who recalls the events of those days can certainly understand the parallels between the burning and collapsing of the Twin Towers and the pillars of smoke foreseen by Joel. The great rolling clouds of debris blocked out the sun and covered the city in darkness. That is not to say that this prophecy will not be fulfilled again and again in the days and years to come. However, if you are checking off boxes, according to a Latter-day Prophet of the Lord, this box has been checked. This passage concludes the chapter of Joel that Moroni quoted to Joseph Smith. Rather than covering a sweeping vision over a lengthy period of time, as seen by Isaiah, Joel's vision is laser-focused on the events of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Joel described the unstoppable force of the remnant of Jacob moving through America. He described the purification process and how the church must humble itself and center itself upon Christ, as symbolized by the bread, wine, and lamb offering that were to be made by the children of Israel when they were to finally gather into their land of promise. Lastly, he discussed the Pentecostal outpouring of the Spirit of God upon the saints during the millennium. The consistency of Joel's message with that of the other sections and chapters should be cause for serious consideration. We have been both warned and forewarned regarding these events, not by one lone testimony, but by many corroborating testimonies. Ponder on the significance of these things. Chapter 23, Moroni and Isaiah. According to Joseph Smith, Moroni also quoted the 11th chapter of Isaiah in its entirety, stating that it was about to be fulfilled. 
This chapter is short. It's only 16 verses. We have now seen that Isaiah's words have been a focal point for Nephi, Christ, and Moroni's Latter-day discussions. Portions of this chapter have already been discussed at length in the Isaiah section and will not be discussed to the same degree here. As such, you can refer to chapter 13 titled, Powerful Latter-day Leadership. The context of the whole chapter is, however, very insightful. The chapter begins as follows. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow up out of his roots. Isaiah is using the metaphor of a plant to describe four Latter-day leaders. The first three leaders, the rod, the branch, and the roots, are all affiliated with the last, the original stem. I therefore believe that all of these leaders have missions related to the return of the remnant of Jacob. Previously, we learned that the stem of Jesse is the Lord Jesus Christ. The three affiliated leaders that are grouped together in a transplanted cutting are the rod of Jesse, whom I believe will be a powerful military leader, a branch of Jesse, whom I believe will be a powerful leader by the name of David, who will rebuild the temple in Jerusalem and help to preserve the Jews in their time of greatest need. He will sit as their king. The root of Jesse, I believe that this is the Apostle John, whom is presently serving amongst the lost ten tribes, and was given the express mission to restore all things. Many plants can be reproduced from a cutting of the original. From these rods will grow roots and branches. This is the symbolism of Isaiah. Christ himself used similar symbolism in the which he likened himself again to the stem. Consider the following example. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned." In the above verses, Christ admonishes his apostles to abide in him, to draw upon his strength, and to become one with him and his Father. From the symbolism of Isaiah, we can rest assured that this is exactly what these three Latter-day leaders will do. Their strength will stem from Christ. They will do his will, as he did the will of the Father. Isaiah continues, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth." And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The traits noted above are characteristic of Christ, there is no doubt. But they are also characteristics that are shared by true disciples that abide in him. Thus, these leaders shall be enabled through the grace of Christ to have similar characteristics as Christ himself. Therefore, we can infer from these verses that all of these leaders will be humble, righteous, submissive to the will of the Father, and extremely powerful. Isaiah continues, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. 
They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. If Isaiah is using a metaphor of a vine with the aforementioned leaders, of which Christ is the original source, the fruit of this vine will be peace and harmony that's described in the above verses. However, as Christ mentioned above, the branches that do not abide in him are good for nothing but the flame. Therefore, before this fruit can be enjoyed by the husbandman of the vineyard, the vineyard must be purged. All branches that do not pull their strength from the true vine will be burned. Isaiah continues, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. As noted previously, I believe that the root of Jesse is John. John is the Elias who was sent to restore all things. He restored the priesthood keys to Joseph Smith. He, like Joseph Smith, received the keys from Moses and Elijah. And he will also restore the lost ten tribes of Israel, raising a new ensign to the nations of the earth. Isaiah continues, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria. The remnant of Jacob was left from Assyria. And from Egypt, and from Pathros, and from Cush, and from Elam, and from Shinar, and from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. These others are the scattered individual children of Israel who will need to be fished and hunted from the four corners of the earth. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, those that were cast out to the uttermost parts of heaven, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Note that while Joseph Smith did some of the things mentioned here, he did not gather those that were left from Assyria, the lost ten tribes. This is John's explicit task. Isaiah continues, The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. Before the diaspora, Ephraim tried to lead the northern kingdom and Syria in a war against Judah. The past days of contention and malice will be gone, and they will now be brothers in Christ. But they, Ephraim, shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines towards the west. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. This reference to Ephraim riding upon the shoulders of Philistines is a metaphor, and the potential source of the common phrase, standing on the shoulders of giants. Among the Philistines lived giants, extremely large men. According to the Bible, there were at least three groups of giants among the Philistines, the Anakims, the Emims, and the Zamzumims. These giants struck fear in the hearts of their enemies, Goliath of Gath was one such giant, at nine foot nine. King Og was described as being thirteen and a half feet tall, a man who by his sheer size was able to taunt and defy the armies of Israel. The metaphor is that the children of Ephraim will come with a similar force that likewise defies the armies of men. This is in reference to the remnant of Jacob coming to the children of Ephraim. Again, Isaiah speaks of them first in the west and then moving to the east, ultimately liberating their brothers, the Jews. But first, they will purge the Lord's vineyard, as has been spoken of repeatedly throughout the scriptures. Isaiah continues, And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with his mighty wind shall shake in his hand the rivers, and shall smite in the seven streams, and make men go over dry shod. And there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. 
Isaiah concludes this chapter with an explicit reference to the remarkable manner in which the remnant of Jacob will return. The reference to destroying the Egyptian sea and the crossing of men dry-shod over bodies of water is a dual reference. First, it signifies that the return of the remnant of Jacob will make men forget the comparative greatness of the mighty miracles wrought in the land of Egypt when the Lord delivered his children from slavery. Remember that the enemies of Israel were destroyed as part of this miraculous event. The prophet Jeremiah confirms this interpretation. Consider the following. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said that the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north. Secondly, it attests to similar miracles being wrought at the time the remnant returns. These miracles include the appearance of a highway out of the great deep upon which the remnant will return, as well as miracles involving controlling the elements similar to what was seen at the time the Red Sea was divided. The coming of the remnant of Jacob is therefore symbolic of the redemptions of the house of Israel. This concludes the chapter of Isaiah. In Joseph's own words, Moroni quoted the 11th chapter of Isaiah, saying that it was about to be fulfilled. Since Moroni's message, much of what has been recorded in Isaiah's chapter has been fulfilled. The gospel has been restored. An ensign to the nations has been raised. The Jews have been gathered, as has the house of Joseph. The portions of this prophecy that yet remain unfulfilled revolve around the remnant of Jacob whose coming is now eminent. Moroni continued by quoting the following verses from the third chapter of Acts, precisely as they stand in the New Testament. They are as follows. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. According to Joseph, Moroni followed these verses with this commentary. He said that the prophet was Christ, but the day had not yet come when they who would not hear his voice should be cut off from among the people, but soon would come. This is the same timing Moroni provided for the returning remnant spoken of in the chapter quoted by Isaiah. From what we have learned from other prophets, these people, who will not hear Christ's voice, will be cut off during the great and dreadful day of the Lord. It is wholly consistent with all previous teachings that we have reviewed regarding this subject. According to Joseph Smith, Moroni quoted many other passages of Scripture and offered many explanations which cannot be mentioned here, in Joseph's own words. Joseph Smith did not say why he could not mention any of these additional Scriptures, nor the explanations that Moroni offered, but it is clear that Nephi, John, and Moroni were also prohibited from disclosing too much. However, from the information that all of these have provided, we do certainly get the feel that there is a marvelous work and a wonder that is about to play out, and that the world at large will not only be unprepared, but completely shocked by it. These are not isolated voices in the dark. As Christ commanded, search the prophets, for many there be that testify of these things. As we have seen, Nephi, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, Joel, Malachi, Micah, Moses, Mormon, Moroni, John, Zenos, Jacob, Daniel, and numerous others have attested to these things. Heed the words of Christ, search the prophets, and listen to the guidance of the Holy Ghost. The thief in the night is at our doors. Chapter 24 John the Man for many, John's writings, known as the Book of Revelation, are a mystery. However, in 1843, Joseph Smith taught, the Book of Revelations is one of the plainest books God ever caused to be written. 
This is an unusual commentary on a book that is filled with such unusual symbolism. Furthermore, when Joseph Smith performed his translation of the Bible, he did not significantly alter it from its current form. Perhaps Joseph Smith's clarity of the book came because of his familiarity with the book's author. Joseph Smith met with John on multiple occasions. If knowing the book's author led Joseph Smith to better be able to understand the book of Revelations, perhaps if we endeavor to better understand John, the same will hold true for us. Each of the four previous sections that I have written all refer to John to one degree or another. Given that each reference was taken from the Book of Mormon, this fact becomes particularly interesting. Moroni wrote the following, Then shall ye know that the Father hath remembered the covenant which he made unto your fathers, O house of Israel. And then shall my revelation, which I have been caused to be written by my servant John, be unfolded in the eyes of all the people. Remember, when ye see these things, ye shall know that the time is at hand that they shall be manifest in very deed. The time for the manifestations of John to unfold in the eyes of all the people is now. As previously mentioned, to facilitate this study, we should begin with a very important question. Why John? Why was he the one to expound upon these things beyond the scope of all others? It's easier to understand why the others we have reviewed have written these things. Isaiah wrote these things because the northern kingdom of Israel was scattered in his day. Nephi wrote these things because his life was directly impacted by the destruction and scattering of Jerusalem. Christ wrote these things because he is the God of Israel. Moroni wrote and delivered his message regarding these things because he was a first-hand witness to the demise of the remnant of Joseph, and he would also be instrumental in the events of the Restoration. But why John? The answer to this question is found in the life and mission of this peculiar apostle. To accomplish this, I will briefly review three aspects of John's life. First, I will review John's relationship with the Savior during the Christ's ministry and their time together. Secondly, I will review John's authority and keys. Lastly, I will review John's mission. After we have considered these three aspects, the reasoning behind why John will be clear, as will the basis for understanding and interpreting many of his writings and prophecies. Christ and John a special relationship. The principle of foreordination teaches that certain people were called from before the foundations of the world for specific callings. For example, we know that the prophet Jeremiah was foreordained to this calling as a prophet to the nations. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth from the womb, I sanctified thee and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. If Jeremiah was foreordained, it was surely not happenstance that Peter, James, and John were born when and where they were. Their mission was foreordained to be in Christ's inner circle during his mortal ministry. They were prepared from the foundation of the world according to the foreknowledge of God, on account of their exceeding faith and good works. Their relationship with the Lord was cultivated over eons of time, their mortal ministry being a continuation of their pre-mortal relationship. John, in particular, was spiritually in tune. Right away, he recognized the power of God in the voice of John the Baptist. He devoted himself as one of the Baptist's disciples early on. Once the Baptist showed him the Christ, he followed after the Savior from that time forward. Not only that, Christ and John shared a bond that was very unique. From the New Testament, it is clear that the other apostles loved and reverenced the Lord. But with John, there was something more, something deeper. The Savior referred to John as my beloved. The other apostles referred to him as the disciple that Jesus loved. The term beloved is not casual in any respect. The Father's deep and abiding love for his only begotten Son 
was manifest to the world repeatedly by the use of my beloved son. Above all other titles, the father chose beloved to describe his son. Therefore, ponder the significance in the following passage in the which the Savior refers to John in like manner. And he said unto them, Behold, I know your thoughts, and ye have desired the thing which John, my beloved, who was with me in my ministry before that I was lifted up by the Jews, desired of me. In this verse, Christ is addressing the three Nephites. John is not present. But still, the Savior refers to him as his beloved. This attests to the love Christ feels for this very special apostle. Above all the titles one could receive from the Lord, is there any greater than this, a title denoting his great and abiding love for you? Christ and John's interactions together plainly demonstrated this unique relationship. During the Last Supper, John rested his head upon the Savior's chest. Such an act shows a great degree of closeness and comfort with the God of Israel. While others could not so much as hold the Savior's gaze, John was perfectly comfortable resting his head upon him as if the two were tiger cubs. Furthermore, despite the fact that the Savior had multiple siblings that could have taken care of his mother after his death, it was to his beloved friend John that Christ would entrust his mother. If we knew nothing else of their relationship, this one act alone would speak volumes regarding the Lord's affection for this man. John remained as close as he could to the Savior during the darkest hours of his ministry. He was present during the atonement in Gethsemane. He was at the trial. He would have witnessed his horrific scourging at the hands of the Romans. He very likely would have walked beside him or as close as possible during the arduous cross-laden journey to Calvary. He was present at his feet during the crucifixion. Throughout his horrible end, it was John alone of his apostles, his friends, that continually remained at his side. Upon the news of his resurrection, it was John that would be the first of the apostles to arrive at the empty tomb. As such, John's account of the Savior's final hours is far more detailed than the account of any other apostle. All of the other apostles are at the end of their accounts by the time they reach the Last Supper, but not John. His account is barely half completed by the time of the Last Supper. After the apostles had seen the resurrected Lord, Christ asks them if they loved him. Peter specifically, but who can doubt that the other apostles James and John were also present. Jesus told Peter that if he loved him, he would feed his sheep. He made this point very clear by stating it three consecutive times. After the Savior had thus emphasized the point, he asked Peter, James, and John what he could do for them. Peter and James both eagerly replied to the Lord that they wanted the Lord to hasten the time when they would be able to rejoin him in his kingdom. Christ granted unto them their desires. John's reply to the Savior's offer was quite different, though. It seems that the Savior's message of feeding his sheep had resonated with him on a deeper level. John's reply gives us a beautiful glimpse into his wonderful soul. And the Lord said unto me, John, my beloved, what desirest thou? For if ye ask what you will, it shall be granted unto you. And I said unto him, Lord, give unto me power over death, that I may live and bring souls unto thee. In other words, John asked that his life be extended that he might spend the rest of his days feeding the Savior's sheep. Given John's request came on the heels of the Savior's admonishment to Peter to demonstrate his love to him by feeding his sheep, can there be any doubt that John loved the Lord? Everything he was and is and has since become 
is a testament to his love. He consecrated all that he possessed or ever would have to the Lord's service, not just for one lifetime, but for the equivalent of many lives. I doubt John understood the full magnitude of what he was asking the Lord to do, but the Lord sure did. The Lord responded to his request as follows, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Because thou desirest this, thou shalt tarry until I come in my glory, and shalt prophesy before nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. Upon realizing that John had asked for something better than he had, the remarkable, albeit impetuous Peter, cried out to the Lord in objection, to which the Lord responded, Peter, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? For he desired of me that he might bring souls unto me, but thou desirest that thou might speedily come into my kingdom. I say unto thee, Peter, this was a good desire, but my beloved has desired that he might do more, or a greater work yet among the children than what he has done before. Yea, he has undertaken a greater work. Therefore I will make him as a flaming fire and a ministering angel. He shall minister for those who shall be heirs of salvation who dwell on the earth. And I will make thee, Peter, to minister for him and for thy brother James. And unto you three I will give this power and the keys of his ministry until I come. From this passage, we learn that while the mortal ministry of both Peter and James would and has come to an end, the work and ministry of John the Beloved continues, and he will continue holding those keys until the Savior comes again. Given what we understand regarding the priesthood keys and stewardship, this statement is profound. It also sheds light on the following statement of the angel to Nephi during his vision, which we discussed when we first started this book. Thou rememberest the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Behold, they are they who shall judge the twelve tribes of Israel. Wherefore, the twelve ministers of thy seed shall be judged of them, for ye are of the house of Israel. John's Authority and Keys From one of the passages above, we learned that Peter, James, and John received the keys of the ministry until the Lord returns to earth for his second coming. Of the three, John alone remains. He is the only mortal living today that received the priesthood and the keys of the kingdom directly from the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. Above all living men, Except the three Nephites, this is a unique characteristic of John the Beloved. All who hold priesthood in these latter days have received it through John. As such, it stands to reason that upon John's return, all existing priesthood keys will be subject to him. Even John the Baptist gave the Aaronic priesthood to Joseph and Oliver, under John the Beloved's direction. Consider the following verse from Latter-day Revelation. And also with Peter and James and John, whom I have sent unto you, by whom I have ordained you and confirmed you to be apostles and special witnesses of my name, and bear the keys of your ministry and of the same things which I revealed to them, unto whom, Peter, James, and John, I have committed the keys of my kingdom and a dispensation of the gospel for the last times, and for the fullness of times, in the which I will gather together in one all things, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. In these verses, Christ states that while the newly called Latter-day Apostles bear the keys of their ministry, the keys for the fullness of times and the gathering of all things in heaven and on earth, remain with John and his associates. When did John and his brethren receive these keys? Joseph Smith taught the following. The Savior, Moses, and Elijah gave the keys to Peter, James, and John on the mount when they were transfigured. We do not have a full account of what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. 
However, we do know that John received the priesthood and all corresponding keys that he would need to complete his mission. We also know that they were given instructions upon the mount regarding the ushering in of the millennial reign of the Lord, when the earth would itself be transfigured. Consider the following. He that endureth in faith and doeth my will, the same shall overcome, and shall receive an inheritance upon the earth, when the day of transfiguration shall come, when the earth shall be transfigured, even according to the pattern which was shown unto mine apostles on the mount of which the fullness of the account ye have not yet received. The individuals present on the Mount of Transfiguration would also visit Joseph Smith approximately 1,800 years later to give him similar keys. Once Joseph had received these keys, he was told the following, Therefore the keys of this dispensation are committed into your hands, and by this ye may know that the great and dreadful day of the Lord is near, even at the doors. John held all these keys prior to Joseph Smith, and still holds them today. From Joseph, and through the administration of John, Moses, and Elijah, our modern prophets, seers, and revelators hold all of the keys of this dispensation. Our leaders need these keys to attend to all aspects of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This includes the great work of standing as an ensign of truth and light to an increasingly hostile world, as well as the great missionary work, the fishing of men. John needs these keys so that he can fulfill his mission as entrusted to him by the Savior. Of all mortal men now living, John holds the greatest authority, and from the teachings of the temple, it would appear that such has been the case for a very long time. We will discuss his mission in detail next. John's Mission From what we have already reviewed, we know that John's mission was to span the period of time between Lord's initial coming and his second coming. We know that he has all the requisite authority and keys to carry out his mission, and that he received this authority from the Savior himself. Let us now explore in greater detail the revealed information we have regarding John's Latter-day role. Some vital information regarding John's great work comes to us from the revelations within his own writing. Consider the following portion from the book of Revelations. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me, and said, Go, and take the little book which is opened in the hand of the angel. And I went unto the angel, and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. It is clear from these verses that the book was meant especially for John, as he alone was to eat it, and is almost a word-for-word -word quote from what the Savior told John. Therefore, whatever was in this book, we can assume was to become part of what John would become. The Doctrine and Covenants provide some valuable insight into the meaning of this symbolic book. Question. What are we to understand by the little book which was eaten by John, as mentioned in the 10th chapter of Revelation? Answer. We are to understand that it was a mission and an ordinance for him to gather the tribes of Israel. Behold, this is Elias, who, as it is written, must come and restore all things. From this additional revelation, we learn unequivocally that the book represented a particular mission for John. He is the latter-day Elias. He must come and gather Israel and restore all things. We have seen that part of his latter-day mission was to restore the priesthood. This has been completed. The prophet Isaiah spoke of the second part of John's mission of that gathering. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, 
which shall stand for an ensign unto the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, and from Egypt, and from Pathros, and from Cush, and from Elam, and from Shinar, and from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. The tenth article of faith explicitly calls the return of the remnant of Jacob a restorative event. We believe in the literal gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the ten tribes. It will be part of John's mission to restore these lost tribes, which shall have left from Assyria long ago. After the remnant of Jacob has been restored, as in Elias, John will serve as the latter-day forerunner for his dearest friend, Jesus Christ, to prepare the world for his second coming. This will be done in large part by the purification of America and destroying large numbers of the wicked worldwide. After America is purged, John will restore Zion upon its shores. Zion has not been present in America in its fullness since the days of Enoch, more than 6,000 years ago. The restoration of Zion upon the earth will stand as a second Latter-day End Zion, and to it shall all the remaining scattered individuals of Israel be gathered. And the house of Joseph shall assist my people, the remnant of Jacob, and also as many of the house of Israel as shall come, and they shall build a city, which shall be called the New Jerusalem. And they shall assist my people, that they may be gathered in, who are scattered upon all the faces of the land, in unto the new Jerusalem. Once the new Jerusalem is built and Zion is restored to the earth again, John, with 144,000 missionaries, consisting of 12,000 men from every tribe of Israel, will go out into the earth as the hunters of Israel, hunting out any remaining Israelites that might be left scattered amongst the Gentile nations. The Jews, however, will be the last to be restored to the gospel, which restoration will not happen until after the second coming of Christ. Thus, fulfilling the oft-stated prophecy that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. All of these things comprise John's mission to restore all things, and as we have seen, is literally a page out of John's book. In a church conference held on June 3, 1831, Joseph Smith taught the saints that John the Revelator was then among the lost ten tribes of Israel to prepare them for the return from their long dispersion. John is still alive. He is anxiously engaged in the work the Lord has entrusted to him. Based on the words of the Lord, John must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. We will see John again, soon. This concludes my review of John the Man. With this information, we can now better answer and interpret the symbolism put forth in his record, as well as answer the question put forth at the beginning of this chapter, Why John? John wrote of these things because they are part of his personal ministry. He was called from the foundations of the earth to fulfill them. Therefore, who is better qualified than John to write about them? This perspective is required in order to understand the writings of this great man. Now, let us begin our review. Chapter 25 the Latter-day Plagues of Egypt John's revelations cover many things. It is not my intention to cover the entire scope of John's writings. I have already touched upon certain portions of John's works, such as the writings regarding the great and abominable organization of our day. The scope of this section will be to review the events associated with the seven angels of the seventh seal. In doing so, I feel it prudent to once again 
remind the reader that my thoughts, opinions, and insights make a very poor replacement for the Holy Ghost. While I will try to support my interpretations by as many scriptures as possible, it is the Holy Ghost that has been tasked to teach the truth of all things, not me. Therefore, continually seek the confirmation of the Holy Spirit before my own interpretations. Doing so, regardless of the accuracy of my interpretations, will make this a very beneficial exercise for you. My account begins with John beholding a special book in heaven with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, to loose the seven seals thereof. It should be obvious that the man found worthy to open this book is the Lamb of God. Thus the saying, Worthy is the Lamb. The title, Root of David, associated with the Savior, is a reference to Christ's mortal genealogy, which was through David. I, Jesus, have sent mine angels to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. We have two mortal genealogies for Christ, presumably one from Joseph and one from Mary. Joseph and Mary were cousins. Both genealogies show a direct line to Judah through Jesse. In this manner, the root of David differs from the root of Jesse. As we noted in the previous chapter, the root of Jesse is a descendant of both Jesse and Joseph of Egypt. The root of Jesse is John. The root of David is Christ. The reference to the lion of the tribe of Judah goes back to the lion on the standard of the camp of Judah. Returning to the book with the seven seals, the Doctrine and Covenants provides insights into its meaning. The first seal contains the things of the first thousand years, and the second also of the second thousand years, and so on until the seventh. Wherefore, the seals represent thousand-year periods of time and are meant to provide a contextual time frame for when the events of John's revelations will occur. In order to put things in context, we must first understand when the first thousand-year period began. The Bible Dictionary places the fall of Adam at 4000 BC. With this date as a general starting point, we can correlate each seal with a corresponding time period. The first seal, 4000 BC to 3000 BC. The second seal, 3000 BC to 2000 BC. The third seal, 2000 BC to 1000 BC. The fourth seal, 1000 BC to 1 BC. The fifth seal, 1 AD to 1000 AD. Sixth seal, 1000 AD to 2000 AD. Seventh seal, 2000 A.D. to 3000 A.D. We can validate this interpretation with the pivotal point upon which our calendar is based, the birth of Christ. According to this calendar, this takes place during the fifth seal. Therefore, we can assume that the ministry of Christ and his apostles likewise occurred during this period, as well as the apostasy and persecution of the Christians. Consider the description of the events from the fifth seal. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. The word of God was defined by John to be Jesus Christ, and for the testimony which they held. The vision of the fifth seal supports the time frame, having reference to the many martyrs who gave their lives for the belief on the Son of God during this time period. This section will focus on the events of the seventh seal. Based on the chronology of the events above, the seventh seal corresponds roughly with 2000 AD. I would note that our calendar is not precise. 
the splitting of time between B.C. and A.D. was done 525 years after the birth of the Savior, and is considered by many Bible scholars to be off by a couple of years. That being said, for purposes of this book, a couple of years makes little difference. This is how John saw the seventh seal open. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Of the seven seals John saw open, this is the only seal that opens with a corresponding delay of silence. There's obvious meaning to this reference. Orson Pratt said the following regarding this half-hour period, and he did so back in the 1800s. Whether the half-hour here spoken of is according to our reckoning, 30 minutes, or whether it be according to the reckoning of the Lord, we do not know. As I stated in the first chapter of this book, in retrospect all things become clear. As this seventh seal has now been opened for some time, we know that this reckoning was not after our time. Therefore, it must be after the Lord's. By John's own description, the time frame relates to the silence in heaven. Peter provided some interesting insight that links this period to the period of silence that John saw. Like John, Peter also saw our day and made the following prophetic statement. There shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the days of our fathers fallen asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. Peter's comments on the conditions of the last days are insightful. He infers that many will perceive that the timing for the events leading up to the second coming of the Lord will have been delayed. He then makes an interesting observation that heaven's time is calculated differently than earth's, namely, a thousand years for one day. According to the Lord's reckoning, 30 minutes equals 21 years, or 2021. Note, however, that John states that the silence in heaven lasted about a half an hour. This is not a definitive time period. 25 minutes is about a half an hour, as is 35 minutes. If we therefore apply Peter's explanation to John's revelation, a curious time frame appears, 2017 to 2021. If we were to take into consideration the potential calendar discrepancies of six years, the range would be even sooner. Either way, this is an eye-popping, heart-pounding time frame. Using the Lord's reckoning of time, this squarely points to the silence of heaven ending in our day, and I might add, during the administration of now President Trump. Please note, this timeline does not represent the timeline for the coming of the Lord. If anything, it represents the timeline for the silence in heaven ending. I wish to remind the reader of the definitive statement of the Lord regarding his coming. I, the Lord God, have spoken it, but the hour and the day no man knoweth, neither the angels in heaven, nor shall they know until he comes. The timing of the Lord's coming is entirely up to the Father. What then does the silence in heaven mean? I believe that the answer to this becomes obvious in John's writings and relates to a flurry of heavenly signs and wonders that begin in earnest after this silence has ended. After the period of silence, John beheld seven angels holding seven trumpets. These angels and trumpets are symbolic of the purification process that will precede the second coming, as is explained in the Doctrine and Covenants. Question. What are we to understand by the sounding of the trumpets mentioned in the 8th chapter of Revelation? Answer. We are to understand that as God made the world in six days, and on the seventh day he finished his work and sanctified it, and also formed man out of the dust of the earth, even so, in the beginning of the 7,000 years will the Lord sanctify the earth and complete the salvation of man, and the sounding of the trumpets of the seven angels are the preparing and finishing of his work. In the beginning of the seven thousand years, 
the preparing of the way before the time of his coming. As the earth was created over seven periods, so it will be sanctified by seven symbolic events associated with seven symbolic angels. These events will transpire within the beginning of the seventh seal, but after the silence in heaven has ended. These events will prepare the world for the second coming of the Lord. Before the seven angels sound their trumpets, another angel approaches a golden altar that is before the throne of God, holding a censer with smoke representing the prayers of the saints. The term golden altar appears six times in the Bible, four times in the Old Testament, and is always associated with either the tabernacle or Solomon's temple. Censers are likewise associated with the temple and were for burning incense. Temples and the altars of the temple in particular are where we make special covenants with the Lord. Therefore, in these verses we see both the symbolism of the covenants of Israel and the prayers of Israel both before the throne of God. Thus, John is showing us that the time has come where the conditions for the fulfilling of the Lord's covenants with Israel have been met. But behold, thus saith the Lord God, when the day cometh that they, Israel, shall believe in me, that I am Christ, then have I covenanted with their fathers that they shall be restored in the flesh upon the earth unto the lands of their inheritance. In other words, the events that John has seen in vision correspond to the timing of the Lord's fulfillment of his covenants with Israel. Note the curious wording, shall be restored in the flesh upon the earth. Therefore, consider the symbolic action of the angel. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. The angel takes the censer, the symbol of the prayers of the saints, and fills it with the fire of the altar, the symbol of the covenant the Lord has made to gather and restore the house of Israel from the utmost ends of heaven. Combined, these are sent from heaven to earth. Given the testimony found in previous accounts, this symbolism is clear. Consider the following clarifying passage from Mormon. And now behold, I say unto you, that when the Lord shall see fit in his wisdom, that these sayings shall come unto the Gentiles according to his word, then ye may know that the covenants which the Father hath made with the children of Israel concerning their restoration to the lands of their inheritance is already being fulfilled. After this acknowledgement, which correlates with the silence, ending in heaven. The first four of seven angels sound their trumps. Notice, there is no break between the events of these four angels. They are given one after another until all four have been accounted for. Consider the events that John associates with these angels and how their fulfillment certainly would constitute the breaking of heaven's silence regarding the wickedness of the earth's inhabitants. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died and the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third parts of the rivers, and upon the fountains of water, and the name of this star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, because many died of the waters, because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night was likewise. Apart from being terrifying, all of these events have many things in common. First, they are all associated with heaven. The hail falls from heaven. A burning mountain falls from heaven. A star falls from heaven, and the lights of heaven are dimmed. In other words, each of these events 
aptly demonstrates that the half an hour of silence in heaven has ended. These are signs and wonders, and their occurrence has been long foretold. Second, each of these events is associated with destruction. The hail destroys the trees and crops by fire and brute force. The fiery mountain and burning star both impact the water, killing fish and destroying property. The destruction on the earth darkens the naturally occurring light sources, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Third, each event is linked to the number three, or one-third. Preceding these events, the heavens were silent for 30 minutes. The destruction of all things is associated with a third of the total. The lights of heaven are cut to a third of their strength. The number three is symbolic. It is symbolic of redemption through great adversity. Jonah was in the belly of the well until the third day. Christ was in the grave until the third day. America was in darkness after the great destruction following Christ's death until the third day. Furthermore, consider the following scripture from the book of Hosea in the Old Testament. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Fourth, each of these events is associated with the plagues of the Egyptian exodus. When the Lord delivered Israel from its hard bondage, he used plagues. To demonstrate this unmistakable similarity, consider the following comparative descriptions of the plagues of Egypt. Hail mixed with fire destroys trees and crops. And Moses stretched forth his rod towards heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire rang along the ground, and Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt, and the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast, and the hailstones smote every herb of the field, and break every tree of the field. Water turns to blood, fish die, and men can't drink. Thus saith the Lord, In this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in mine hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood, and the fish that is in the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptian shall loathe to drink the water of the river, and the fish that was in the river died, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river, and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt." the lights of heaven are darkened. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand towards heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand towards the heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. In fact, as if to emphasize the comparison, John uses the term Egypt to denote wickedness in the same manner as the term Sodom and Gomorrah is used. John's comparison of these latter-day events to the Exodus is consistent with others who saw the same things roll out in the latter days. Consider the following passage from Isaiah. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian, he shall smite thee with a rod, and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. The similarities between Isaiah's prophetic statement and John's vision of events marrying the plagues of Egypt are not coincidental. Egypt was a type of things to come. Although, according to Jeremiah, these latter-day events would rival even the miracles of the Egyptian exodus. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country. Why is there such obvious symbolism between these latter-day events and those of the Egyptian exodus? I believe the answer is because both of these events accomplished the same thing, delivering captive Israel. 
the Exodus delivered Israel from physical captivity. In the last days, Israel will be delivered from spiritual bondage and oppression. Remember that Jacob also foresaw the day when Israel would be delivered from spiritual bondage. Fifth, all of these events are associated with John and the lost ten tribes. To demonstrate this fact, consider that whenever the term for is used in the book of Revelations, there tends to be a plausible correlation to the house of Israel. The above events are attributed to four angels, inferring that the events are related to the gathering of Israel. Consider how the following four examples help to develop this concept. All examples are taken from the book of Revelations. Four beasts. In the midst of the throne and around about the throne were four beasts full of eyes fore and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had the face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. There can be no mistaking the symbolism between these four beasts and the four camps of Israel. Each beast represents one of the images on the four standards of the four camps of Israel. And the references to the throne of God being in the midst of the beast calls to mind how Israel's ancient camps encircled the tabernacle of God. Next example, four horns of the golden altar. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. This has reference to the Ark of the Covenant that contained the covenant of Mount Horeb, the Ten Commandments, the Staff of Aaron, and a bowl of manna, all symbols of the Lord's dealing with the house of Israel. Next example. 144,000. And I learned the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty-four thousand of the tribes of the children of Israel. It is self-evident that the hundred and forty-four thousand is affiliated with Israel. Last example, four corners and four winds. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor any tree. The four angels, four corners of the earth, and the four winds are all associated with the scattering and gathering of Israel. Consider the following examples. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Another example. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. In each of these examples, the number four has a direct association with the house of Israel. The house of Israel itself was, of course, divided into four camps. As we have also noted, Isaiah and Jeremiah both associate Egypt with the return of the lost tribes of Israel. In addition, modern-day Revelation also links the Apostle John to the latter-day cursings of the water and the destruction previously noted as the curses of the four angels. Remember that John will return with the remnant of Jacob when he does return. Behold, I the Lord, in the beginning, bless the waters. But in the last days, by the mouth of my servant John, I cursed the waters. Therefore, the days will come that no flesh shall be safe upon the waters, and it shall be said in days to come that none is able to go up to the land of Zion upon the waters, but he that is upright in heart. I the Lord have decreed, and the destroyer rideth upon the face thereof, and I revoke not the decree. By this verse we see that the curse that comes upon the waters in the last days comes at the hand of John. Furthermore, it is the Lord that gives the destroyer dominion over the waters in that day. Note that as a result of the destroyer, Zion is kept safe from all other nations, for no man is able to travel upon the waters save the upright in heart. Satan is not in the business of sparing the righteous, but this destroyer allows the righteous safe passage, thus enabling the 144,000 to gather the righteous to Zion from all the nations of the earth while at the same time keeping the wicked at bay. 
The destroyer is the mighty remnant of Jacob. Consider the following description of the remnant of Jacob from Jeremiah. The portion of Jacob is not like them. For God is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Thou art my battle axe and my weapon of war. For with thee I will break in pieces the nations, and with thee I will destroy kingdoms. The Lord has stated that John will curse the waters and cause the destroyer to dominate the seas in the last days. Jeremiah associates the remnant of Jacob with being the destroyer, the Lord's battle axe and weapon of war. Consider this additional passage taken from modern revelation regarding the same things covered by the events brought on by these four angels. And they shall see signs and wonders, for they shall be shown forth in the heavens above and in the earth beneath, and they shall behold blood and fire and vapors of smoke. And before the day of the Lord shall come, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon be turned to blood, and the stars fall from heaven, and the remnant shall be gathered into this place. These commonalities that exist between the events of the first four angels are not coincidental. Whereas they are highly symbolic, they are also highly instructive when approached from this perspective. I cannot say which parts of these things will have literal meanings, such as fiery mountains and burning stars translating into meteors hitting the earth. However, the plagues of Egypt were pretty literal. Interpreting these events beyond what I have done would be speculative on my part. There are passages, however, that suggest that there may be some literal implications to these events. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, and every stone about the weight of a talent, seventy-five pounds. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceedingly great. And, for not many days hence, and the earth shall tremble and reel to and fro as a drunken man, and the sun shall hide his face, and shall refuse to give light, and the moon shall be bathed in blood, and the stars shall become exceedingly angry, and shall cast themselves down as a fig that falleth from a fig tree. And, for after your testimony cometh the testimony of earthquakes that shall cause groanings in the midst of her, and men shall fall upon the ground, and shall not be able to stand, and also cometh the testimony of the voice of thunderings, and the voice of lightnings, and the voice of tempests, and the voice of waves heaving themselves beyond their bounds. Regardless of the spiritual or literal interpretations of these events, in the day that they are played out, we will recognize them for what they are, the signs that the silence in heaven has at long last come to an end. The great and terrible day of the Lord is at hand. I have demonstrated that these first four events are steeped in symbolism, they tie back to the plagues of Egypt when the Lord delivered his people in days of old. They suggest redemption through tribulation, and they link the heavens and the earth. The Lord will again deliver his saints in a miraculous fashion. He will not suffer the modern pharaohs of our day to destroy his covenant people. In that day, he will work a marvelous work and a wonder in the eyes of all nations, reminiscent of days of old a work for the convincing them of peace and life eternal, or the delivering them up to both physical and spiritual destruction. I conclude the analysis of these four angels and the latter-day plagues of Egypt with the following passage from the Lord. O ye nations of the earth, how often would I have gathered you together as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, but ye would not. How oft have I called upon you by the mouth of my servants, and by the ministration of angels, and by my own voice, and by the voice of thunderings, and by the voice of lightnings, and by the voice of tempests, and by the voice of earthquakes and great hailstorms, and by the voice of famines and pestilences of every kind, and by the great sound of a trumpet, and by the voice of judgment, and by the voice of mercy all the day long and by the voice of glory and honor and the riches of eternal life, and would have saved you with an everlasting salvation, but ye would not. Behold, 
The day has come when the cup of the wrath of mine indignation is full. Chapter 26 The Angel of the Bottomless Pit In the prior chapter, we studied the plagues associated with the first four angels of the seventh seal. I noted how these plagues were similar to the plagues of Egypt. As we continue, we will note that there are many more similarities between these future events and the exodus of Egypt. After John witnessed the first four of seven total events, he beheld the following. And I beheld and heard an angel fly through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets of the three angels which are yet to sound. The proclamation of this angel seems to indicate that the intensity of the remaining three events will exceed that of the first four. We can reasonably assume that these events will increase in intensity because the wicked on the earth continue in their hardened and rebellious state. As with devils and men, anything can be rationalized away. Undoubtedly, some of the consequences, signs, and wonders surrounding the first four events will in like manner be rationalized away. After all, Pharaoh of Egypt was able to find reasons, explanations, and justifications from his magicians and scientists for most of the plagues of Egypt. Why would we expect different from our modern secular society? Let's therefore consider the fifth event. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as a smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. The above passage may seem a little ambiguous. In it, we learn of the fifth angel, another star coming to earth from heaven, and the key to the bottomless pit. How do we interpret this? There are a couple of possibilities to consider. A common interpretation of this verse is that the star represents Satan, who fell from heaven and now has great power and authority upon the earth. Superficially, this makes sense. However, we have learned that these seven angels and their corresponding events relate to events that have taken place in the beginning of the seventh seal. Lucifer fell before the foundations of the world and has enjoyed great power and authority upon the earth ever since, not just in these last days. I do not believe that this star was meant to represent Satan. In the book of Revelations, the typical symbol for Satan is a dragon, with his vassals being symbolized by ferocious horned beasts and a dreadful antichrist referred to as a mouth. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast, the wicked conglomerate of nations, which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, Satan, gave him his power and his seat and great glory. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all that worshipped wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, the Antichrist, also known as the little or stout horn, speaking great things, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth and blasphemed against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. These three, the dragon, the beast, and the mouth, represent the satanic trinity that will exercise terrible power in the last days. John's symbolism regarding these three is consistent throughout his whole work. Into earth on a star, he was not seeing Satan. 
Therefore, I would like to offer an alternate interpretation. There are obvious similarities between the star we see descending from heaven to earth and associated with the fifth angel and the burning objects associated with the first four angels that likewise came from heaven to earth. I believe this similarity is meant to demonstrate a relationship that exists between the first five angels. Elsewhere in John's revelations, these five angels are grouped together in both mission and deed. For example, and I saw another angel, the fifth angel, ascend from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. In these verses, the group of four angels had power to hurt the land and sea, just like the first four angels previously discussed, associated with the modern-day plagues of Egypt. The fifth rises from the east and apparently has authority to command the other four. Who then is this fifth angel who hails from the east with such authority? Thankfully, we do not need to guess. The Doctrine and Covenants teaches us who the fifth angel is. Consider the following passage. Question. What are we to understand by the angel ascending from the east? Revelations 7th chapter and 2nd verse. Answer. We are to understand that the angel ascending from the east is he to whom is given the sealing of the living God over the twelve tribes of Israel. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was to come to gather together the tribes of Israel and restore all things. This should sound very familiar. The fifth angel is described as having the same mission as John. We have already learned about this latter-day Elias and his mission to gather Israel and to restore all things. This Elias is the Apostle John. The four angels that John commands are also the same four angels that stand upon the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds that we have previously been associated with the gathering of Israel. Given what we know about John's mission and the symbolism of these four angels, the four corners of the earth and the four winds, I suggest that these five angels are all associated with the gathering of Israel. In other words, the fifth angel represents John, and the four angels represent the lost tribes of Israel, the remnant of Jacob. The evidence put forth in the prior chapter likewise support this conclusion. With this in mind, let's review again the sounding of the fifth angel's trump after the opening of the seventh seal. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as a smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. The bottomless pit is obvious reference to death and the horrors of hell. The key is a symbol of authority to administer those horrors. There is only one person that has authority over hell, and therefore the capability to give the key to another, and it is not Satan. The book of Revelations tells us who the person is. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. I am he that liveth. I was dead, and behold, I am alive for evermore. Amen. And have the keys of death and hell. From the above verse, we learn that Jesus Christ alone won the victory over death and hell. He alone has the keys to the bottomless pit. Therefore, this key to hell is symbolic of John receiving the keys to complete his mission from the Savior. As we noted in the previous chapters, John is literally ancient of days. He is the only mortal still alive who literally received the keys of the priesthood and to the kingdom of the Lord from the hand of the Savior. Unto you three, Peter, James, and John, I will give this power and the keys of this ministry until I come. It is important to realize 
that when John arrives to Earth on this star-like object, he is not alone. He is accompanied by a vast host represented by the smoke of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. This reference to smoke is a reference to the returning remnant of Jacob. Isaiah saw the same host returned and used similar vernacular to describe them. Consider Isaiah's description. Howl, O gate, cry, O city, the whole Palestina art dissolved, for there shall come from the north a smoke. In Isaiah's description, the smoke comes from the direction of the north, which is the direction associated with the lost tribes. They come to dissolve the enemies of Israel. This symbolic reference to smoke in the bottomless pit is a reference to the remnant of Jacob destroying the wicked with fire. Now it is important to spend some time discussing the manner in which John returned. The passage that we have read associates his return with a star falling from heaven. Stars falling from heaven is an off-stated sign to precede the coming of the Lord. But what does it mean? There is a fascinating question that was asked by Joseph Fielding to Parley P. Pratt that was subsequently published in the Millennial Star, Volume 1, Number 10, page 258, February 1841, Question 7. The question comes in the form of a letter written by Joseph Fielding to Parley P. Pratt while he was serving on his mission in Preston, England. Dear Brother Pratt, having a desire to know the truth of all things that are revealed from God to man, and knowing in part the importance of teaching them to mankind, I take the liberty to ask you certain questions, which, if you think proper, you may answer in the star, as I ask not for my own information alone, but for all those who desire and seek after truth. Question 7. Fielding. How can the stars fall from heaven to earth when they, as far as we know, are much larger than the earth? Answer. Pratt. We are nowhere given to understand that all the stars will fall, or even many of them, but only as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken with a mighty wind. The stars, which fall to earth, are fragments which have been broken off from the earth from time to time. These all must be restored again at the time of the restitution of all things. This will restore the ten tribes to Israel, and also bring again Zion, even Enoch City. End quote. Therefore, according to Parley P. Pratt, stars falling from heaven are associated with the return of the lost tribes of Israel. Now back to John's particular account of this star-like object. With regards to the star-like object that brings the dissolving smoke from the north, there have been other similar accounts. We reviewed this passage before, but given its relevance to the present topic, I will present it again. This is the description of Ezekiel's star-like object descending from heaven with the hosts of Israel. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof was the color amber, out of the midst of the fire. Also out of the midst there came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left, and they four also had the face of an eagle. The four faces are symbolic, of course, of the four standards of the armies of Israel. Now, as I beheld the living creatures, behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures, with his four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like the color of amber, or beryl. And the four wheels had one likeness, and their appearance and their work 
was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of the flash of lightning. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. I think that the similarity between these two accounts is very interesting and worthy of the reader's personal, deep, thoughtful consideration. I believe that this host, symbolically portrayed in these accounts, represents the hosts of Israel being restored from the far reaches of heaven. They come from a far country, from the ends of heaven, yea, the Lord and the weapons of his indignation, to destroy the whole land. As we continue in our analysis, there will be more correlations between this host and the mighty remnant of Jacob. John continues where we left off, elaborating upon the smoke. And there came up out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men who have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should torment them five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. In this description, locusts again tie this host back to the symbolism of the plagues of Egypt. The Lord sent a plague of locusts among the Egyptians to soften their hearts. It was to invite Pharaoh to hearken to the voice of the Lord. In fact, most of the ten plagues of Egypt were designed to torment rather than to kill. Plagues of locusts, lice, flies, frogs, boils, etc., were not life-threatening, although many of the Egyptians at the time probably wished that they were dead. John foresaw that at least initially it would be the same with the arrival of the smoke from the north. Further symbolism here is that the brunt of the Egyptian plagues were focused on the wicked. The Hebrews were not impacted by the plagues to the same degree that the Egyptians were. Similarly, John notes that the locusts from the smoke did not torment the righteous, only those that had not the seal of God in their foreheads. This is reminiscent of the words of Nephi which he spoke after seeing the events of this day. Wherefore, he will preserve the righteous by his power, even if it so be that the fullness of his wrath must come, and the righteous be preserved even unto the destruction of their enemies by fire. Wherefore, the righteous need not fear, for thus saith the prophet, They shall be saved, even if it so be as by fire. Another similarity to the Egyptian plagues is the timing of these events. Five months is consistent with the time frame of the plagues of Egypt. A detailed analysis of the timetable of the plagues puts a reasonable time frame for their duration at 20 weeks, taking into account the difference between crop destructions, plagues, durations, etc. The Lord gave the Egyptians approximately five months to repent and hearken to his commandments before he sent the destroyer amongst them to kill their firstborn. As the Lord provided the Egyptians with a way to escape destruction, so will this latter-day host provide a similar opportunity. Consider the words of Peter. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Note that Peter says the day of the Lord will come as the thief in the night, meaning the great and dreadful day of the Lord, rather than the Lord's coming himself. 
the signs preceding the Lord's coming will be far more obvious than those preceding the great and terrible day of the Lord. Furthermore, the Lord of the vineyard will do all that he can for his vineyard before it's destroyed. He wants the wicked to repent. John does not say it, but I believe that this five-month period might represent the time period for the final laborers to go forth into the vineyard one last time. Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. And after will I send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain, and from every hill, and out of the holes of the rocks. The righteous will be gathered to the Lord's vineyard. Hunters will be sent forth one last time to gather any who will come to the safety of Zion. And it shall come to pass among the wicked, that every man that will not take his sword up against his neighbor must needs flee into Zion for safety, and there shall be gathered unto it out of every nation under heaven, and it shall be the only people that shall not be at war one with another. Next, John provides a description of the host of the remnant of Jacob. Consider the following. And the shape of the locust were likened to horses prepared unto battle. Note that cavalry and chariots represent the apex of war technology and might that John was familiar with. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns of gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions. And there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. John's description of the host closely matches the description of the remnant of Jacob provided by Joel. You will remember that Moroni referred to Joel's account in his message to Joseph Smith. Consider a brief comparison of the similarities in Joel's account. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in the, your days, or even in the days of your father? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm has left hath the locust eaten. For a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on top of the mountains shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. In both accounts, the arrival of the host is described as being extraordinary, something that has never before happened. A host of men coming to earth on a star-like object from the ends of heaven is without precedent. Both accounts describe the hosts as locusts and as horsemen. In both accounts, the host is described as having the teeth of a lion and chariots emitting thunderous noises. And both hosts are associated with the destruction of fire. John next gives us additional information regarding this host specifically regarding to the leader of this host, or the fifth angel, who now holds the keys to the bottomless pit. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Both Abaddon and Apollyon can be translated as the destroyer or the devourer. The reference to both the devourer and the bottomless pit are not meant to infer that this leader is wicked. Rather, that the angel has the keys of the bottomless pit and the authority to destroy the wicked with fire. Beyond this, we learn that the keys of the bottomless pit enable this angel to bind the wicked in hell. Consider another verse describing this angel who holds these keys. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, 
that old serpent which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him in unto the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should not deceive the nations no more, till a thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed for a little season. There can be no doubt that in the above passage, the angel with the keys to the bottomless pit is righteous. Satan has no authority in hell. He is bound and locked in the pit by the work of this angel. Once bound, Satan cannot escape. Some people associate the title of this angel, the destroyer, with wickedness. This is a term often associated with Satan, for he too is a destroyer, a devourer of the righteous. But are all destroyers wicked? Was the destroying angel from the Passover evil? Consider the following account of the destroying angel of Egypt. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop, and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of the house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your house to smite you. In this passage, there can be no doubt that the Lord associates himself with the destroyer. Let us not forget the identity of this angel, John the Beloved. While John loves the Lord, the mission that the Lord gave him was bitter in his belly. John does not relish the destruction of the Lord's children. However, both destruction and the destroyer are associated with John and his mission. He is sent on the Lord's errand to prepare the way for his second coming. Consider the following verse from Doctrine and Covenants. Therefore, it is expedient in me that mine elders should wait for a little season for the redemption of Zion. For behold, I do not require at their hands to fight the battles of Zion. For, as I said in a former commandment, even so will I fulfill. I will fight your battles. Behold, the destroyer I have sent forth to destroy and lay waste mine enemies, and not many years hence they shall not be left to pollute mine heritage and to blaspheme my name upon the lands which I have consecrated for the gathering together of my saints. The above passage, the Lord clearly states that he will send the destroyer to destroy his enemies and to purge these lands of the wicked. It is therefore evident that this destroyer is not Satan, but rather the servant of the Lord. This destroyer is John, the latter-day forerunner. For further assurance of this fact, reconsider the following verse. Behold, I the Lord in the beginning blessed the waters, but in the last days by the mouth of my servant John I cursed the waters. Wherefore the days will come that no flesh shall be safe upon the waters, and it shall be said in days to come that none is able to come to the land of Zion upon the waters, but he that is upright in heart. I, the Lord, have decreed, and the destroyer rideth upon the face thereof, and I revoke not my decree. Nevertheless, unto whom is given power to command the waters, unto him it is given by the Spirit to know all his ways. This destroyer is linked to John, and the protection of Zion. Just as the destroyer of Exodus did not slay the Hebrews because of the blood of the Lamb, so will this destroyer provide safe passage to Zion for the upright in heart and prohibit the wicked from obtaining America's sanctified shores. Remember, both Jesus Christ and Isaiah use the following verses to discuss the returning remnant of Jacob. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. I have created the waster to destroy. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall revile against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. 
This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Therefore, despite having the title of destroyer and devourer, it is the Lord who shall call him and give him power for the mission. Oh, that each of us would likewise use the power the Lord has given us to fulfill his purposes. Based on the context of these and other accounts, I believe the evidence supports that the angel who receives the keys to the bottomless pit and oversees this mighty host will be a man of God. This is Elias, come to both prepare and sanctify the earth for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Having now seen the leader of this mighty host, whose numbers have been likened into a swarm of locusts, John continues his explanation of the vision. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. This alludes to the ending of the symbolic five months of torment. Now comes the tenth plague of Egypt, death by the hand of the destroyer. In actuality, this time period will take as long as required for the Lord to gather the righteous from among the wicked. The Lord is mighty, and none can stay his hand. However, once all the wheat has been safely gathered in from among the tares, the tares will be burned. Now has come the time for the great and terrible destruction to be administered by the remnant of Jacob. John's vision continues. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the bottomless pit. And the four angels were loosed, and were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year, for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand, and I heard the number of them. Here John makes a symbolic reference to the Ark of the Covenant with its four horns. It was around this Ark that the armies of Israel were camped. In times of old, it was these four camps or armies of Israel that purged the promised land of Israel so that the children of the Lord could inherit the vineyard. These four angels bound in the bottomless pit represent those armies of Israel. Up to this point in time, bounds had been set upon the actions of the mighty remnant of Jacob. They, like the first nine plagues of Egypt, were limited to harassing and tormenting men. These restraints were the bounds to which the sixth angel refers. These bounds were placed upon them by the order of John, their prophet, as follows. And I saw another angel ascend from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom had been given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Once the last great harvest is over, and all the righteous have been gathered into Zion, then comes the equivalent of the tenth plague of Egypt, death. With this limitation lifted, the hell fire literally begins to rain down upon the wicked and devours them. The numbers of dead foreseen by John are truly staggering. With today's global population, this represents over 2 billion, 300 million people. Nothing can stand before the Lord's army. The wicked fall like ashes under the feet of this unstoppable force. It is this powerful force that drives the stout horn from America and puts both the dragon and the beast on the run as foreseen by Isaiah. From these events and the awful war that has been perpetuated on the saints, Zion is now purified, and the wicked are driven from our lands in preparation for the return of the king. John continues with the following awe-inspiring description of this host. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire, and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. 
By these three was the third part of men killed, by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, and their tails were likened to serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. Joel's version of these events provides great insight into the Lord's methods in the latter days. Consider the following. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for the camp of Israel is great, and he is strong that executeth his words, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repent him of evil. According to Joel, just as the Lord would have saved the Egyptians had they repented, so if these repent, they will not be destroyed. However, sadly this is not the first time the world has descended into such horrible wickedness. In the days before the flood, society became godless and as a result, was destroyed entirely by water. In our days, society's wickedness mirrors that of the days of Noah, so the world will be destroyed again. This time, it will be baptized in fire. The next thing John sees attests to the unyielding wickedness of the world in our generation. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the work of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. After the destroyer ravaged Egypt with plagues and ultimately death, Israel was made free. However, as Pharaoh stood upon his throne, he gave in to festering rage. He was furious with the Lord, and what he perceived the Lord had done to him and his people. He looked up to heaven and shook his fist at God, and vowed to destroy his people. So it will be in the last days. The stout horn will flee from America for his life. After the unstoppable remnant of Jacob has ravaged the nations of the earth and liberated America from the oppression and corrupt rule of the stout horn and his cohorts, they will become incensed with rage. Rather than repenting, they too will look heavenward and curse the God of Israel and rally to destroy the only host of Israel within their reach, the Jews. Chapter 27 the seventh angel of the seventh seal. In the previous chapters, I highlighted how the events surrounding the exodus of Egypt would serve as a blueprint for the latter days. I also noted that just as Pharaoh hardened his heart against the Lord and sought to destroy his people when their backs were to the sea, so it will be with the wicked among the Gentile nations. But before this, America will be cleansed and the stout horn will be ejected. Those that will not repent and become pure through the blood of the Lamb and serve the true and living God will be destroyed. For behold, this is a land which is choice above all other lands. Wherefore, he that doth possess it shall serve God or be swept off, for it is the everlasting decree of God. We have seen from previous accounts that once the wicked have been cleansed from America, the remnant of Jacob will be in a position to build the new Jerusalem. We shall see that John's revelation follows in a similar vein. With this in mind, let us consider the message of the seventh angel of the seventh seal. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon its head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet were as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth. The description of this last angel varied significantly from all those that preceded it. This angel was clothed in a cloud, 
with a rainbow upon his head. The interesting attire of this angel is, of itself, a symbol. The rainbow in the cloud is a symbol of a pre-Diluvian covenant made regarding Zion in the latter days. Let's review the terms of this covenant. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have made between me and thee, for all flesh that shall be upon the earth. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant which I made unto thy father Enoch, that when men should keep all my commandments, Zion should again come down to the earth, the city of Enoch which I have caught up unto myself. And this is mine everlasting covenant, that when thy posterity shall embrace the truth and look upward, then shall Zion look downward, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy, and the general assembly of the church of the firstborn shall come down out of heaven and possess the earth, and shall have place until the end come. And this is mine everlasting covenant, which I made with thy father Enoch. What a marvelous covenant! In the day that men remember once again the covenants of the Lord and keep them, Zion will be reestablished among them. We have been given further information regarding this covenant in the Pearl of Great Price. And the Lord said unto Enoch, As I live, even so will I come in the last days, in the days of wickedness and vengeance, to fulfill the oath which I have made unto you concerning the children of Noah. And the day shall come that the earth shall rest, but before that day the heavens shall be darkened, and a veil of darkness shall cover the earth, and the heavens shall shake, and also the earth, and great tribulation shall be among the children of men but my people will I preserve. And righteousness will I send down out of heaven, and truth will I send forth out of the earth, to bear testimony of mine only begotten, his resurrection from the dead, yea, and also the resurrection of all men, and righteousness and truth will I cause to sweep the earth as with a flood, to gather out mine elect from the four corners of the earth, unto the place which I shall prepare, and holy city, that my people may gird up their loins and be looking forth for the time of my coming. For there shall be my tabernacle, and it shall be called Zion, a new Jerusalem. And the Lord said unto Enoch, Then shalt thou and all thy city meet me there, and we will receive them into our bosom, and they shall see us, and we will fall down upon their necks, and they shall fall down upon our necks, and we will kiss each other. Given the terms of this timing and covenant, the angel's symbolic clothing is not coincidental. It is the sign that Zion shall be restored once the destroyer has finished his work. We learn that not only will the remnant of Jacob build the new Jerusalem in America, but that a portion of this city will consist of the city of Enoch itself, which will come down from heaven. When Enoch city returns to earth, God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ will dwell among the righteous in Zion. John not only saw this symbolic angel, but the angel himself showed him the holy city. There came unto me one of the seven angels, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and shewed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was likened to a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at her gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the house of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. 
and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. From John's account, we understand that Zion is not just a location, but also a condition. In Zion there will be no more sorrow, heartache, pain, or suffering. The people of Zion will not judge one another, nor be prideful. In Zion, the people will be of one heart and one mind. There will be no poor in Zion, and all will be recipients of all that the Father hath. What a difference from the world we now know. There is no contradiction between John's account and the other accounts we have studied regarding the New Jerusalem. Both will happen. The city of Enoch will descend from heaven and join the New Jerusalem upon the ground, becoming one great city. Given that the Lord will be present at the time the city of Enoch descends upon America, this event will not happen until after the second coming. While those that choose to come to Zion will be blessed with peace and prosperity, the wicked among the Gentile nations will descend into war and chaos. We know that things will become particularly bad for the Jews. All the Gentile nations of the earth will gather against them. Consider the following. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. John foresaw the turmoil in Jerusalem and wrote with respect to what he saw. The following is an account of his vision. And there was given me a rod, like unto a reed. And the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty-two months. From this passage we understand that the temple in Jerusalem will be rebuilt before the second coming of the Lord. We also learn that Jerusalem will be besieged by the Gentile nations for at least three and a half years. The angel continues, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouths and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over the waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. These are the two witnesses that we addressed in detail in the chapter Powerful Latter-day Leadership. Like the first four angels of John's vision, these two prophets likewise have power to exercise plagues of Egypt in the defense of Israel. To aid in the accomplishment of this mission, they are entrusted with the sealing power. Like with all prophets of old, these will be sustained by the hand of the Almighty God until their mission has been completed. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast, Satan, that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three and a half days, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put into graves, 
and they that dwell on the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. After these have completed their mission, they are killed, and ultimately resurrect in the eyes of all nations. While the world rejoiced for their demise, their rejoicing is cut short by the resurrection of their foes. The vision of John continues. And the same hour there was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. And the second woe was past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord, and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. Shortly after these two are resurrected, the second woe was fulfilled via a significant earthquake in Jerusalem. Remember that the first woe was related to the remnant of Jacob slaying a third of all the inhabitants of the earth. Before the third woe is fulfilled, the seventh angel pronounces that all nations of the world have become the kingdoms of God and his son Jesus Christ. We can therefore assume that the third woe has to do with the second coming of the Messiah. Prior to the Lord's coming, the Jews will have suffered unspeakable things. If it were not for the ministration of these two witnesses and the branch, they might have fallen prey to their enemies long before. But now their sufferings will end. For at the time of the third woe, Jesus Christ himself will come down from heaven to save the Jews from this epic battle of extinction. Consider the following. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vestiture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vestiture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying unto all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit upon them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. The fulfilling of the third woe fills all the enemies of Israel with fear. The awesome sight of the great Jehovah riding towards them upon a white stallion with the remnant of Jacob trailing behind will be heart-stopping. John states that the Messiah slays the hosts with the sword of his mouth. In other words, this powerful host is destroyed without hand by the utterance of the mouth of the Lord. Zechariah provided additional information into how the Lord would cut down the enemies of Israel without hand. Consider the following verses. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass that at that day that I will seek to destroy 
all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, towards the east and towards the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall move towards the north, and half towards the south. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongues shall consume away in their mouth. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And thus we see that the Lord Jesus Christ himself will save the Jews in the end. The Messiah, the Jews have long awaited for, will at last descend from heaven in great power and glory to lay waste to their enemies. At that time, they will finally acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the very God of Israel. Then, according to Isaiah, shall the Jews all sing together. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Once the great God of Israel has saved his people from physical destruction, the restored gospel will at last be taught among the Jews, and the great millennial day will be ushered in. Great are the prophecies of John. Great are the prophecies of Isaiah, Nephi, Christ, and Moroni, and all the holy prophets who spoke concerning these latter-day events. The testimonies of all these great men together in perfect unity testify of the coming of the Lord. The Lord is about to do a great and marvelous work and a wonder in the eyes of all the nations of the earth, without parallel. However, God has never done nor will he ever do anything save he first reveal his secrets to the servants, his prophets. Therefore, search these things out diligently, ponder upon them, Seek the Lord's guidance regarding their meaning and prepare yourself accordingly. The Lord of Lords and King of Kings is coming.